Over the years, WWE have provided us with some truly epic matches. Austin vs. Bret at WrestleMania 13, Cena vs. Punk at Money in the Bank 2011, Taker Michaels at Mania 25, we L C. However, being a fan of sports entertainment means that you've got to get used to taking the good with the bad, and the company has put on plenty of matches that have, well, how do I put this nicely, they've, they've sucked. So, dear viewer, it's time to hop in my DeLorean and experience some of the company's biggest flubs together. Hope you got about seven hours to spare. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of every single year. Join us. 2023. 2023 saw some big changes to the WWE landscape, not least because it joined up with UFC in an unholy union of punches, kicks, and tiny little shorts. The bloodline fell apart, sort of. Cody Rhodes achieved his dreams, kind of. And there was some damn fine wrestling across the board, mostly. But who are we kidding? We know you're not interested in any of that. You are here for the matches that were disappointing, deflating, or downright disastrous. So feast your eyes on these clunkers, you negative bunch of bastards. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 2023. Join us. Number 10, Rhea Ripley versus Natalya at Night of Champions. WWE's first Saudi show of the year saw the return of a beloved brand name in Night of Champions. This show featured bangers like Cody Rhodes vs. Brock Lesnar, Seth Rollins beating AJ Styles for the New World Heavyweight Championship, and Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn overcoming the combined force of Solo Sokoa and Roman Reigns. Also, Natalya had a match. Wait a second, did she? I don't remember that. Oh yeah, that's right, WWE flew both her and Rhea Ripley all the way out to the Middle East for just over a minute's worth of work. After Dominic Mysterio ran interference before the bell, Ripley jumped her opponent, chucked her about for a while, then hit a headbutt on a riptide to retain the SmackDown Women's Championship. Honestly, this would have actually been better as a straight squash without the interference. I'm all for making Rhea look good, as if she needs any help there, and Dominic's involvement made it look a bit more fluky than it perhaps should have. Fans were hoping for a little bit more out of these two and were a tad disappointed when this was all they got. And if that wasn't bad enough, this humiliation took place on Natty's birthday. Number 9. Gunter vs Matt Riddle at Money in the Bank British wrestling fans had it pretty good in 2023 as several major feds from across the pond brought their shows over to our fair shores. AEW had All In at Wembley, TNA had Turning Point featuring our very own Tom Campbell as ring announcer and for the WWE diehards there was money in the bank. As well as the two ladder matches and a mouth-watering Bloodline Civil War main event, this show was home to a match that would have sold out any independent wrestling event in the country circa 2018. Gunter was putting his Intercontinental Championship on the line against Matt Riddle, the first ever one-on-one -on -one encounter between these two talented performers in WWE. However, whether it was jet lag, overhyped expectations, or just both men having an off day, the bout under-delivered. It was perfectly serviceable, but considering the stock of the men involved, plus the fact that they both cut their teeth partly in the UK, this simply wasn't good enough. Never mind, eh? Maybe they'll have a great rematch at some point down the l- oh, on second thoughts, they probably won't. Number 8. Roman Reigns vs Jey Uso at SummerSlam at the aforementioned Money in the Bank, Jey Uso finally scored a measure of revenge over his table-heading cousin when he became the first person to pin Roman Reigns since 2019. This set the stage for a blockbuster SummerSlam main event, Roman vs Jey for the big one, but now with even more history and emotional weight behind it. WWE couldn't lose until they did. The match, which was labelled Tribal Combat but was basically just a standard no DQ, was alright if a little tame, but it was the conclusion that condemned it. Jay looked to have the match won when a man in a hoodie broke things up. The mysterious invader then revealed himself to be… Jimmy Uso. The same Jimmy Uso who had been out of action for weeks following a brutal beatdown from the bloodline. That Jimmy Uso. It made no sense at the time, and it still doesn't make a great deal more in hindsight. The whole thing stank of swerve for swerve's sake, and the bloodline haven't been quite the same since. Number 7. Austin Theory vs John Cena at WrestleMania 39 Night 1 
On the whole, WrestleMania 39 was a great old time, with some people ranking it amongst their favourite manias ever. Unfortunately, nothing is perfect, not even WrestleMania, as this misfire of an opening match proved. Austin Theory had won some big matches as United States Champion, but hadn't quite had that killer program to take him to the next level. Enter John Cena, who had come from the set of the Barbie movie just to give little Austin the rub. And what happened? Cena absolutely buried Theory in the build-up to Mania, chewing him out on television for not being a very good champion. He eviscerated the poor boy, but surely this was all leading to a show-stealing match on the big night, right? Instead, Cena and Theory wrestled a remarkably dull affair, with Cena putting in as much effort as I do when I'm stacking the dishwasher. Theory won, which was all well and good, but the preceding encounter was so thunderingly boring that what should have been a stepping stone became a giant boulder around his neck. And yet, he still held on to the US title for another four months. What a drag. Number 6. Gable Steveson vs Baron Corbin at NXT The Great American Bash it's always tricky to decide whether or not to include NXT on these things, as it can feel like its own separate entity a lot of the time, but we simply had to include a match that was so painful, one half of it hasn't appeared since. Despite signing for the company in 2021, it took until July 2023 for Olympic gold medalist Gable Steveson to make his in-ring debut. His opponent was Burn the Ship, sorry, I mean Baron Corbin, who is a good hand, but maybe not the most exciting first opponent for a new talent. The pair proceeded to have a very, very, very tedious match in which Corbin dominated most of the action. Stevenson showed brief glimmers of promise, but the layout was such that the chances he had to impress were few and far between. Two other factors severely hampered young Gable's first outing. One was the crowd, who decided that they were going to cheer for the heel instead, and the other was the baffling decision to end this match in a double countout. If there had been a gold medal for bad first impressions, Stevenson would have added that to his collection too. Number 5. Shayna Baszler vs Ronda Rousey at SummerSlam when Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler won the Women's Tag Team Championships in May, they promised to shake things up and bring some respect and prestige to the floundering titles. So did they? Well, what do you think? 33 days later, the duo lost the belts when Baszler turned on Rousey completely out of the blue. It was later explained that she was jealous of her friend, setting up what was being dubbed an MMA rules match at SummerSlam. MMA? This match was more DOA. The two women traded worked shoot-style punches, kicks, and submission holds for seven and a half minutes before Baszler got the win. This sort of thing has never gone down well with audiences who, shockingly, want to see pro wrestling, not a pretend version of UFC. There was little flow to this contest and zero moments that deserved any sort of big pop. I mean, at least the fight pit has a big metal box to play with and sell toys of. This had none of that. And by the way, Shayna got absolutely nout off the back of the biggest win of her career. So there's that too. Number 4. Bobby Lashley vs Brock Lesnar at Elimination Chamber Considering how long wrestling fans had been dreaming about a Brock Lesnar-Bobby Lashley program, it is staggering that WWE have managed to cock it up on not one, but two occasions. Following their bizarre mini-feud at the start of 2022, these two behemoths clashed again at Crown Jewel in November in the 2023 Royal Rumble match, and then at the following month's Elimination Chamber. This was a chance for these two freaks of nature, these two athletic powerhouses that had been compared to each other for years, to finally let loose. A chance not taken, sadly. Both BLs spammed their finishes on each other, but not in a Brock vs Goldberg from WrestleMania 33 way, more of a two eight-year-olds playing 2K way. To top this mess off, it ended when Lesnar couldn't get out of the hurt lock, so just kicked Lashley in the ghoulies instead. Nice one. Had this led to another better match at the Showcase of the Immortals, then it may have been forgiven, but Lesnar decided he wanted to work with Omos instead, and that was that. Number 3. Pat McAfee vs The Miz at WrestleMania 39 Night 1 For WrestleMania 39, hosting duties fell to The Miz and rap legend Snoop Dogg, which led to some of the cringiest, most random moments the granddaddy of them all has seen in quite some time. The Dogfather said he wanted to see Miz compete in a match, which brought out a returning Pat McAfee. After some typically cowardly protesting from the A-lister, the contest was made official and, well, it was The Miz vs Pat McAfee. 
What did you expect? The man who is a professional wrestler got the hell beaten out of him by the man who isn't a professional wrestler, leading to McAfee kicking Miz in the face to get the win, but not before falling over whilst hitting his own move. Also, Pat got a huge assist from football player George Kittle, who was sat at ringside and nobody said a word. McAfee cheated. He should have been disqualified and Miz should have won. Is there no justice left in this world? Number 2. Bray Wyatt vs LA Knight at Royal Rumble for obvious reasons, this is a very difficult match to talk about now. Windham Rotunda, the man behind the Bray Wyatt character, passed away in August after a heart attack following an extended leave of absence from TV. A bout of COVID prior to his death scrapped proposed WrestleMania plans with Bobby Lashley, making his pitch black match with LA Knight at the 2023 Royal Rumble Wyatt's final televised bout. Unfortunately, and there's no easy way to say this, it wasn't very good. First of all, it was heavily sponsored by Mountain Dew, which is never a good sign. Secondly, it took place with all the lights dimmed to show off that Bray had raided a 90s raver house for all their glow-in-the-dark makeup. This made it very hard to take anything here seriously, and the actual wrestling wasn't fantastic either, not to mention the nonsense with Uncle Howdy after the bell, which is honestly such a shame as Bray did not deserve to go out like this. Luckily, Wyatt left his fans so many other wonderful memories, and those are the ones we choose to think about when we think of him. Rest in peace, Wyndham, and thank you. Number 1. Shane McMahon slash Snoop Dogg vs The Miz at WrestleMania 39 Night 2 Anyone who claims WrestleMania 39 was perfect clearly forgot that WWE made us sit through some Miz-centric nonsense not once, but twice. One night removed from the McAfee fiasco, Snoop pulled the same trick again by announcing that Miz had yet another impromptu match. This time it was against… oh no… Shane McMahon. This has to be some sort of sick joke. I mean, it should have been clear that this segment was doomed when Shane O'Mac got out of breath jogging down to the ring, but the bell rang anyway and the match was on, and then very quickly off. Shane threw some of his awful punches, did a drop down and then a leapfrog, which blew out his quad and sent him down to the mat, just like his old man 18 years prior. With McMahon out of action after doing a basic move, it fell to 51-year-old rapper Snoop Dogg to improvise. He punched Miz twice and then hit the least electric move in sports entertainment to give himself the win. Serious props to Snoop here, but this was obviously a car wreck from start to finish, and even though it was perversely hilarious, it has to go down as the worst match of the entire year. 2022 Blimey, how on earth are we supposed to do any sort of 2022 coverage on this channel? This has been one of the quietest years in wrestling history. What on earth are we going to talk about? I'm being facetious, of course, because 2022 was one of the most insane years in the history of our great sport, with much of that insanity centered around a Vince McMahonless WWE. Amongst all the drama, it was easy to lose sight of the actual wrestling part of professional wrestling. Hey, we're allowed to call it that again. Thanks a lot, Uncle Paul. There were some absolute stonkers in the ring last year, but what do we care about those? Let's add some more fuel to the sports entertainment dumpster fire that was 2022 by examining some of the worst matches to grace a squared circle in WWE during it. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 2022. Join us! Number 10. Roman Reigns vs Goldberg at Elimination Chamber It really is hard to know what to expect from Bill Goldberg these days. Sometimes he pulls out a really entertaining match, like his one against Dolph Ziggler at SummerSlam or vs Bobby Lashley at Crown Jewel. And then sometimes he squashes The Fiend or nearly kills The Undertaker. Mixed bag, eh? His match with Roman Reigns for the Universal Championship last year wasn't as bad as those two, but it still wasn't great. At Elimination Chamber in Saudi Arabia, Reigns and Goldberg opened the show with a match that was all big moves. However, this Goldberg was five years older than the one that put on a great similar match with Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania 33. The explosiveness was just gone, the power was just gone, the threat that he would actually win was also gone too. It only lasted six minutes, but that was all the time we needed to see just how far Big Bill had fallen. We haven't seen him in a WWE ring since this match. Does that mean he's finally come to the end of the road? 
Almost definitely not. WWE will find a way to wheel him out again, and he will no doubt be headbutting ring posts into his 60s. Number 9. Nikita Lyons vs Lash Legend on NXT Two of the more heavily featured female talents on NXT last year, Nikita Lyons and Lash Legend faced off against each other twice on 2.0. And twice is all because Lyons nearly died during their second encounter. This match on the 26th of April edition of NXT got off to a hot start, with Legend attacking her foe as soon as she reached the ring. Sadly though, this was about as good as it got. The pair then clunkily made their way through a rope running sequence before Legend pushed Lyons out of the ring head first. She essentially topeed the floor, smashing into the mat in a move that made The Undertaker at WrestleMania 25 look like Rey Mysterio in WCW. Thankfully, Nikita was okay, and she went on to win the match. This contest was sloppy at best and dangerous at worst. After Nikita's fall, it became very difficult to watch these two throw hands in fear of what might happen next. Put simply, they looked and felt very inexperienced, which is not something you want to be thinking about while trying to enjoy a wrestling show. Number 8. Trick Williams vs Wes Lee at NXT The Great American Bash Whilst 2022 was the year that saw the death of NXT 2.0, we still had to sit through its ridiculousness up until September. Apologies to Ross for slandering his favourite show. One such example of this nonsense came at the Great American Bash special episode of NXT in July. The Great American Bash is a name that holds much fondness for many wrestling fans. Ric Flair vs Terry Funk, the first ever War Games match, Keith Lee becoming NXT Champion. Well, now you can add Trick Williams rubbing lotion into Wes Lee's eyes to that list of legendary moments. The inexperienced Williams met the former MSK member at the bash and didn't look brilliant between the ropes. He hadn't quite grasped the little flourishes that make a wrestling match good to watch, slipping up on transitions and failing to sell Lee's offense effectively. The match ended after just under four minutes, when Williams lathered his hands with rubbing alcohol and stuck his fingers in Lee's eyes. Williams might have got the win here, but he did so in extremely unconvincing fashion. Trick Willy, more like Trick Silly. <laughs> Great. Number 7. The Men's Elimination Chamber Match at Elimination Chamber Elimination Chamber 2022 was the first event of the year held in Saudi Arabia, and wouldn't you know it, it ended with one of the most confusing, boring matches of the year. What a shocker. Six men entered the chamber, Seth Rollins, Matt Riddle, Austin Theory, AJ Styles, Brock Lesnar, and WWE Champion Bobby Lashley. Well, technically only five men entered, as Lashley got taken out by a flying theory just a few minutes in. The bout ground to an agonizing halt as fans tried to work out whether the Almighty was legitimately hurt or not. He wasn't, by the way, just in case you were worried. Lashley getting taken out early threw the entire rest of the match off, meaning that Lesnar literally had to kick the door of his pod down to get in. He then promptly eliminated every other person in the match to win the WWE title in a massive anti-climax. Some people liked the match's chaotic feel, and Lesnar F5ing Austin Theory to his death off the top of a pod was cool, but on the whole, this match felt rushed and sloppy. Also, it led to number 6, Roman Reigns vs Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania 38. Again. The biggest WrestleMania match of all time, more like the biggest WrestleMania disappointment of all time. Oh, sick burn, lads. In reality, nobody should have been disappointed by the outcome of WWE Champion Brock Lesnar vs Universal Champion Roman Reigns as the headline match for the second day of WrestleMania 38. By this point, they had had about 5 billion matches together. Not even having both titles on the line could save this one from joining the turd pile. It was just standard Reigns and Lesnar affair, big move after big move, lots of kickouts, and Reigns scoring the win after, let me check my notes, another big move. Despite seeing it coming a mile away, the match's outcome did not thrill those in attendance or those watching at home. Absolutely nobody was interested in seeing the main event of WrestleMania go to these two again, and the actual match did nothing to alleviate any of the fears viewers had going into it. Ah oh well, at least it was the end of the feud, right? Wait a second, is that a tractor? 
Number 5. Omos vs Bobby Lashley at WrestleMania Backlash After returning from his absence caused by the Elimination Chamber match, a newly babyface Bobby Lashley was thrust right into a feud with the Nigerian giant Omos. The two met at WrestleMania, with Lashley becoming the first man to pin Omos. And what do you do when the babyface beats the heel on the very first try? You have them wrestle each other again one month later, of course. The twist to the rematch at WrestleMania Backlash was that Lashley's long time manager MVP had turned on his charge to side with Omos. I don't really get why Lashley was the guy who won at Mania. Why would you choose the loser over the winner? Anyway, Lashley did his best to get a good match out of Omos, but all that energy had already been spent at WrestleMania. That match was okay for the novelty factor and because Lashley won, but fans were just not interested in seeing these two tango again. In the end, MVP cost Lashley the match, setting up a two-on-one handicap match at Hell in a Sell. Great, a third match. That's exactly what we wanted. Number 4. The Men's Royal Rumble Match at Royal Rumble The Royal Rumble match is usually Christmas, a birthday, and a tax rebate all at once for us wrestling fans. The over-the-top showcase of meaty manness and womanness since 2018 is the most anticipated match of the year and is usually very, very fun. But not in 2022. In 2022, it was bad. It's almost as if this match was booked by MJF because most of the entrants were m m m mid. Very few viable winners entered until the final 10 minutes or so, leaving audiences to slowly fall asleep as Rick Boogs tried to eliminate Chad Gable. No offense, lads. There were no surprises except Bad Bunny, who hit a Canadian destroyer, Shane McMahon, who got sent home pretty much immediately after, and Brock. Lesnar, who everyone knew was going to enter and probably win. And guess what? Brock won. The sluggish nature of this match was made all the more tedious by the fact that this was the Royal Rumble. This was supposed to be 30 men, all vying to main event WrestleMania. Instead, we got 25 lost souls wandering around the ring, waiting for the five actual stars to come out. Also, and I didn't want to mention it, but Kofi botched his rescue spot, which was just sad and basically summed the whole thing up. Number 3. Ronda Rousey vs Shotzi at Survivor Series War Games You know a match is bad when a call to fire one of the participants starts trending on Twitter. On an otherwise stacked card, Ronda Rousey defended her SmackDown Women's Championship against Shotzi. Literally nobody expected the green-haired warrior to actually beat Rousey, but few could have predicted just how badly this match would go. Firstly, it had very little heat to it, meaning that it was incredibly hard to actually give a toss about the action. Secondly, Ronda botched several big moves, most notably a DDT on the apron that looked about as smooth as a gravel pit. Fans were against this match before it even started, as they knew that it was nothing more than a stopgap between Ronda's actual proper feuds. The least it could have done was give Shotzi a showcase on a big stage to build her up for the future. The fact that it was sloppily done only added fuel to the fire that Rousey is not a very good wrestler. I for one would like to clarify that she is a good wrestler by the way, partly because I do believe that and partly because I would like my arm to remain attached to my body if it's all the same to you. Number 2. Liv Morgan vs Ronda Rousey at SummerSlam Poor Liv Morgan. We all thought that she was set for her biggest year yet when she won Money in the Bank. Our theories were confirmed that same night when she cashed in the briefcase to beat Ronda Rousey for the SmackDown Women's Championship. The former member of the Riot Squad, remember them, was flying high, but all it takes is one bad decision to completely derail a wrestling career. At SummerSlam, Morgan defended the belt in a rematch versus Rousey. The two had a fairly decent showing before the match suddenly went insane. Rousey got Liv in an armbar, but Liv managed to roll Rousey into a pin. However, the referee didn't see that Morgan had actually tapped out before the three count was made. This was the total opposite of conventional wrestling booking. It should be the heel who retains the championship through sneaky means, not the other way around. Also, the match only going four and a half minutes didn't exactly help things either. This ending actually turned the fans against Liv and and she has yet to recover. She lost the title to Rousey just a couple of months later and hasn't had a sniff of the main event scene since. Poor Liv.
Number 1. Mr. McMahon vs. Pat McAfee at WrestleMania 38 In many ways, this impromptu bout from the second night of WrestleMania 38 was the greatest thing to happen to professional wrestling in 2022. 76-year-old Vince McMahon had his first match in a decade when he stepped into the ring to square off against SmackDown commentator Pat McAfee. The former football player had just beaten McMahon's apprentice Austin Theory and now the chairman was out for revenge. What followed was a total farce. Theory attacked Pat from behind, McMahon threw some of the flabbiest clotheslines of all time, and then won the match after punting a football into the downed commentator's chest. It was absurd, completely and utterly surreal, and summed up all the best bits about professional wrestling. But no, seriously, come on, it was really dumb. There was no actual wrestling to speak of, with Vince looking more like he was going for a Sunday stroll than competing at WrestleMania. Not to mention, everything that's transpired with Vinnie Mac after the fact has made it much harder to laugh at him being a goofy old man. Harder, but not impossible, mind. 2021 2021 was a strange year for the Big Dub. They began the year in the Thunderdome bubble, briefly stuck their head outside for WrestleMania before fully emerging from their Zoom call cocoon to end the year back on their usual grueling schedule. In amongst all the COVID-related drama, WWE also found time to, you know, put on some wrestling. 2021 saw some excellent action from the likes of Bianca Belair, Roman Reigns, Sasha Banks, Becky Lynch, Edge, and many more. But but for every great match, there was a proper stinker, and some of them stunk way, way more than others. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 2021. Join us. Number 10, Becky Lynch versus Bianca Belair at SummerSlam. We are kicking things off with one of the most controversial matches of the year, despite it lasting about as long as it takes to tie your shoes. Bianca Belair was set to defend her SmackDown Women's Championship against Becky Lynch, who made her return to WWE that night after taking off over a year for maternity leave. Fans absolutely lost it when the man's music hit and settled in for what should have been one of the best matches of the night, maybe even the entire year. Sadly though, what actually happened was Lynch suckered Belair in with a handshake, hit two moves on her, and won the match in 27 seconds. Yikes. This match, if you can even call it a match, would haunt WWE for the rest of the year. Fans and critics alike slated the company for mistreating Belair, a dominant champion up to this point, for turning the mega popular Lynch heel, and for wasting what could have been a potential dream match. Bianca finally got her revenge on Big Time Bex at WrestleMania 38, but for many fans, it was too little too late. Who knew 27 seconds could cause so much trouble? Number 9. The Rock 25th Anniversary Battle Royal at Survivor Series WWE was so desperate to have The Rock at Survivor Series 2021 that I'm surprised they didn't rename the show WrestleDwania in his honor. Good stuff. Not only was the show sponsored by his latest movie, Red Notice, but it was also plastered with video packages explaining just how great The Great One is. And then there was this match, which celebrated a quarter of a century since The Rock's WWE debut at Survivor Series 96. 25 superstars from both Raw and SmackDown were thrown into this random battle royal for the chance to win… pizza? Wait, why is this match also sponsored by Pizza Hut? Does The Rock own Pizza Hut now? I can't keep up. Anyway, the whole match was won by Omos, much to the delight of his tag team partner AJ Styles. But then, when Styles went to have a taste of his winnings, he was attacked by the Street Profits, who promptly ran off with the pizza. This whole segment took up about 15 minutes of pay-per-view time, achieved absolutely nothing whatsoever, and... And, oh, I'm done. This list has barely started and I am already done. Let's just get this over with. What's next? Number 8. Tommaso Ciampa vs Pete Dunne vs LA Knight vs Von Wagner on NXT 2.0 All in all, this one wasn't a bad match in ring-wise, but the strange booking was a sign of bad things to come on NXT 2.0. With the multicolored era of NXT at an end, let's reflect on the show's first episode under the 2.0 name. 
In particular, let's talk about the fatal four-way match for the vacant NXT Championship. First of all, one of the participants had already wrestled that evening, as LA Knight fought and lost to a debuting Bron Breaker. That is weird enough on its own, but it gets even weirder when you consider that Knight was a heel at the time and was going into this title match with a traditionally babyface disadvantage. Then Kyle O'Reilly, who was originally supposed to be in the bout too, got taken out backstage and was replaced by Von Wagner, a brand new face on NXT who was getting this title shot out of absolutely nowhere. In the end, it was Champa who reclaimed his beloved Goldie, which would have been nice for him had his victory not been bumped out of the main event spot in favour of Indy Hartwell and Dexter Loomis's wedding. Number 7. Saray vs Lash Legend on 205 Live 205 Live started out as a live showcase of great wrestlers under £205. By the end of its run, the wrestlers weighed all sorts and it was pre-taped. That should give you a rough idea of just how bad things got for the show. While it did feature some cracking matches from time to time, 205 Live was also home to some real stinkers, including this match between Saray and Lash Legend from the December 17th edition. According to reports, this was easily one of, if not the worst, WWE matches of the year, but one of the benefits of 205 Live not being live anymore was that WWE could edit out some of the worst parts. However, even with heavy tinkering, it's still really poor. Lash was clearly not ready for this bigger stage as she lumbered her way through the match, badly selling Saray's offense and hitting some weak-looking strikes of her own. Saray got the win in the end, but neither woman looked good as a result of this one. In fact, the entire show looked poor here, and it was actually cancelled just two months later. We're not saying the two are linked, but let's not rule it out. Number 6. Alexa Bliss vs Eva Marie at SummerSlam If you love haunted dolls, hold on to your seats. Alexa Bliss had turned to the dark side earlier in the year, establishing herself as WWE's resident creepy character after she helped dispatch The Fiend at WrestleMania. And don't worry folks, we'll get to that one later. Eva Marie had made her WWE return in June, aligning herself with her protege, Dewdrop. Eva used Dewdrop to help win singles and tag matches, always announcing herself as the sole winner regardless of who put the majority of the work in. If it sounds like I'm putting off talking about this match, that is because I am. In all fairness, there is very little to say about it though. Eva slaps Bliss with her doll Lily, Bliss gets fired up, misses Twisted Bliss, but then almost immediately hits a DDT to win in under four minutes. Was there any point in having this match on the show? Was it in Eva's contract that she could be on the SummerSlam card? Did WWE want Lily on the show just so that they could sell some more merch? Actually, might be onto something with that last one. Number 5. Roman Reigns vs The Demon Finn Balor at Extreme Rules The most disappointing thing about the main event of Extreme Rules 2021 was that it was actually going pretty bloody well, right up until the ending. It's not surprising that two workers as strong as Reigns and Balor had such a great match, but things started to go off the rails with everyone down on the outside. Suddenly, the lights in the arena went red and Balor's music started playing, which could mean only one thing. Presumably a crew member lent on the wrong button backstage. Either that, or it meant that Balor was entering demon mode, which here meant flopping around like a salmon on the deck of a fishing boat. Balor then used the power of the production truck to hold up and throw Roman back in the ring before climbing the turnbuckle to hit the coup de grace. Well, at least that was the plan, until the top rope mysteriously snapped, seemingly through an act of God. This allowed Reigns to hit a spear and retain the championship. Was this ever explained? Of course not. The spooky lighting and exaggerated demon mannerisms were cringeworthy enough, but Reigns getting an assist from the heavens was a step too far, and what could have been a great main event will now solely be remembered as nothing but a laughing stock. Number 4. Alexa Bliss vs Randy Orton at Fastlane The next three entries all have one thread running through them, and that thread is bad, spooky nonsense. When Randy Orton burned the fiend alive at TLC 2020, many thought and hoped that it represented the end of their feud. It did not. 
The Fiend continued feuding with Orton via Alexa Bliss, who had also turned to the dark side. This resulted in Bliss and Orton being booked in a rare intergender match at Fastlane, although if they all follow this blueprint, I'm in no rush to see WWE do it again. The match was a campy, ridiculous mess, with Bliss using her supernatural powers to shoot fireballs, collapse lighting rigs, and make Randy throw up a weird black goo. Or maybe he just had one too many pints of Guinness before the match, who's to say? The match ended when The Fiend returned, looking like something you would find in a knockoff bargain bucket to attack Orton. This allowed his spooky sidekick to pick up the win after five minutes of low-budget horror movie rubbish. While it was nice to see WWE embrace intergender wrestling, everything about this match was shocking, and to make matters worse, it led to number three, Randy Orton vs. The Fiend at WrestleMania 37. The Orton Fiend Bliss Triangle of Terribleness finally ended in the opening match of WrestleMania's second night. Orton and The Fiend were to square off one final time to put their beef and this awful storyline to bed once and for all. WWE went all out on the carnival ghost train aesthetic in this match, which started when The Fiend emerged fully healed from a so-called box-like structure. Just call it a box, Michael. Unfortunately, after five minutes of back and forth, Alexa Bliss climbed atop the same box-like structure, set off some fireworks, and made some more black goo run down her face. This distracted The Fiend long enough for Randy to hit an RKO and score the pinfall win. Alexa and The Fiend then stared at each other for a while before they both teleported away and out of the company in the case of Wyatt. Even though this feud was an absolute turd sandwich, it still deserved a better ending, and WrestleMania Night 2 definitely deserved a better opening. Number 2. Alexa Bliss vs Shayna Baszler at Hell in a Cell It's the third installment of our spooky Alexa Bliss Ruins Everything trilogy. They're even in chronological order, which means that we've told this story at least a hundred times more coherently than WWE did. Alexa's The Ring Meets Rugrats character reached its peak during her feud with Shayna Baszler and Nia Jax. At one point on Raw, Baszler ran for her life as Lily the Doll chased her backstage, but things got even more ridiculous at Hell in a Cell, if you can believe it. The two were having a decent back and forth until Bliss remembered those magic powers she'd used to try and kill Randy Orton a few months earlier. Imagine forgetting a thing like that. Bliss hypnotized Jax at ringside and had her slap Reginald, who was part of Jax and Baszler's act, for some reason. This distracted Shayna long enough for Bliss to get the pinfall. Of course, supernatural gimmicks do have their place in wrestling, just ask Mark Calloway's accountant, but hypnotism and possession have usually been a step too far. We're looking at you, Undertaker and Josh Matthews in 2005. Bliss and Baszler did the best with what they were given, and we're keen to point out that we're not blaming them for the bad booking. I mean, honestly, a possessed sommelier. I don't think anyone could have made that work. Number 1. Damien Priest vs The Miz at WrestleMania Backlash We've had Acts of God, Demonic Possession, and Pepperoni Pizza, so it's only natural that we end this list with some good old-fashioned zombies. In a now infamous match, Damian Priest took on The Miz in what was supposed to be a lumberjack stipulation. However, Vince McMahon must have been bitten by an infected brand tie-in, because he decided that this was the perfect time to advertise Zack Snyder's latest zombie movie, the Army of the Dead. Instead of regular lumberjacks, we got zombie lumberjacks, aka some performance center trainees in Halloween makeup. Seemingly not phased by the legions of the undead surrounding a ring, Miz and Priest wrestled for about five minutes until John Morrison got eaten by zombies at ringside. It's classic wrestling psychology. Seriously, in kayfabe, former Intercontinental and Tag Team Champion John Morrison was eaten by zombies, but to make matters worse, Worse, Priest then pinned Miz and left him in the ring so that he could get eaten as well. And he was supposed to be the babyface. Despite our suspicions otherwise, WrestleMania Backlash taught us that a good pay-per-view doesn't actually need zombies. This was an idea that should have died and, unlike its main feature, should have stayed that way permanently. 2020 
2020 was the year that professional wrestling, and to a lesser extent the entire world, changed forever. The pandemic forced us all inside and made us go a little bit crazy, but thankfully we had the ever-stable world of professional wrestling to help keep us sane. Well, actually, no, we didn't, because WWE also decided to go absolutely bonkers during this time. They threw a load of wacky ideas at the wall, and while some of them stuck, the Boneyard and Firefly Funhouse matches come to mind, the rest of them slowly slid down the wall, leaving a horrible, smelly stain as they went. But which of 2020's stinkers stunk the most? Well, that's why we're here today. Before we get started, it's important to note that we tried not to include a lack of crowd in the decision-making for this list. The pandemic wasn't the roster's fault, we assume anyway, so we will do our best to not hold any empty arena matches in too much disregard. With that out of the way, I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 2020. Join us. Number 10, Braun Strowman vs Bray Wyatt at Money in the Bank. Apologies to any Bray Wyatt fans out there, obviously he's brilliant, but he's also in this video quite a lot. This Universal Championship match from Money in the Bank saw Bray Wyatt do battle with his former acolyte, no not those ones, reigning champion Braun Strowman. This was Strowman's first major program since winning the title at WrestleMania, so it needed to be a good showing. Unfortunately though, it wasn't, although you'd probably probably already worked that out because it's on this list. The match kept getting interrupted by Bray's spooky puppet brigade, who are effective in the Firefly Funhouse, but pretty much nowhere else. Thankfully, Braun also got in on the mind games, putting on his old black sheep mask and convincing his former leader that he had rejoined him. Psych! It was all a ruse, leading Braun to power slam Bray for the win. Whilst the in-ring action itself was an awful, everything surrounding it was. The spookiness of the fiend was already being booked in a repetitive fashion, and this match was the first in a long series of missteps between Wyatt and Strowman. We would tell you what they are now, but we don't want to swamp you with information. Do you get it? Number 9. Randy Orton vs The Fiend at TLC Wyatt's second entry took place at 2020's final pay-per-view, TLC. It was supposed to be the blow-off match between him and Randy Orton, who had been feuding since October. However, as anyone who has seen our worst matches of 2021 list will know, this was far from the end of the feud. Due to each man's antics leading up to the show, including Randy locking Bray in a box and then setting it on fire, this match was made a Firefly Inferno match, where you had to set your opponent alight in order to win. It's classic pro wrestling. Sling. Flaming sticks, flaming belts, flaming rocking chairs. This match had it all, except for good wrestling. It definitely didn't have that. The match ended when Randy Orton, the good guy, set the fiend on fire, hit him with an RKO, and then poured gasoline all over his body before lighting it. Yet again, this match was ruined by all the spooky nonsense. The fact that it ended with a baby face burning a man alive, well, didn't help either. Number 8, Johnny Gargano versus Tommaso Ciampa on NXT. T. This will be a controversial one. From lovable teammates in DIY to bitter enemies waging war in the main event of TakeOver New Orleans, Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa had one of the best feuds in NXT history. If only WWE had taken the advice of hit musical act Fuel and left the memories alone. Sadly, they didn't do this. Instead, they kept stretching and stretching the story until it finally snapped during a nearly hour-long cinematic match nicknamed One Final Beat. Taking place on an April 2020 episode of NXT, the two men battered the stuffing out of each other all over an undisclosed location. This is the one time we're going to mention a lack of crowd in this list, because without the noise of an audience, this match took itself far too seriously, to the extent that it was hard to properly get invested in the action. The bout ended when Candice LeRae seemingly turned on her husband by kicking him square in the nuts, only to then do the same thing to Champa. Why not just kick Champa? Why pretend that you've taken his side? The whole thing was overly complicated, overly dramatic, and a blemish on one of the best pieces of wrestling storytelling telling of the past two decades. Number 7, The Women's Elimination Chamber at Elimination Chamber The Elimination Chamber is an inherently exciting gimmick. Six guys or gals locked inside a vicious structure where they have to destroy all of their opponents in order to leave. Sign me the heck up. However, often WWE finds a way to disappear.
a point, and that is exactly what they did in the main event of the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view in 2020. This six-woman chamber match was for a shot against Becky Lynch for the Raw Women's Championship at WrestleMania 36. It started out alright, with some decent wrestling between Natalya, Ruby Riot, and Sarah Logan. Then Shayna Baszler got in, and things went a bit weird. Baszler cut through the other women like a hot knife through butter, eliminating all three in quick fashion. She then did nothing for five minutes, waiting for Liv Morgan's pod to open before quickly eliminating her. She then did the exact same thing to Asuka to win. So the main thing about this match was that it was structured all wrong. We've got absolutely no problem with Shayna being built up as a dominant threat, in fact that is fantastic, but surely she should have come in last and tore through everyone like a hurricane. Instead, she spent most of her time standing around like a total plonker. Good job, WWE. Oh, and uh, she ended up losing at Mania 2. Number 6. Edge vs Randy Orton at WrestleMania 36 The former members of Rated RKO had one of the most heated rivalries of anyone heading into WrestleMania 36. Orton had viciously attacked Edge upon his return to Raw, delivering a vicious concerto to the Canadian's famously bad neck. This set up a last man standing grudge match between the two. Sadly, the last man standing stipulation applied mostly to the show's viewership, who struggled to stay awake during this long, grueling slog. For the better part of 40 minutes, Orton and Edge roamed around the backstage area, hitting each other with stuff like they were both playing SmackDown Here Comes the Pain. The rules of the match didn't help things either, as there were constant pauses in the action while the referee tried to count either man out. Mercifully, Edge ended Orton's night with a concerto and put us all out of our misery. The combination of this match being one of the most hyped on the show and one of the most disappointing is what puts it on this list. Edge and Orton would have benefited hugely from just having a normal 20-minute no-holds-barred match. Instead, we got this bloated thing that absolutely nobody is eager to revisit. Number 5. Brock Lesnar vs Ricochet at Super Showdown Goldberg had an 86-second match with Brock Lesnar at Survivor Series 2016, and pretty much everybody loved it. Ricochet lasted four whole seconds longer at Super Showdown 2020, and everybody hated it. What gives? Well, for one, the first match didn't take place in Saudi Arabia, which usually helps. Secondly, Goldberg actually beat Brock in his match. And thirdly, Goldberg didn't look like a complete and utter chump when facing the Beast. Ricochet had looked pretty good in the build-up to this one, beating Bobby Lashley and Seth Rollins in a triple threat to earn the opportunity. He had also whacked Brock in the balls during the Royal Rumble match, allowing Drew McIntyre to eliminate him. Unfortunately, low blows don't weaken the beast, they only make him angry. Lesnar absolutely devoured poor Rick at Super Showdown, dominating the entire match before pinning him with a single F5. We've all seen Lesnar have good matches with smaller opponents, but the booking clearly wasn't bothered about keeping Ricochet even remotely remotely strong here. Instead, he got utterly buried and hasn't really had a whiff of the main event scene ever since. Number 4. Braun Strowman vs Bray Wyatt at the Horror Show at Extreme Rules Bray and Braun's sequel was more akin to Jaws than The Terminator, as it had a far inferior sequel. Off the back of their stinker at Money in the Bank, someone decided it would be a good idea to have Strowman and Wyatt battle again, this time in something called a Wyatt Swamp Fight. The two men took a trip back to their old haunt for this cinematic match. Highlights of the bizarre spectacle included Braun fighting off some masked men, one of whom turned out to be himself, a vision of Alexa Bliss attacking Braun with a snake, Bray getting chokeslammed into a boat, and both wiggling around in the swamp before Bray caught Braun with the mandible claw and transformed into the fiend. So, who won the match? Why did all that stuff happen? What was the point of this? The answer to all three of those questions is nobody knows and nobody cares. The swamp fight was spooky nonsense at its finest. So bad, it was almost good. Note that I said almost there because calling this match good would be an insult to all good things everywhere. Number 3. The Two Wake Trophy Gauntlet Match at Super Showdown The Two Wake Mountain is a rock formation just outside of the Saudi capital, Riyadh. WWE decided to honour this national landmark by naming a really bad match after it. Let's start with the fact that our truth god bless him, almost won the damn thing, beating three people including Bobby Lashley and Andrade. Nothing against truth, but come on. We should also mention that AJ Styles really should have won the thing, as he beat our 
R-Truth as the last named entrant, but his moment was ruined when The Undertaker appeared out of nowhere to hit a chokeslam on AJ and win a match he wasn't even in. And the icing on the cake? Undertaker didn't even take the trophy he had just won with him when he left. So why did you do any of this, Undertaker? Please explain yourself. Everything about this match was confusing, from the participants to the layout to the finish. It was all one big convoluted way of setting up AJ Styles versus The Undertaker at WrestleMania, but I can think of about a million different ways to get there without doing any of this. Also, how much money did they spend on that trophy? And where is it now? Could use a new paperweight. Number 2. Seth Rollins vs Rey Mysterio at the Horror Show at Extreme Rules Seth Rollins is a vicious soul, isn't he? He once tried to kill Edge with a curb stomp, he once drove Dean Ambrose's head through a bunch of cinder blocks, and he also pulled Rey Mysterio's eye out! At the Horror Show at Extreme Rules, Rollins and Mysterio competed in the first, and hopefully last, Eye for an Eye match, in which the objective was to remove your opponent's eye. Yep, in kayfabe, WWE officially sanctioned a match where permanent mutilation wasn't just allowed, but required. The actual work in this match was decent, of course it was, look who's in it, but no amount of good wrestling could overcome how this bout ended. Seth somehow used the edge of the steel ring steps to pop Ray's eye out before he then threw up everywhere. Once again, in kayfabe, legendary luchador Rey Mysterio now only has one eye, except it's back now, I think. I'm not sure. Why did they do all this again? This whole match was really, really silly, and the finish was cartoonishly bad in execution. In fact, I wish I had been in this match so I could remove my own eyes and never have to see it again. Number 1. Goldberg vs The Fiend at Super Showdown Obviously. If The Fiend vs Seth Rollins at Hell in a Cell was the first nail in the character's coffin, then this main event of Super Showdown 2020 was the last. Instead of the big win he desperately needed, The Fiend lost for the first time ever to Goldberg after just 3 minutes and a botched jackhammer. This completely killed any momentum that The Fiend had left. Not only did he lose, but he lost to an old man in the blink of an eye. Sorry, Ray. And The Fiend wasn't the only one to suffer because of this, as droves of fans turned against Goldberg for being the one to bury one of the most exciting new characters in years. So why did this happen? Well, to set up Goldberg vs Roman Reigns at WrestleMania 36, a match that didn't end up happening because of the pandemic. Nice to see it was all worth it then. The only upside to this was that it freed The Fiend up to have the Firefly Funhouse match with John Cena at WrestleMania. Other than that, everything about it was simply dreadful, and there is no doubt in our minds that it was the worst WWE match to take place in all of 2020. 2019 with another wrestling decade coming to a close, WWE pulled out all the stops to make sure that the 2010s went out with a bang, and in some cases, they actually succeeded. 2019 was the year that saw Becky Lynch solidify herself as one of wrestling's biggest stars, the year that NXT invaded the main roster and won Survivor Series, and the year that saw the women's tag belts reintroduced. We were actually quite hopeful at the time. However, it was also a year full of disappointments. The following 10 matches were ones that left a particularly bad taste in our mouths, for one reason or another. Bad booking, botches, confusing match endings, beloved wrestlers nearly being killed in the ring. It's all here, folks! I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 2019. Join us! Number 10. The Men's Money in the Bank Ladder Match at Money in the Bank In the interest of fairness, let's talk about the positives here first. As far as Money in the Bank Ladder Matches go, this one held up its end of the bargain with some spectacular action and dangerous high spots. It also featured a great lineup, especially thanks to exciting participants like Finn Balor, Andrade, Ricochet, and Mustafa Ali. Add in some meaty boys like Drew McIntyre, Baron Corbin, and Randy Orton, and there's no way that this match could disappoint, right? Well, clearly somebody backstage thought there wasn't enough meat in this recipe because they decided to chuck in Brock Lesnar. Lesnar made an unannounced appearance in the match, much to the surprise of Ali, who just sat on top of the ladder for approximately 20 years as Lesnar made his way down the ramp. Just grab the briefcase, mate, it's right there. Instead, Brock toppled the ladder and cost Ali the win. He then climbed the ladder himself, unhooked the briefcase, and won a match he wasn't even in. The ending totally undid all the great action 
action leading up to it and rendered weeks of build completely pointless. It made every other participant look like a total chump and put Brock right back at the top of the card at a time where fans were getting a little bit sick of seeing him there. Number 9. Rey Mysterio vs Samoa Joe at Money in the Bank There must have been something in the air at Money in the Bank 2019 because it was also home to this strange encounter. Samoa Joe had squashed Rey Mysterio during their US title match at WrestleMania 35, beating the Lucha legend in under a minute. Their rematch at the next pay-per-view lasted exactly twice as long, but with the outcome reversed. Mysterio pinned Joe to win his first United States Championship, despite Joe's shoulder being about 10 feet off the mat when the three counts occurred. The Samoan submission machine took this about as well as you would expect, absolutely beating the snot out of Ray after the bell. Ray relinquished the title back to Joe the very next night on Raw due to a shoulder injury, not even vacating the belt, just giving it straight back to the man he'd beaten. Although not the worst match of 2019 in terms of notoriety, its short length, messy finish and inconsistent outcome definitely grant it a place on this list. Number 8. Charlotte Flair vs Lacey Evans on Raw Work shoots are a big part of wrestling and have been part of some of the greatest moments in the history of the sport. The Outsiders invading WCW, CM Punk's Pipe Bomb, Charlotte Flair vs Lacey Evans on the June 3rd, 2019 episode of Raw. Wait a minute, what's that doing here? For whatever reason, Flair and Evans decided to make their match on a random episode of Raw look as real as possible. They spent a good few minutes grappling around with each other, trying to legitimately take each other down, but fumbling almost every single move they attempted. Eventually, the match ended in DQ, but the damage had already been done. Fans were completely bemused by what they had just seen, with many trying to work out if the two had gotten into a real fight live on TV. Dave Meltzer wondered whether someone backstage had told them to do this, but added that it would be a stupid idea as neither woman had been trained in shoot fighting. Number 7. Lars Sullivan vs Lucha House Party at Super Showdown A quick spoiler here, this isn't the only mention of Super Showdown on this list, or WWE Saudi Arabia shows in general. One of the many flops on the night was a 3-on-1 handicap match pitting Lars Sullivan against Gran Metalik, Lince Dorado and Kalisto. This was Sullivan's in-ring debut on the main roster and he was at a serious disadvantage against three high flyers. He was valiant in his efforts to fight them off, but the numbers game was just too much for Lars and the match was thrown out after the house party ganged up on him. Hey, at least the freak won by DQ. Wait a second, I've got this all wrong, surely? Sullivan was the heel going up against a group of three baby faces? Why on earth would WWE book a heel at a disadvantage? And why would they have the good guys cost themselves the match by all attacking the bad guy at once? Who on earth did did this help? If you're thinking that none of this makes any sense, that is because it doesn't. It was totally backwards booking from WWE that damaged Lars's run as soon as it got started. We're not sure if it can totally be blamed for his career stalling, but it was certainly one of many reasons. Number 6. Baron Corbin vs Kurt Angle at WrestleMania 35 A stipulation can make or break a match, and that was evident in this encounter from the Showcase of the Immortals. Had Baron Corbin vs Kurt Angle just been a normal contest, Test, it would have been perfectly fine, although maybe not spectacular considering the stacked card it was on. However, this ended up being one of the biggest letdowns of the year because it was Angle's retirement match. That's right, this was the final installment of a career that spanned nearly 20 years, included dozens of championships and countless memorable moments. In terms of in-ring ability, mic skills and sheer versatility, Kurt Angle can legitimately be seen as one of the greatest all-rounders in wrestling history and his career ended with a wet fart of a match. It's not exactly Kurt's fault or Corbin's to be honest. Angle was extremely limited in the ring by this point in his career, his offense mostly just punches and German suplexes. But the booking behind this bout was its own worst enemy. What relevance did Corbin have to Angle's career in the first place? And you know what? The win didn't exactly benefit the lone wolf either. While there's obviously nothing wrong with a legend losing their last match, seeing one of the greatest of all time go out like this weighed heavy on the hearts of many wrestling fans that night. Number 5. Brock Lesnar vs Kofi Kingston on SmackDown Thankfully, WrestleMania 35 wasn't all old men losing in sad matches as it also saw the climax of the Kofi Mania storyline. After building a groundswell of fan support, Kofi Kingston defeated Daniel Bryan for the WWE Championship, his first world title in his 11-year career. 
Kingston would then embark on a pretty decent title run, but one which could never truly live up to the joy of his initial win. He held the gold for 180 days and retained against the likes of Randy Orton, Kevin Owens, and Samoa Joe. Then came the first episode of SmackDown on Fox. The show was mostly sold on a WWE Championship match between Kofi Kingston and Brock Lesnar. Fans were extremely worried that WWE would job Kingston out to put the belt back on Brock, but, oh, actually, that's exactly what happened, sorry. Not only that, but Lesnar pinned Kofi in just eight seconds after a single F5. It was absolutely heartbreaking to see all of Kofi's hard work disappear so quickly, and it was even worse to see him drop back down the card, perhaps never to be seen on that same level again. This result showed how WWE really viewed Kofi, and although the feel-good moment at WrestleMania can never be taken away, it still feels a little more bittersweet in hindsight. Number four, Brock Lesnar versus versus Cain Velasquez at Crown Jewel. One of the big matches that Crown Jewel 2019 was sold on was Brock Lesnar defending the WWE Championship against UFC legend Cain Velasquez. The two men had history together in the octagon, as it was Velasquez who defeated Lesnar to end his UFC Heavyweight Championship reign in 2010. WWE were clearly trying to capitalize on this real-life rivalry, but they went about it in the worst way possible. Instead of competing in the main event like many fans thought, they would, Lesnar and Velasquez actually opened the show. As if this wasn't confusing enough, Lesnar won the match via submission in just 88 seconds, making Velasquez look like a complete loser in the process. And to make matters even worse, this was Kane's one and only match in WWE, as he was let go from the company during the pandemic. So what was all of this for? WWE had a really intriguing storyline on their hands with Lesnar versus Velasquez, but they totally screwed it up. The match was a total letdown and irreparably damaged Kane's stock in WWE. But hey, at least it set up that great Brock Lesnar vs Rey Mysterio match at Survivor Series, so, you know, every cloud. Number 3. Tyson Fury vs Braun Strowman at Crown Jewel Three years before he was serenading Cardiff with a bit of American pie, boxing great Tyson Fury was stinking up a WWE ring in Saudi Arabia. After getting into an altercation with the Monster Among Men on an episode of SmackDown, Fury demanded a match with Braun at Crown Jewel. Braun accepted, and after a huge pull-apart brawl, the fight was on! And hey, at least Fury's entrance was good, wasn't it? The big fireworks display and everything? the Isley Brothers playing in the background. If only we could stop there, but now we have to talk about the actual match. Unfortunately, everything about this one was toilet-worthy. Fury struggled with taking even basic bumps, and the whole thing ended in anti-climax when the boxer knocked Braun out of the ring and took the count-out win. Braun then hit the power slam after the bell, which Tyson decided to shake off in record time. Has he no respect for this business? Strowman vs Fury was exactly what it appeared to be, a slapdash celebrity celebrity match designed to get mainstream attention and appease the Saudi regime. Still, considering their faces were on the poster, you would have thought they would have tried a bit harder. Hey, at least he didn't sing. Number 2. Seth Rollins vs The Fiend at Hell in a Cell Bray Wyatt's Fiend character was one of the hottest properties in wrestling when he debuted it in spectacular fashion at SummerSlam 2019. Fans had high hopes for the character, especially as he was booked strongly in the months after his debut, and then Hell in a Cell happened. The Fiend was booked to face Seth Rollins for the Universal Championship in the pay-per-view's signature match, and when all was said and done, it would go down as one of the most hated in the history of the stick. Stipulation. Red flags were there right from the start of the bout, quite literally actually. The cell was bathed in red light for the entire duration, which is never a good sign. Then, after Rollins had buried the fiend under a pile of weapons, he went to use a sledgehammer. The referee wasn't happy about this, but hey, it's hell in a cell, right? Anything goes! But then, after Rollins hit the pile with the sledgehammer, the ref called for the bell and ended the match. A hell in a cell match ending via referee stoppage. Right. Not only did this finish ruin the aura of The Fiend, who apparently needed medical treatment after the match, it also undermined the entire Hell in a Cell stipulation. Number 1. The Undertaker vs Goldberg at Super Showdown As bad as Rollins vs The Fiend was, at least nobody nearly died during it. The same cannot be said for the main event of Super Showdown, a dream match between The Undertaker and Goldberg. Two men defined by their undefeated streaks were going head to head for the first time ever in their 50s in the blazing Saudi Arabian heat. 
Uh oh. This match was a train wreck from start to finish. Both men visibly struggled, which led to a series of terrifying botches, including Goldberg nearly dropping Taker directly on his head. Undertaker has since admitted that the move almost broke his neck, whilst Goldberg says that he got a concussion during the match. We're not sure whether this happened when both men fell over after a failed tombstone, but it couldn't have helped either way. A bad match is one thing, but a match that ended up endangering the lives of two legends is pretty much unforgivable. Both men will struggle to erase this catastrophe from their resumes, which is a crying shame considering the incredible legacies that they have. And that's why it's our pick for the worst WWE match of 2019. 2018 2018 was the year of WWE fans wanting one thing and the company giving them something else. Okay, so that was a lot of years between 2002 and 2022, but this year was especially bad for it. Not only did we get Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar's original endless feud, but it also saw Asuka's undefeated streak come to an end, Hulk Hogan return to WWE after his scandal, and WWE head to Saudi Arabia for the first time. As if all of that wasn't enough, we've rounded up 10 of the absolute worst wrestling matches from the year as well. Aren't we nice? The majority of them are on this list because of the booking decisions made surrounding them. Whether it was the wrong winner, or a clumsy finish, or just an out-and-out -out mistake, these bouts all disappointed wrestling fans in one way or another. But don't worry, there are some good old-fashioned bad matches on here too. As I said, we're bloody great, aren't we? I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 2018. Join us. Number 10, Carmella vs. Asuka at Money in the Bank. Beginning his solo career in 2016 as a victim of Braun Strowman, James Ellsworth's underdog persona got so over that he soon found himself in the main event storyline on SmackDown. A combination of overexposure and some serious allegations of misconduct have since tarnished Ellsworth's name, but there was a time where he was all over WWE's product. Unfortunately, that includes the SmackDown Women's Championship match at Money in the Bank 2018. One year after ruining the first women's Money in the Bank ladder match, Ellsworth was back again to ruin this contest as well. He appeared dressed as Asuka during the closing moments of the Empress's title bout with Carmella. This distracted her long enough for Carmella to hit Asuka with a kick and pin her to retain the championship. This was Asuka's second ever televised WWE loss, and fans were furious that she was booked to lose in such a stupid fashion. This match is one that WWE will be in no hurry to remind you of for a variety of reasons. Number 9. Gallows and Anderson vs The Revival at Raw 25 the team currently known as FTR had a rough go of it on the WWE main roster. They lost big matches, suffered a bunch of injuries, and were routinely humiliated by the company that was supposed to be promoting them. One of the most egregious examples of this came on the 25th anniversary of Monday Night Raw. Dash and Dawson, as they were known in those days, interrupted a segment featuring DX, Scott Hall, and the Balor Club. This led to a match with Anderson and Gallows that the former Bullet Club men won in under two minutes. After losing in swift fashion, the Revival were embarrassed further when the Legends proceeded to absolutely annihilate them with their finishers, ending with a sweet chin music pedigree combo on Dash Wilder. While it was fun to see some Legends in action, DX standing tall came at the expense of a fantastic duo. Anyone who hadn't seen Dash and Dawson's incredible matches in NXT would have thought they were nothing more than a joke, and it's not surprising that they wanted out ASAP. Number 8. Jeff Hardy vs Jinder Mahal at the Greatest Royal Rumble WWE's first big trip to Saudi Arabia took place in April 2018 and was, in the grand scheme of things, pretty decent. Sadly, in amongst the ladder match for the IC Championship and the 50-man Royal Rumble, there was one definite dud on the night, and it came in the form of Jeff Hardy defending his US title against Jinder Mahal. Few have connected with an audience quite like Jeff Hardy, but he's not always been the type to carry someone to a great match match. And Jinder, who had just come off the back of his disastrous WWE Championship reign, could have used some help restarting his momentum here. Sadly, the bout was very slow and clunky, with several missteps and outright botches throughout. The most noteworthy came when Hardy attempted a whisper in the wind on Jinder, only to miss it completely. But don't worry, Jinder managed to cover it up with some top-notch selling, flopping to the ground despite being nowhere near Jeff's move. Ah oh, well, at least this show wasn't as bad as the next time the company would go to Saudi Arabia. 
Arabia. Don't worry, we'll get to it. Number 7. Dean Ambrose vs Seth Rollins at TLC What should have been a very emotionally charged encounter turned out to be one of the most disappointing matches of the year. Ambrose was fresh off a shocking heel turn after betraying a babyface Seth Rollins. Ambrose then cost the pair their Raw Tag Team Championships before demanding a match for Rollins' IC belt. This had all the potential for an all-out war, a grudge match where all wrestling convention could go out the window. These two men absolutely hated each other and were ready to tear each other apart to get their revenge. What followed instead was 23 minutes of slow, evenly paced wrestling, eventually leading to Ambrose getting the win. Fans were baffled by the way this match was laid out. The story between Ambrose and Rollins should have led to a brutal fight instead of a tedious, quite boring match that went on way too long. In the grand scheme of things, it was pretty fine, but the storyline called for something much greater. Then again, considering this was the feud that saw Dean get injections in his ass, maybe we shouldn't have been that surprised. Number 6. Roman Reigns vs Braun Strowman at Hell in a Cell only WWE could undermine two of their biggest stipulations in the same match. But that is exactly what happened when Braun Strowman cashed in Money in the Bank to challenge Roman Reigns inside Hell in a Cell. To give them credit, the match itself was good. Both performers have great chemistry and there were run-ins from each man's respective faction, including Seth Rollins and Dolph Ziggler plummeting off the side of the cage. And then Brock Lesnar arrived and… oh dear. The Beast Incarnate made his return after several months away, kicking down the door of the cell and laying out both competitors with F5s. This left them unable to continue, ending the match in a no contest. That's right, Hell in a Cell, supposedly the most punishing violent stipulation in WWE history, ended via ref stoppage. Make it make sense. WWE had obviously booked themselves into a corner here. They didn't want either Reigns or Strowman to lose, but had to put them inside the cell because of the paper of you stipulation. Number 5. Brock Lesnar vs Braun Strowman at Crown Jewel The entire purpose of the rubbish Hell in a Cell finish we just talked about was to set up a three-way Universal Championship match for the next Saudi Arabia show. Reigns, Strowman and Lesnar would go at it for the title at Crown Jewel, but fate intervened to cost us what would have been a cracker of a match. Sadly, Roman was diagnosed with leukemia. He announced this to the wrestling world on Raw, leaving Lesnar and Strowman to face off for the vacant championship. Fans were hoping for a clash of the titans, two big boys colliding head-on with Strowman avenging his loss to Lesnar from the year before. Instead, Raw General Manager Baron Corbin, remember that, clocked Strowman with the belt before the bell. This wasn't the end of the match though, because it then took five F5s for Lesnar to beat Strowman and reclaim his precious red belt. Despite sounding like it would protect Strowman in defeat, the multiple F5s just dragged out what was already a train wreck of a championship match. If WWE WWE wanted Braun to look strong, then they should have probably just given him a competitive showing against the Beast. Instead, all we got was three minutes of our lives we're never getting back. Number 4. Roman Reigns vs Samoa Joe at Backlash One of them is Samoa Joe, the other is a Samoan called Joe. What could possibly go wrong? Well, as it turns out, everything. Backlash 2018 was already a cursed show when Reigns and Joe met in the main event. This one really needed to deliver in order to win the crowd back, but instead, WWE got the tone all wrong. Reigns vs Joe was really, really slow, and not slow in an old school methodical way, slow in an 87 year old grandpa going to the toilet way. It's worth noting here that Samoa Joe had built up a huge amount of popularity, particularly with pay per view crowds, which generally tend to be slightly more representative of smarky internet opinions. To put it bluntly, the fans desperately did not want Roman to win. As well as booing the big dog, the audience also chanted for CM Punk, Rusev Day and just about anything else that wasn't Roman Reigns. The toxic reaction only intensified as the match reached its climax, peaking when Roman won with a spear. The only reason the boos weren't louder was because a lot of people had already left the building. Number 3. Brock Lesnar vs Roman Reigns at WrestleMania 34 The build-up to the main event of WWE's biggest pay-per-view was a disaster in 2018. Roman Reigns had been pushed 
push to the moon in spite of bad fan reaction again, and Universal Champion Brock Lesnar had been almost totally absent from TV in the weeks leading up to WrestleMania. Fans were more than ready for the Lesnar Reigns rivalry to be over, even reluctantly accepting the latter should win the Universal Championship at Mania, but WWE didn't listen. Reigns and Lesnar must have turned unlimited finishes on for this match because they just kept spamming their biggest moves over and over. Spears, Superman punches, German suplexes, and F5s. These moves made up about 90% of the match, with Brock eventually coming away victorious. Unfortunately, neither the winner nor the action landed with the tired New Orleans crowd. Not only was this one of the weirdest and worst WrestleMania events of all time, it also meant that the rivalry wasn't over. It was a bad showing all round especially considering that fans had waited about seven hours to see it close out the biggest show of the year. Number 2. Shane McMahon vs Dolph Ziggler at Crown Jewel Vince McMahon had obviously been watching old football matches in 2018 because he had World Cup fever at Crown Jewel. WWE decided they had been messing around for too long. It was time to find the best wrestler in the world once and for all. So naturally, the final came down to Dolph Ziggler vs The Miz, except it did didn't because Miz injured himself before the match could officially begin. So who took Miz's place? You guessed it, the world's sweatiest man, Shane McMahon. The SmackDown commissioner took on Dolph in the final and, because of course he did, came out on top to be officially crowned the best wrestler in the world. Take that, Brian Danielson. Up yours, Kenny Omega. Go to hell, Von Wagner. There's a new goat in town and he wears sweet baseball jerseys. Number 1. The Brothers of Destruction vs DX at Crown Jewel I honestly don't even know where to start with this one. First of all, the combined age of the people in this match was over 200. Second of all, nobody was wrestling on a full-time schedule, which led to the best move of the entire match being Kane's mask falling off. I'm only half joking when I say that. And finally, the thing that makes this match stink above everything else is the fact that this was the reason Shawn Michaels came out of retirement. Eight years after his emotional farewell at WrestleMania 26, the showstopper got back in the ring and, well, let's just say we were all heartbroken kids. There's no way of saying it nicely, this match was almost half an hour of botched moves, poor sequences, and all four men looking like they wanted nothing more than a nice cup of tea and a nap. Triple H's torn pectoral muscle was probably the worst injury in this match, unless you count HBK's bruised legacy, which we absolutely 100% do. 2017 the year of 2017 in WWE brought us some truly unforgettable moments. The return of the Hardy Boys at WrestleMania 33, the insane four-way main event of SummerSlam, and who could forget the legendary reveal of Jason Jordan as Kurt Angle's illegitimate son. Classic stuff. Yet, as always, not everything was perfect in the land of McMahon. With the brand split still in full effect, Raw and SmackDown had very limited rosters and struggled to build stars. 2017 was also the year that the Universal Championship was taken hostage by Brock Lesnar and, of course, it was the year of Jinder Mahal as WWE Champion. But what about the matches? What were some of the worst to take place across the many hours of TV and the 25 different pay-per-views and network specials to take place in 2017? Well, look no further, because that's what I'm here for. I'm Adam Pacisi from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 2017. Join us! Number 10. Big Cass vs Big Show at SummerSlam After viciously splitting up from Enzo Amore earlier in the year, Big Cass established himself as a monster heel in need of another giant to do battle with. Enter the Big Show. Unfortunately, their match at SummerSlam was about as slow and lumbering as you would expect from two men their size. Plus, it had the added annoyance of Enzo being suspended above the ring in a shark cage. The worst part of the whole thing was when Enzo stripped down to his underwear and covered himself in baby oil in order to slip out of the cage, only to drop to the mat and get immediately taken out by Cass. Big Cass got the win in the end, but this encounter did absolutely nothing for any of the three men involved. Also, SummerSlam was in New York that year, the same city that Enzo and Cass are from. Surely WWE could have come up with something better for them in front of their home crowd. Well, apparently not. Number 9. Brock Lesnar vs Braun Strowman at No Mercy 
The main event of No Mercy 2017 was a victim of its own hype. Well, that and the fact that it was crap. Braun Strowman had put on the showing of a lifetime in the fatal four-way main event of SummerSlam, standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with Brock Lesnar and even getting the better of the beast. Lesnar just about escaped with his title reign intact, but this set up a Universal Championship match between the two at No Mercy. Fans didn't exactly expect Braun to win, but the pair would at least have another great match, right? Well, no, that didn't happen. First of all, the bout was completely the wrong style for these two mountains of men. It was a slow, methodical wrestling match as opposed to the high-octane car crash that had come at SummerSlam. The fans were simply not happy as they had been expecting the latter. Secondly, it totally killed Braun's momentum as Brock dispatched the challenger with just a single F5. It would take months to rehabilitate Stroke and WWE missed a huge opportunity to solidify him as one of their stars of the future. Well, at least he wasn't dumped in the back of a garbage truck, eh? That would happen at the next pay-per-view. Number 8. Roman Reigns vs The Undertaker at WrestleMania 33 Admittedly, the post-match angle for WrestleMania's 33 main event was exceptional. After 27 long years in WWE, The Undertaker finally hung up his hat and coat for good, descending into the floor one last time as over 70,000 people chanted answered his name. It was a seriously touching moment, almost enough to make you forget that it wasn't actually his retirement, and also forget about the match that came before it. Taker's retirement match against Roman Reigns was the worst thing to happen to the dead man since his parents were killed in that fire. It became sadly apparent that the Phenom simply couldn't go at his usual high level anymore, and messed up spot after spot. The worst of these was an attempted tombstone reversal, which saw both men topple sadly to the canvas. The longer the fight went on, the harder it got to watch as the larger-than-life Undertaker looked more and more like a run-down veteran. Reigns finally put Mean Mark out of his misery with a spear, becoming just the second person ever to beat him at WrestleMania. Then came the retirement, which ended up being about as permanent as Taker's black hair dye. In hindsight, whilst it wasn't the worst match of 2017, it was perhaps the biggest anti-climax. I guess at least we can be grateful that this wasn't the dead man's true send-off. Number 7. Kevin Owens vs AJ Styles at Battleground Despite being two of the most captivating wrestlers of their generation, Kevin Owens and AJ Styles couldn't buy a good match together in WWE. Their feud over the US title throughout the summer of 2017 is the perfect example of this. The pair had three matches for the belt on pay-per-view, one ended in count-out, one had Shane McMahon in it, and the other seemingly ended by mistake? Yes, at Battleground, Owens accidentally pinned AJ to win his third United States Championship. At least it certainly looked like it was an accident, as Owens awkwardly rolled Styles over for the referee to make the count. The wrestlers looked confused, the announce team sounded confused, and the crowd were confused too, especially as Owens had only just lost the title to AJ two weeks earlier. Further evidence that the title change was a mistake came on the next episode of SmackDown, when Styles reclaimed the championship during a triple threat. WWE flew Chris Jericho in especially for the episode, presumably so that AJ could pin him to win the belt. All in all, this was just a big old mess, and it was symptomatic of the surprising lack of chemistry between these two in-ring greats. Number 6. Charlotte Flair vs Nia Jax on Raw Some of you may remember that, on an August 2021 episode of Monday Night Raw, Charlotte Flair and Nia Jax got into what looked like a legitimate fight. What began as a few botched moves soon descended into full-on slapping and shoving as the two women got visibly more and more angry with one another. As shocking as it is to see such a match on live TV, perhaps it shouldn't have been that surprising considering the two had a similarly rough encounter in 2017. On the April 10th, 2017 edition of Raw, Jax and Flair faced off in a short but nearly lethal bout. Things got off to a bad start when Nia dropped Charlotte headfirst onto the mat after a shoulder breaker before the Queen got a measure of revenge, accidentally smashing Nia's head with her boot off a missed moonsault. Mercifully, the match lasted less than six minutes and neither competitor was seriously hurt. But still, it was a tough thing to watch and one has to wonder whether any animosity between the two carried over into their scuffle four years years later. Number 5. The Women's Money in the Bank Ladder Match at Money in the Bank 
Sometimes a finish to a match can be so bad that it can cast an unfortunate shadow over the good work that came before it. And that is certainly true of the 2017 Women's Money in the Bank ladder match, which was the very first of its kind. Competitors like Becky Lynch, Natalia, and Carmella pulled out all the stops to make its maiden voyage a memorable one, but sadly, the only thing this match is remembered for is its shoddy ending. Just when it looked like Lynch was about to claim the prize, James Ellsworth pushed the ladder over. He then put it back up, climbed up himself, and retrieved the briefcase for Carmella. In case you missed that, the first ever women's money in the bank match was won by a man. And not just any man, but James bloody Ellsworth. So bad was the ending to this match that WWE decided to redo the entire thing two days later on SmackDown, and Carmella won that one as well. Number 4, Randy Orton vs Bray Wyatt at WrestleMania 33 Anyone who has been keeping up with the series will know that Randy Orton and Bray Wyatt dominated both the 2020 and 2021 lists. But Orton's horrible rivalry with The Fiend can be traced all the way back to this match at WrestleMania 33, where the Viper met the Eater of Worlds for the WWE title. The match had been building for months following Orton's alliance with and betrayal of the Wyatt family. Fans were expecting a vicious blood feud between the two rivals, but what they actually got was a series of PowerPoint presentations. The bout started off well enough, but things got super silly when Bray used his magical projector to cast an image of some maggots onto the ring canvas. Okay, thought the audience, that's weird, but let's see where it goes. Unfortunately, where it went was just more images of insects. Cockroaches, earthworms, all the classics were there, and the fans, well, they completely switched off by this point. This, combined with some pretty dull in-ring action, means that this encounter sadly goes down as one of the worst WWE title matches in WrestleMania history. Number 3, Alexa Bliss vs Bayley at Extreme Rules At Payback 2017, Alexa Bliss dethroned Bayley to win her first Raw Women's Championship. This was less than ideal for the former NXT Women's Champion, but things were about to get a whole lot worse. When a rematch was made for Extreme Rules, we all wondered what the stipulation would be. Perhaps it would be a coal miner's glove match, or a reverse battle royal. Maybe WWE were bringing back Kennel from Hell. Actually, it was worse than all of those put together. Instead, the two women fought in a kendo stick on a pole match. Now, any wrestling fan worth their salt will know to run for the hills whenever the words on a pole are introduced, and that's exactly what we should have done here. Bliss absolutely wrecked Bailey, beating her in just over five minutes before the hugger could even use the match's weapon of choice. That is embarrassing enough, but it gets worse when you remember that the stipulation was actually Bailey's idea in the first place. A bad match type with catastrophic results for Bailey, this bout was the final nail in the coffin for what was once a very promising babyface. Number 2, Bray Wyatt vs Randy Orton at Payback Less than a month after their disastrous WrestleMania match, Wyatt and Orton outdid themselves with the House of Horrors. A precursor to the cinematic matches that dominated lockdown wrestling, the House of Horrors was a partially pre-taped segment which saw Randy visit Bray's derelict home. When inside, Orton Orton was subjected to all kinds of spooky magic, including a haunted fridge! Woo! The scariest of all kitchen appliances. The following ten or so minutes consisted of Orton walking into various weird rooms around the house, only for Bray to jump out and attack him. Surprise! He's done exactly the same thing again. The action made its way all the way to the arena via limousine, where Wyatt beat Orton thanks to an assist from Jinder Mahal. This match can be seen as a major clue in terms of what followed, with Vince pushing Bray as an overly goofy supernatural character as opposed to a more serious, captivating presence. Some people enjoyed the camp silliness of the House of Horrors, but for others it was a step too far. Take into consideration that Randy was WWE Champion at the time, and you could probably understand why so many people were against it. And as if things couldn't get any worse, the match even had a bit of Jinder at the end of it. What's wrong with Jinder, you ask? Well, number 1, Jinder Mahal vs Randy Orton at Bat Battleground. For those who don't know what the Punjabi prison match is, firstly, good for you. Secondly, it's kind of like Hell in a Cell, if instead of steel, the cell was made of giant toothpicks. The match concept lay dormant for a decade after No Mercy 2007, only to rise from the dead at Battleground for Jinder Mahal's WWE Championship defense against Randy Orton. 
Somebody should have taken one of those bamboo stakes and driven it through the heart of whatever demon came up with this infernal idea in the first place. The battleground match had exactly the same issues as every other Punjabi prison match. The space was extremely limiting, it took forever to climb out of the cage, and nobody could see anything because there were dozens of giant wooden rods in the way. Just as Orton looked to have the match won, who should come out to stop him but the Great Carly, The innovator of the prison match and one of the greatest technical wrestlers of all time. Thanks to Carly's glacially slow interference, Mahal retained the title, which his gigantic friend then proceeded to hold upside down. A bad ending to a bad, bad, bad match. Let's just hope it's another 10 years before we see the dreaded Punjabi prison again. 2016 2016 was a very big year for the very big dub. It saw the arrival of talent like AJ Styles and Shinsuke Nakamura, the Cruiserweight Classic was held, the brand split came back, and Zack Ryder was IC champion for all of 24 hours. Honestly, it was a year of fantastic wrestling from performers like Styles, Dean Ambrose, Kevin Owens, Sasha Banks, and basically everyone in NXT. However, it was also a year heavily centered around the mega push of Roman Reigns, and at this stage of his career, it wasn't a good sign. This list doesn't really have a lot of bad wrestling on it. The in-ring quality of most of these matches is actually pretty decent, but it does feature an absolute ton of stupid, immature, <laughs> nonsensical booking decisions. Prepare for your intelligence to be thoroughly insulted with this one. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 2016. Join us. Number 10, The Undertaker vs Shane McMahon at WrestleMania 32. Okay, yes, Shane's leap off the cell was an incredible WrestleMania moment. That's why this match is only at number 10 on this list, but if we dive away and look at everything else, it really doesn't have much going for it. After nine years away from the business, Shane O'Mac was Shane O'Back, and he wanted to take control of the red brand. His dad agreed, but only on the condition that he defeat The Undertaker at WrestleMania, inside Hell in a Cell. The red-hot beginnings of this feud slowly fizzled out as both men's motivations got seriously muddled on the way to WrestleMania. By the time the match rolled around, most of the excitement of Shane's return had worn off. For half an hour, these two middle-aged men plodded around a metal box, stopping very occasionally to hit one another. Everyone remembers this match for Shane's epic dive, but people are quick to forget that the story was absolute nonsense. What was in the lockbox? And the action wasn't great either. And to add insult to the injury, Vince decided to give Shane a go at running Raw anyway, even though he lost. For the love of mankind. Number 9. TJ Perkins vs The Brian Kendrick at Clash of Champions when WWE reintroduced its cruiserweight division in 2016, hopes were initially very high. It seemed as if the company were finally giving smaller, more athletic wrestlers a chance to shine, and the Cruiserweight Classic provided some of the best matches of the year. Sadly, things went down the toilet as soon as a certain ancient billionaire got involved. I'll give you three guesses as to who I mean. As soon as the Cruiserweights moved to Raw, the entire experiment completely fell apart. This can be seen in excruciating detail at Clash of Champions 2016, when defending champion TJ Perkins took on THE Brian Kendrick. Both men were excellent workers and had legitimate history with one another that could have told an interesting story. Unfortunately, the only thing the crowd was interested in was seeing how long they could sit on their hands. The match got absolutely zero reaction, making it almost impossible to watch without cringing so hard your eyeballs exploded. The action itself was predictably very good, but watching it play out to absolute silence was nothing short of torture. Maybe if WWE had given people any reason to care about the cruiserweights on the main roster, things might have been different. Number 8. The Golden Truth vs Breezango at Money in the Bank 
told Dustin our truth were both veteran wrestlers that had nothing to do in 2016, so WWE decided to put them together in a tag team and have them mill about the undercard for a year. The Golden Truth, as they were known, were a classic odd couple tag team, with many people drawing comparisons to Goldust's run with Booker T in 2002, although with much less success. After initially going on a losing streak, the pair picked up their first victory on the Money in the Bank pre-show against Tyler Breeze and Fandango. Breezango had been tormenting the Golden Truth for weeks and had beaten them up twice in the lead-up to this encounter. So, to get the advantage, Truth and Goldie sabotaged their tanning beds, exposing their skin to deadly radiation just to win a wrestling match on a pre-show. What a bunch of heroes. The match lasted just over five minutes and mainly featured Truth and Goldust slapping their opponent's burnt skin, a joke that got less funny every time they did it. In the end, the Golden Truth won this utterly pointless and very stupid match and the crowd were ecstatic because they didn't have to watch it anymore. Number 7. Rusev vs Big Cass at Roadblock End of the Line For whatever reason, WWE ran two events called Roadblock in 2016, one in March and one in December. We'll get to the March events later in this list, but for now, let's focus on this absolute stinker of a match from the final month of the year. The pre-show for Roadblock End of the Line featured a match between Rusev and Big Cass. Their reason for fighting was that Cass's partner Enzo Amore had gotten himself into Rusev's crosshairs after making several passes at his wife Lana. Oh, and Enzo and Cass were the baby faces in this storyline because Vince could never go long without booking someone to try and split up Lana and Rusev. The match itself was really dull until the action spilled to the outside where Enzo once again got in Lana's face. This caused Rusev to attack him, which caused Cass to get distracted, which caused the Bulgarian brute to win via countout. Riveting stuff and a great pre show sell job for the pay-per-view itself. Number 6. Brock Lesnar vs Randy Orton at SummerSlam A divisive one here, as while it was certainly a bold booking decision, at the time it felt utterly confusing and pretty scary. As the first major show of the new brand split era, WWE needed a major match to close out SummerSlam 2016. They opted for a cross-brand dream match, Raw's Brock Lesnar vs SmackDown's Randy Orton. Unfortunately, what began as a dream soon turned into a bloody nightmare quite literally. After about 10 minutes of the classic Lesnar formula, the Beast became frustrated with the Viper after he kicked out of an F5. Lesnar must have thought he was still in the octagon at the time because he began to unleash an onslaught of shoot elbow strikes on Orton, cutting his forehead deep enough to draw blood. The match was awarded to Brock Lesnar via technical submission and a dazed Orton required 10 stitches in his head to close the wound. WWE clearly wanted to do something spectacular to close out out SummerSlam, but many felt that this was not the way to do it. The decision to let Lesnar cut Orton open for real was not only a reckless one, but it completely drained the energy out of the crowd, who stopped enjoying the match and started becoming very concerned for Randy's safety. Number 5. Brock Lesnar vs Dean Ambrose at WrestleMania 32 The man known today as John Moxley had gotten wildly popular toward the end of 2015 as Dean Ambrose, with many people backing him to be the new face of the company over Roman Reigns. However, WWE never properly pulled the trigger on the lunatic fringe and stuck him in this train wreck at WrestleMania 32. The idea of Ambrose, a former deathmatch specialist, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Brock Lesnar in a no-holds-barred match was mouth-watering on paper. Unfortunately though, wrestling matches aren't fought on paper. As he occasionally does, Lesnar turned up to WrestleMania 32 and went, Hey, I don't feel like working today. He proceeded to put in a half assed effort against Ambrose, restricting his offense to German suplexes and going blah in that way that he does. Lesnar eventually won the match, making Dean look like a total chump. This was supposed to be his stipulation, and he was still dominated by Brock for most of the match. Worst of all, WWE had actually spent weeks showing Ambrose collecting 
creating various different weapons to use against Brock. Did he use any of them in the actual match? Well, it's on this list. What do you think? Number 4. The Miz vs Darren Young at Battleground For some unknown reason, Darren Young spent most of his 2016 hanging out with former WWE champion Bob Backlund. Mr. Backlund had decided to become Darren's life coach, taking on the mission of making him great again. Not to be rude, but was Darren Young ever great in the first place? Anyway, the Hall of Famer's teachings seemed to pay off when Young won a battle royal to determine who would face IC champion The Miz at Battleground. Unfortunately, this was as good as it would get for the former primetime player. The bout itself was quite unremarkable at first, but things got really stupid when Backland and Maurice got into an altercation which drew Miz to the outside. Backland tried to take his shirt off to confront the A-lister, but it got stuck on his suspenders, making it look like he was wearing a giant bib. Then Young attacked Miz and the match was called off due to a double disqualification. You know a match is bad when the highlight is a 67-year-old man struggling to get his clothes off. Number 3. Brock Lesnar vs The Wyatt Family at Roadblock March's Roadblock event was sold on two major matches, Dean Ambrose vs Triple H for the WWE Championship and Brock Lesnar vs Bray Wyatt. The Eater of Worlds had cost Lesnar the Rumble match earlier in the year and the Beast was out for vengeance. Most people expected this to be Lesnar's WrestleMania match, so eyebrows were raised when the two were booked to square off at Roadblock instead. Eyebrows continued to be raised when the match went from Brock vs Bray one-on-one -on -one to a two-on-one handicap match pitting Wyatt and Luke Harper against Lesnar. In reality, it was more of a Lesnar-Harper singles match, as Bray did absolutely nothing but watch Harper get picked apart by the former UFC champ. All of this went down because Bray was dealing with an injury. WWE basically had their backs against the wall, but surely they could come up with something better than this needless squash. Number 2. Dean Ambrose vs Chris Jericho at Extreme Rules Before they were feuding over the AEW World Championship in 2020, Dean Ambrose and Chris Jericho locked horns in WWE over… Uh, a potted plant. No, really, it had a name and everything. It was called Mitch. The two men had been feuding off the back of Ambrose's loss to Lesnar at WrestleMania. After beating him at Payback, Dean challenged Chris to a match of his own creation at Extreme Rules, the Ambrose Asylum match. The two foes did battle in a steel cage full of weapons, and if you think that sounds awesome, stop thinking that, because it wasn't. It took far too long for somebody to climb the cage, which slowed the match to a snail's pace. Also, the weapons available to each man were hardly the most threatening. A fire extinguisher? A mop? Mitch? Give me a break. Despite a grisly thumbtack spot during the finish, which was excellent, the Asylum match was unfortunately a flop. Both men moved on from it very quickly afterwards, and the concept was retired immediately, never to be heard of again. Number 1. Roman Reigns vs Triple H at WrestleMania 32 After Triple H took his WWE Championship at the Royal Rumble, Roman Reigns earned his rematch to close out the show of shows. Fans were sick to death of Reigns being shoved down their throats and were desperate for him to not dethrone the King of Kings. However, 2016 WWE did not care about what its fans wanted, and instead booked Reigns to beat the game after a 27 minute long snooze fest. Roman hit trips, trips hit Roman, Roman hit trips again, rinse and repeat for almost half an hour, as the boos grew louder and louder. The sole highlight of the match was when Reigns accidentally speared Stephanie McMahon, but that aside, the live audience is completely each rejection of Roman was more entertaining than the bout itself. I'd feel sorry for him, but he's doing alright for himself now, isn't he? Fans booed the inevitable title win to Kingdom Come. Put simply, the match was everything a WrestleMania main event should not be, slow, boring, and ending with the wrong result. For being the rotten cherry on the decaying cake that was WrestleMania 32, there is no doubt in our minds that Roman Reigns vs Triple H was the worst match of 2016. 2015 When it comes to the 2010s, many make the argument that 2015 was the best year for WWE in the entire decade. WrestleMania 31 was a smash hit, John Cena went on a tear with his United States title open challenge, Daniel Bryan returned to the ring, although not for too long sadly. But despite all this good stuff, 2015 also had its fair share of failures. 
Whilst there are some regular old bad matches on this list, a lot of the entries we're about to go through were more disappointing, a victim of bad booking rather than bad wrestling. 2015 seemed to be the year of so close and yet so far in WWE, with matches starting off with all the promise in the world and then ending up falling at the final hurdle, trying to get back up and falling over a different hurdle that wasn't even supposed to be there. Anyway, now that complicated metaphor is out the way, I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 2015. Join us! Number 10, Seth Rollins vs John Cena at SummerSlam As we've seen throughout this series of lists, sometimes all it takes to turn a great match into a terrible one is a really bad finish. United States Champion John Cena was putting his belt on the line against WWE Champion Seth Rollins in a winner-takes-all contest. It was pushed as one of the biggest matches on the card, and the action more than delivered on this promise, until John Stewart turned up. The former host of The Daily Show got into the ring after a ref bump and teased hitting Rollins with a chair. In a twist that nobody saw coming or wanted, Stewart hit Cena instead, allowing Seth to retain. A great match between two top wrestlers was completely ruined by WWE trying to get some mainstream attention. The fact that it was for not one, but two championships was the final insult. Number 9. Big Show vs Ryback at Money in the Bank in a match we will absolutely be getting to later, Ryback won his first and only championship in WWE when he captured the IC title in May 2015. For some reason, WWE thought the best way to hide the big guy's weaknesses in the ring would be to put him in a feud with The Big Show, who probably wasn't the best matchup for him, to be honest. Their bout at Money in the Bank got off to a pretty decent start, with both men hitting their signature power moves straight away, but it soon slowed right back down to a much more lethargic pace. Ryback even attempted an armbar, which, well, let's just say he's no Ronda Rousey. Just when it looked like Sho had the match won, The Miz ran in and hit him with a microphone. The A-lister had been getting involved in both men's business in previous weeks and had been attacked by Ryback while on commentary for this match. A DQ finish on a pay-per-view to set up a match at another pay-per-view is always frustrating, but it's even worse when the action that preceded it wasn't even that good. Number 8. Dolph Ziggler vs Sheamus at Extreme Rules the Celtic Warrior made his return from injury the night after WrestleMania 31 with a new attitude and a mohawk that could be seen from space. The future leader of the Brawling Brutes set his sights on Dolph Ziggler, and the two were scheduled to face off at Extreme Rules in a Kiss Me Ass match. Not a Kiss My Ass match, a Kiss Me Ass match. Wow. It's a match name that was possibly only created because Vince McMahon thought Sheamus spoke funny. WWE had done plenty of bum-related matches in the Attitude Era, usually as an excuse to push the women's division back a few years or because Rikishi needed a payday. But those times were long gone in 2015, and fans were less than thrilled at the prospect of seeing one wrestler kiss another's backside against his will. The actual match was fine, with Ziggler scoring the win, but then Sheamus beat him up and shoved his ass in his face anyway, so the whole thing was utterly pointless. Good stuff. Number 7, Seth Rollins vs Sting at Night of Champions Steve Borden does not age like normal men if his run in AEW is anything to go by. These days, Sting is consistently pulling off incredible feats and taking bumps that would make some wrestlers half his age wince. All of this is even more amazing when you consider we thought he was done for good after Night of Champions 2015. After unsuccessfully defending the US Championship against John Cena, Seth Rollins then had to put the WWE title on the line on the same night against The Stinger. After some great action, Sting got hit with a buckle bomb from Rollins that legitimately injured his neck. He finished the match, but looked like he was struggling the entire time. He was pinned by Rollins in a roll-up, and if you listen closely, you can actually hear the architect apologizing. Sting's injury put a massive downer on this match, and things got even worse when it was revealed that he was forced to retire because of it. Fortunately, the icon has now made a full recovery, which thankfully takes the edge off this incident ever so slightly, but still, at the time, it was not pretty. 
Number 6. The Ascension vs The New Age Outlaws at the Royal Rumble when Connor and Victor made their WWE main roster debuts by picking on iconic tag teams, fans were concerned that the former NXT tag team champions were just being used as fodder for older stars. That is exactly what happened on the January 19th edition of Raw, when they were completely jobbed out by the NWO, the APA, and the New Age Outlaws. Connor and Victor got their asses handed to them that night, which made it very hard to get invested in their match at the Royal Rumble against Road Dogg and Billy Gunn. The Outlaws were still in decent shape at this point, especially Big Billy, but the match was still a slog. Apart from the opening shtick, nothing about this encounter sparked much excitement, and the Ascension getting the win meant very little. A win over the New Age Outlaws should have been like rocket fuel for the younger duo, but due to a forgettable match and that disastrous segment on Raw, the Ascension's rockets never left the launch pad. Number 5. Eva Marie vs Billy Kay on NXT Eva Marie is good at lots of things. She's good at dyeing her hair, at coming up with excuses to get out of matches, and probably other things too. To be honest, we didn't really see her do much else in her two stints with WWE. In September 2015, Eva was taking on a pre-Iconics Billy Kay in a match that lasted less than four minutes. However, almost miraculously, Eva managed to botch nearly every single move she did in that time. The match is perhaps most famous, or should I say infamous, for Eva forgetting to kick out after being hit with a suplex by Kay. The referee had to visibly slow down his count so that Eva could get her shoulder off the mat in time, and the fans absolutely blasted her with boos as a result of this mistake. To many, this was the perfect example of WWE's looks-over-skill hiring policy that plagued its women's division for so many years. We would like to say that Eva Marie got better after this stinker, but let's move on. Number 4. The Brothers of Destruction vs The Wyatt Family at Survivor Series the entirety of Survivor Series 2015 was marketed around it being 25 years since the debut of The Undertaker. The dead man took center stage on the event's poster and was put into a special match alongside his half-brother Kane as the demonic duo did battle with the Wyatt family. This all came about after Bray and his henchmen kidnapped Taker following his Hell in a Cell match against Brock Lesnar. This led to the Brothers of Destruction teaming up to take on Wyatt and Luke Harper in a tag team match that was, unfortunately, quite an anti-climax. The wrestling was fine and nobody really got anything wrong, but it was just too paint by numbers. For a match that had been so majorly hyped, fans were expecting a bit more from WWE here. Instead, they got a run-of-the-mill tag team match that wouldn't have looked out of place in the middle of Monday Night Raw. Between this and the weird segment they did for his 30th anniversary, WWE really don't know how to celebrate The Undertaker at Survivor Series, do they? Number 3. Goldust vs Stardust at Fastlane The Rhodes brothers have both been through their fair share of nonsense throughout their careers, and this match from Fastlane 2015 really exemplifies that. Performing under their Gold Dust and Stardust monikers, Cody and Dustin had been slowly drifting apart until the former attacked the latter on Raw. This led to what should have been a highly emotional encounter between the two brothers, but what we got instead was an underwhelming contest with a botched ending. The offense in this match never reached the levels it should have. This was literally a blood feud, and the pair should have torn each other apart. Instead, we got a bunch of grandstanding during which the occasional wrestling match broke out. The dodgy finish came when Goldie pinned his brother with a crucifix and Cody kicked out at two. Except he didn't because the bell rang. Except he did because we all saw it. What? This underwhelming finish to an underwhelming match ensured that a Rhodes vs Rhodes feud would never happen again in WWE. But hey, to be honest, these two probably aren't even capable of having a good match together. Isn't that right, AEW? Number 2. The Intercontinental Championship Elimination Chamber at Elimination Chamber Told you we'd get here, because how could we not? Both of the namesake matches at Elimination Chamber 2015 were a bit rough. The Tag Team Chamber match earlier in the night was too cluttered, but that was Steamboat vs Savage compared to this hot mess. 
First of all, exciting rising star Rusev was replaced by Mark Henry before the match even started, big shoes for an aging Henry to fill. Things got worse when he was accidentally released early from his pod. The world's strongest man proceeded to look very confused as the other wrestlers tried to work out a new layout on the fly with about as much subtlety as a shotgun blast. Seriously, you can hear Dolph Ziggler yelling spots at the top of his voice. Unfortunately, the match never recovered, and not even fan favorite Ryback winning the IC title could get fans properly back on its side. It was a bad one, but not the worst. Number one, the Royal Rumble match at the Royal Rumble. They booed The Rock. This match was so bad that people booed The Rock. How does that even happen? At the 2015 Royal Rumble, wrestling fans were still recovering from the disappointment of not seeing Daniel Bryan win the previous year's edition. That night, ironically, ended with fans booing Batista for eliminating Roman Reigns. One year later, and things were very, very different. Not only did Bryan not win the match again, but the Rumble was instead won by the symbol of everything fans had grown to hate about WWE. Reigns was the chosen one, the hand-picked representative of management who would win whether we liked it or not. Seeing him punch his ticket to WrestleMania was too much for many fans who were already sick of Roman being pushed above his station. The live crowd absolutely mutinied against this finish, showering the future tribal chief with a chorus of boos. Not even a surprise appearance from Dwayne could save the day. I mean, just look at his face when he realizes what's going on. Says it all. Not only did WWE set in motion a catastrophic chain of events with this decision, but they also ruined the best match of the year. For a second year in a row, too. Suffering succotash. 2014. 2014 was one of the most pivotal years in recent WWE history. It saw the breakup of The Shield, the launch of the WWE Network, and the small matter of WrestleMania 30, which saw Daniel Bryan finally take his place as the company's top star. Oh, and something to do with some bloke called The Undertaker? Can't remember what all that was about. Not all of these changes were good, though. Brock Lesnar sees the world title in his iron grip, holding it hostage for months at a time. The women's division was in a truly dire state, and don't even get me started on those 20 minute long authority promos. So once again, we are here to break down some of the worst in-ring outings of the year, ranging from the badly booked, to the woefully worked, to the downright disappointing. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 2014. Join us. Number 10, Brock Lesnar vs. The Undertaker at WrestleMania 30. The Undertaker's streak was one of the most important wrestling traditions of all time. Starting way back in 1991, the dead man went unbeaten at WrestleMania for 23 years, dispatching a who's who of legendary opponents. Some of these matches were fantastic, and some were against Giant Gonzalez. The streak came to an end at the hands of Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania 30 in a moment that stunned the crowd into silence. It was unquestionably one of the biggest match outcomes in wrestling history. It's just a shame that the bout that preceded it was utter turd. Taker got conked on the head early on, which severely inhibited his ability to walk, let alone wrestle a good match. It was a slow and clunky affair that only got interesting after the final bell had rung. Whilst fans would have loved the streak to end after an all-time classic, the reality was very different. It's hard to rank this match any higher than number 10 due to its historic nature, I guess, but man, did this one stink. Number 9, Eva Marie vs Summer Rae on Raw. The Bella Twins might have picked up the Wrestling Observer's Award for Worst Feud of 2014, but a close contender was definitely the Fandango, Summer Rae, and Layla love triangle. Summer Rae had debuted as Fandango's dance partner earlier in the year, but was betrayed by the future fashion cop when he picked Layla over her. This led to a series of matches between the two, none of which were particularly thrilling. The worst of them all was actually a match that Layla wasn't even in. Summer Rae faced Eva Marie on a May episode of 
of Raw, and the match's offense consisted mostly of shoving, hair pulling, and everyone at home contemplating their life choices. Summer looked like she was about to win when Layla and Dango appeared at the top of the stage and started kissing. This distracted Summer long enough for Eva to roll her up and finish the match. It was too short to do any real damage, clocking in at just over two minutes, but this contest perfectly showed the state of WWE's women's division at the time. Number 8, Titus O'Neil vs Darren Young at Elimination Chamber Elimination Chamber 2014 has the honor of being the final WWE pay-per-view before the introduction of the network. It also hosted a match between Titus O'Neil and Darren Young, which turned out to be less of an honor and more of a curse. O'Neil had recently turned on his fellow primetime player because he was dead weight and holding him back. That would explain why, since ditching Darren, Titus has gone on to become a 10-time WWE champion and a winner of the Royal Rumble King of the and Money in the Bank all on the same night. There was absolutely no heat to this match as the crowd struggled to care about the breakup of a lower card team. It didn't help that neither man was particularly electric in the ring, leaving fans feeling anything but millions of dollars by the time Titus got the win. What an advert for the WWE Network. Number 7. Nikki Bella vs AJ Lee at Survivor Series Nikki Bella began her record-setting 301 days as Divas Champion at Survivor Series 2014 when she beat AJ Lee for the gold. Did this reign begin with an all-time great match? A battle of wits and physicality, the likes of which the world had never seen before. Nope, began with a snog. Shortly after the opening bell, Nikki's sister got up on the apron to distract AJ. Bree then applied a classic Greco-Roman lip lock on Lee, which led to Nikki hitting a forearm smash and a rack attack to win the gold in 33 seconds. This match showed exactly what WWE thought of its women's division at the time. Its top prize had just been won via Kiss and now belonged to a performer who couldn't really wrestle that well or cut promos. The fact that this had happened to one of the better female workers in the company was was the final straw. Number 6. Bray Wyatt vs John Cena at Extreme Rules Snakes and Ladders must be Bray Wyatt's favorite game because he sure played it a lot throughout his WWE career. Just when it looks like he's finally hitting his stride, something happens to stop his momentum and send him right back to the beginning again. The first time this happened was at WrestleMania 30 when he lost a match to John Cena. This should have been Bray's jumping off point, but Cena's unstoppable ability to overcome the odds wasn't quite dead yet. Their feud didn't end there though, as the two faced off again one month later inside a steel cage. Cena dominated Bray in this match, even finding enough strength to fend off Harper and Rowan as they tried to interfere. Bray only won because he summoned a creepy child to block the cage door while singing a haunting song right into John's face. Not only did this match have a really silly ending, but it also made Bray look like a total chump. He needed serious help to beat Cena here, and whilst he technically did get the win, he didn't really look any stronger for it. Don't worry, Bray, the Firefly Funhouse is just six years away. Number 5. Big Show vs Eric Rowan at TLC Tables, Ladders, Chairs and stairs. As wrestling fans, we are always clamoring for WWE to try something new. Except when that something is, give two big blokes some stairs and see what happens. And that is exactly what went down at TLC, or should that be TLCS? That's right, one of the main selling points of the entire show was Big Show vs Eric Rowan in the first ever stairs match. Yay. The gimmick was pretty straightforward. Rowan and Show could hit each other as often as they liked with the various sets of steps littered around ringside. If you expected this to add something new to the match, then congratulations! You are exactly the sort of audience member WWE are looking for. You're also wrong though. Stairs have never been that dangerous in wrestling, unless you're Zach Gowan against Brock Lesnar, and fans just weren't buying this contest as anything remotely threatening. Not surprisingly, after this debacle, WWE have never done another stairs match again. Yet. Number 4. El Torito vs Drew McIntyre on Raw Drew McIntyre had to put up with some serious nonsense during his first run in WWE. A lot of this humiliation took place when he was part of 3MB, the jobber stable that somehow consisted of two future WWE champions. In particular, there was their feud with fellow jobbers deluxe Los Matadores and their mascot El Torito. Dressed head to toe in a bull costume, El Torito is probably most famous for his fantastic WLC match against Hornswoggle, but what you might not know is that he also holds a clean pinfall victory over the Scottish psychopath. 
The two had a match on Raw that was mostly just Drew throwing Torito around like a rag doll. However, the little bull was able to yank McIntyre off the second rope and pin him to claim victory in this bizarre encounter. Not only did Drew lose to a person half his size, but he also did so without even taking a proper wrestling move. Number 3, Naomi vs Cameron on Raw. This match is on here for one reason and one reason only, but before we get to that, let's talk about the Funkadactyl, shall we? Naomi and Cameron were introduced to the WWE Universe as cheerleaders slash backing dancers for Brodus Clay in 2012. The duo rarely competed during the two years they were together, eventually splitting apart. After the Funkadactyls were declared extinct, the pair would face off in a series of matches including this one from a September episode of Monday Night Raw. The action was sloppy, with Cameron looking lost multiple times, but the best moment came when she hit Naomi with a leg drop and tried to pin her. On her front. Cameron was screaming at the referee for not making the count, all while the crowd watched on Naomi lying face down on the mat. I guess she learned absolutely nothing from that Melina vs Alicia Fox match. Number 2, Cameron vs AJ Lee at Elimination Chamber. It's a double whammy for Cameron, or should that be double cammy? Can you tell I'm trying to procrastinate so I don't have to talk about this awful match? Despite it going less than 5 minutes, Cameron managed to mess up several spots in this Divas Championship match against AJ Lee, including a really poor Luthez press. However, she wasn't actually the worst part of this bout. That would be to me a snooker, AJ Lee's bodyguard at the time who must have stolen Harry Potter's invisibility cloak because the referee clearly couldn't see her. She accidentally hit AJ with a super kick and broke up a pinfall to no reaction from the official. AJ finally got DQ'd when Tamina hits Cameron with a clothesline, finally bringing this hot mess to an end. Interestingly, we were close to this match not happening at all, as it was originally meant to be Naomi facing off against Lee, but that was canned after she hurt her eye. What could have been? Number 1, the Royal Rumble match at the Royal Rumble. For the second of these countdowns in a row, we've decided that a traditional high point of WWE's calendar year was actually its worst match. Daniel Bryan played a huge part in both of the disastrous rumbles of 2014 and 2015, but please don't pelt his social media with negative comments. It wasn't actually his fault, plus he'll knee your face off. Whilst D. Bryan was eliminated far too early in 2015, in 2014 he didn't even make it into the match. The American Dragon's popularity was through the roof and everyone wanted him to enter the rumble at number 30, win it and go on to challenge Randy Orton for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship at WrestleMania. WrestleMania. Instead, Rey Mysterio was the final entrant and accidentally got the biggest heat of his career. The fans didn't just turn on Rey, they turned on the Rumble itself as soon it was clear that Brian was not showing up. The boos only got louder when they realised that part-timer Batista was going to win instead. A potentially super exciting Rumble ruined by shoddy booking, but at least we have this match to thank for Brian's eventual rise to the top at WrestleMania. And that is the only nice thing we'll ever say about it. 2013 WWE in 2013 was dominated by the story of one man. He debuted for the company as part of NXT, won a major title in a triple threat match, and is famous for sporting a very dashing beard. That's right, 2013 was the year of Curtis Axel. After beating The Miz and Wade Barrett for the Intercontinental Championship, Axel went on to, wait a second, Daniel who? Oh yeah, that guy. Daniel Bryan's fairy tale rise to the top got properly underway in 2013 when Randy Orton cashed in on the American Dragon at SummerSlam. Fans were disappointed that night when their hero lost his championship mere minutes after he won it, but at least that wasn't the only thing they were disappointed by in 2013. WWE was still in a weird halfway house this year, slowly moving away from the cartoonish awfulness of the early 2010s, but with enough of that left over to produce some total stinkers across the year. So get your nose pegs ready because we're about to sniff them out. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 2013. Join us.
Number 10, John Cena vs. The Rock at WrestleMania 29. WrestleMania 29 was not a great show. Sure, it had CM Punk vs. The Undertaker, but it also had Alberto Del Rio vs. Jack Swagger and a P. Diddy concert. Come at me, Diddy heads. Perhaps the most underwhelming match of the night, though, was the main event, a once-in-a-generation clash between The Rock and John Cena. But wait, hang on, didn't those two have a once-in-a-generation clash the year before, or did WWE WWE lie to us. They wouldn't, would they? Unfortunately, the marketing for WrestleMania 28 turned out to be a giant pork pie. The entire show was sold around the idea of Cena vs. Rock being once in a lifetime, but it turns out that the lifetime the company meant was that of a mayfly. Hardly anybody had the desire to see these two wrestle again, especially not for the WWE title, and especially not in the main event of WrestleMania. This match was basically just a less good version of the 28 one, ending in predictably boring fashion when Cena pinned Rocky to win the belt in a rather forced torch passing moment. You can see why CM Punk had so much to complain about. At least nobody bit Cena backstage though. That we know of. Number 9. Eva Marie, Jojo and Natalia vs Oksana, Alicia Fox and Rosa Mendez on Raw. Jojo Offerman served as NXT's ring announcer in 2015 and then Raw's ring announcer from 2016 to 2018. Talk about a downgrade. But did you know she used to be a wrestler too? Well, she did, and she made her debut in this match right here. Although I don't actually really know what she did in it. This very short, very inconsequential six-woman tag from Raw featured some of the least polished women's wrestlers the company has ever had. They put on what would have been considered a fine match for the time, but watching it now is torturous in spite of its brevity. Basically, nothing exciting happens at all, with the finish of Natty tapping out Foxy, serving as an alarm clock to wake up everyone watching. What's more, the new stars in this match, Eva Marie and Jojo, barely do anything. I don't even know if Jojo actually got tagged in, and I don't really care. The epitome of the piss break concept that dogged women's wrestling in WWE for years, this match would have probably just about escaped this list if it wasn't for Jojo's baffling involvement. Or lack thereof. Number 8, Mark Henry vs Damian Sandow on Raw. Damien Sandow had a rough old time in 2013, and we will get to the main reason for that in just a little bit. As the year was coming to a close, I bet he was really looking forward to it all being over so that he could go home to his mansion, pour himself a nice glass of whiskey, and do whatever it is that smart people do at Christmas. I assume play Trivial Pursuit or something. Instead, though, on the December 23rd, 2013 episode of Raw, WWE had him dress up like Father Christmas and get obliterated by Mark Henry. Bar humbug. In what was dubbed the Battle for Christmas, Sandow played the part of Bad Santa, presumably because Billy Bob Thornton wasn't available. Henry was in the role of Good Santa, and if he lost this match, then Christmas would be cancelled for everyone. Except it wouldn't be because it's just a wrestling match. I'm pretty sure that Vince McMahon didn't actually have the authority to cancel Christmas. Pretty sure. Not fully sure, mind. He might have tried, you know. The match was a bog standard comedy weapons match, you know the sort, that saw Sandow get battered like a cod. In the end, Henry blasted Sandow with a fire extinguisher to end this pointless encounter and put the intellectual saviour of the masses out of his misery. Number 7, Tensai vs Titus O'Neil on Main Event. Did you guys know that Main Event is still a thing? You can watch it on the WWE Network, they actually still make it, I promise. Pretty unbelievable, right? Because it's been completely pointless as far back as the 30th of January 2013. That is of course the date that the show was closed out by a mouth-watering clash between Titus O'Neil and Lord Tensai. Mouth-watering in the sense that you've fallen asleep and you're dribbling everywhere. For 13 hideous minutes, the two big men hit each other, then moved around, then hit each other again, then maybe they would tease an actual power move or a proper spot before hitting each other once more. It just dragged on and on and on, and not even a run-in from Brodus Clay and the Funkadactyls could make it interesting. I say that like having Cameron or Tyrus present has ever made anything more interesting. Interesting. Fortunately, this match was ultimately harmless because only about three people ever watched main events. Still, it was taped before SmackDown in those days, so pity the poor souls who had to sit through this painfully boring blunder in order to get to the blue show. Number 6. Total Divas vs True Divas at Survivor Series Total Divas was a reality show following the lives of WWE's female performers that aired from 2013 to 2019. Highlights of the show include Paige 
pretending to feed Natalia hash brownies, Natalia learning to climb a ladder, and Natalia peeing herself during a match. Honestly, Natty, what did we do to deserve you? And the Anvil's daughter was one of the names involved in this match from Survivor Series. Actually, calling it a match is perhaps a bit much. It was more of an advert as its sole purpose was to promote Total Divas. The teams consisted of women who were on the show and women who weren't, with the perpetual anti-diva AJ Lee leading the true Divas team. And what did AJ get for standing up against trashy reality TV? Why, she got submitted by Natalia, of course. No word on what the state of Natty's bladder was during this sequence. It was just a nothing match with eliminations happening way too easily and quickly to care. Whilst it probably didn't deserve the Wrestling Observer Newsletter's Worst Worked Match of the Year award, it was still pretty naff. Hopefully it persuaded some people to watch Total Divas, otherwise this whole thing would have been a giant waste of time. Actually, it was a waste of time anyway, obviously. Number 5. Fandango and Summer Rae versus The Great Carly and Natalia at Hell in a Cell Sticking with Natalia now, and a match that she was probably the best part of. Although when you look at those involved, you'll realise that she really wasn't up against much. No offence, Dango. During a bout between sexy ballroom dancer Fandango and sexy lumbering tree man, The Great Carly, Natalia got into a fight with Dango's valet slash dance partner, Summer Rae. This led to a mixed tag team match at Hell in a Cell, with Summer making her main roster in ring debut. And boy, could you tell. Summer just struggled to click in this match, taking a very long time to connect with any of her moves, often looking lost and confused. Natalia did her best to work with her, but there was really only so much she could do. As for Carly, well, he could barely walk without falling over, let alone have a decent match. Honestly, it would have probably been better if WWE just let Dango wrestle Natty. We did get a glimpse of that when she went to put the sharpshooter on him, but sadly, the rest of the match was unentertaining, clumsy dross. Oh, and Hornswoggle was at ringside for some reason. Always makes everything better, Hornswoggle. Number 4, Mark Henry vs Ryback at WrestleMania 29 A match sold on the idea of two monsters going head to head, this encounter from WrestleMania ironically ended up being a monstrosity itself. In a tale as old as wrestling time, two of the biggest men WWE had on the roster, the big guy Ryback and the world's strongest man Mark Henry, were put in the ring with each other like two giant bulls ready to fight it out to the death. Unfortunately, the only thing that died during this match was the audience's interest. Henry took 90% of the match, utilising offence that would have been deemed passe in 1981. We're talking clotheslines, body slams, bear hugs. A bear hug in 2013 at WrestleMania? Come on, Mark, you're better than this. The sole highlight of the match came when Ryback picked Henry up for the shell shocked, which genuinely got a huge pop from the crowd. This didn't last, though, as Henry just flopped down on top of his opponent and pinned him for the win. Great. Here was a young guy who six months previously had been in the WWE Championship picture, losing to a man who had been in the company since the mid-90s. This was just a bad showing all round, and the perfect example of the worst kind of big man wrestling. Number 3, John Cena vs Damian Sandow on Raw Remember Damian Sandow dressing up as Santa Claus from earlier in this list? Well, this match is the reason that that happened. At Money in the Bank, Sandow won the SmackDown briefcase, meaning that he was entitled to a World Heavyweight Championship match at any time of his choosing. That time came on the October 28, 2013 edition of Raw, when he chose to strike a prone John Cena. After teasing a cash-in, Sandow attacked the already injured arm of the champion, smashing it multiple times with his briefcase and driving him shoulder-first into the ring post. He then cashed in for realsies and the title match was on! Sandow hit the champ with everything, including his finisher. However, as he is one to do, Super Cena powered through the pain and put Damien down with a single AA. Sandow never recovered from this, coming nowhere close to the main event ever again. In one fell swoop, Sandow went from being a fantastic heel with serious upper mid-card potential to an undercard joke with one of the least appealing records in wrestling history. Number 2. Bray Wyatt vs Kane at Summer Slam. We are going back to where it all began for the enigma that is Bray Wyatt. Well, unless you count his Husky Harris days, which we don't. In July of 2013, the Wyatt family made their main roster debut with a vicious attack on Kane. Wyatt, Harper and Rowan continued to assault the Big Red Machine over the following weeks until the future mayor of Knox County decided that enough was enough and a match was made for SummerSlam. 
It was a Ring of Fire match, which is like an Inferno match, except you don't actually have to set your opponent on fire to win. You know, the part that actually makes the match exciting. In this version of the gimmick, Wyatt and Kane plodded around a ring surrounded by flames for eight agonizing minutes. Neither man could leave the ring, nor could they make use of the apron or ropes, which severely limited what they could actually do. Bray won in the end, which was the right call considering this was his first match, but it was hardly the shining showcase that fans wanted from the character. Thankfully, this was the last time Bray would have a stupid match involving flames. Isn't that right, 2020 Randy Orton? Number 1. Randy Orton versus The Big Show at Survivor Series Big Show in a world title main event in 2013. Yep, this really happened. Basically, WWE management saw that Daniel Bryan was getting over with the whole yes thing, but they didn't want to push Bryan because he wasn't their idea of a top star. So they decided to take the yes chant and transplant it onto someone else. What could possibly go wrong? Paul White was thrust into the title picture as the company appointed Man of the People, pretending to ignore the sea of Daniel Bryan chants as he waged war against the authority. This all led to this title match with Orton, which lasted a whopping 11 minutes and only featured about 11 different wrestling moves. No one believed that Show was actually going to win this match, and thankfully they were right. The match was predictable, sloppy, lazy, and came off the back of a frankly insulting storyline, whilst the real fan favourite was nowhere to be seen. This bout was just awful on every level, and when you're as tall as the big show, that's a lot of levels. 2012 According to the Mayan calendar, 2012 was supposed to be the year the world ended. As you can probably tell, it didn't, but perhaps some wrestling fans were wishing it would after sitting through these awful WWE matches. 2012 wasn't all bad, of course. CM Punk was WWE champion for the entire calendar year, which led to some really great moments and matches. The Shield debuted at Survivor Series, which would have huge ramifications over the next decade, and The Undertaker and Triple H put on a sensational Hell in a Cell match at WrestleMania, which was definitely the last time they or Shawn Michaels were ever involved in a match together. Ever. Don't Google that. But we're not here to talk about any of the fun stuff. Instead, we are here for the matches that made our toes curl, our stomachs turn, and our brains question why we even started watching wrestling in the first place. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 2012. Join us. Number 10, John Cena versus Brock Lesnar at Extreme Rules. Brock Lesnar gave the wrestling world one of its biggest moments in 2012 when he made his return to WWE after eight years away. After winning the UFC Heavyweight Championship and doing a bit less well in the NFL, the Beast made a thunderous return to wrestling when he confronted John Cena on the Raw after WrestleMania. This set the stage for a matchup of epic proportions, Lesnar versus Cena at Extreme Rules with no disqualifications. Lesnar had to win, right? He was a guy with legitimate fighting experience in his first WWE match for nearly a decade against the guy who had just lost to The Rock in the main event of WrestleMania. Surely this was going to be a slam dunk. Unfortunately, though, WWE didn't just miss the hoop, they managed to burst the ball and burn the stadium down all in one go. Cena beats Lesnar in a baffling booking decision that cut off Brock's momentum just weeks into his return run. The action leading up to this moment was fantastic, which is why the match is so low on this list, but the ending of the bout was utterly unforgivable. Number 9. Ryback vs Tensai on Raw Formerly Skip Sheffield of the Nexus fame, Ryback re-debuted for WWE in April 2012 and was pushed to the moon. Hmm, the guy with really big muscles got a monster push despite still being as green as grass. Doesn't sound like WWE at all. The big guy was given the Goldberg treatment, an undefeated streak with lots of short matches where he could show off what he was good at and hide what he was bad at. Much like Goldberg, Ryback's streak ended in dumb fashion too, but we will get to that later. On the October 1st edition of Raw, Mr. Feed Me More devoured Tensai in under two minutes, but still managed to make two two quite noticeable mistakes. When he tried to hit the former Albert with his finishing move, Ryback visibly struggled to get the big man 
man up. He tried to get him up on his shoulders a second time, only to drop him flat on his ass before hastily winning with a clothesline. It was a sloppy finish to an already pointless match, and it added more weight to the argument that Ryback was not yet ready for the main event. Number 8. Team Johnny vs Team Teddy at WrestleMania 28 WWE had some pretty questionable feuds going on in 2012. John Cena vs Kane, Alberto Del Rio vs Sheamus, Natalya vs her own farts. Yes, that is a storyline that really happened. But perhaps the worst rivalry to take place that year was John Laurinaitis vs Teddy Long for control of both Raw and SmackDown. Both brands' general managers clashed for months as fans grew less and less interested with each passing second. Also, Raw and SmackDown were so similar at this point that it's difficult to work out why fans would care who was running the shows in kayfabe. This pointless storyline came to a head with a six-on-six -six tag team match at WrestleMania, where each GM's chosen champions would fight to decide which authority figure was the best. As the fans didn't give a toss about the outcome, there was absolutely no heat behind this match. The fact that it ended with The Miz pinning fan favourite Zack Ryder to give heel Laurinaitis the victory somehow made this pointless exhibition even worse. Oh, and then Eve Torres kicked Zack in the balls. That's what you get for getting yourself over online, kid. Number 7. Eve Torres vs Naomi at TLC The pre-show of TLC 2012 featured JTG vs David Otani hunger and a Santa's little helper battle royal to determine the number one contender to the Divas Championship. I'm sure pay-per-view buys skyrocketed after those all-time classics. The battle royal, which narrowly misses out on a place here, was won by Naomi, who punched her ticket to face Eve Torres later that night. Hopefully she kept the receipt for said ticket, because her journey was a waste of time. Whilst she's very good in the ring these days, Naomi was just a few months into her WWE career proper and at this point. This match showed that as she looked extremely unsure of herself throughout. As for Eve, she's never exactly been a ring general, and the swinging neck breaker that she used to win the match had about as much force behind it as an autumn leaf falling pleasantly to the ground. A poor showing from a time when women's wrestling was in a real bad way. Number 6. Sheamus vs Daniel Bryan at WrestleMania 28 Hindsight makes it really hard to know where to place this match. For many, Daniel Bryan losing the World Heavyweight Championship to Sheamus in just 18 seconds was the starting point of the Yes Movement. The change in attitude Bryan went through after this humiliation was what eventually led him to form Team Hell No, which raised his profile even higher. Then came the SummerSlam match with Cena, Orton's cash-in, WrestleMania 30, you know the rest. However, at the time, this match got fans absolutely fuming. After Sheamus won the Royal Rumble and chose Bryan as his opponent, the match had a good chance of being a great one, two talented workers tearing it up on the biggest stage possible. Instead, Bryan was distracted by a kiss from AJ Lee before eating a brogue kick and then an immediate pin. Bryan was completely embarrassed, Sheamus' Rumble win felt massively undermined, and the fans were furious that this was the outcome of so much hype. It might have worked out well in the end, but this could have been a massive disaster. Number 5. Santino Morella vs Ricardo Rodriguez and No Way Out God bless Santino Morella. He might be a little goofy, but he always puts 100% into every single stupid scenario WWE shoved him into. That being said, even he couldn't make this work. And no way out, the Milan Miracle went up against Ricardo Rodriguez. Whilst Ricardo did have some wrestling experience, Santino was facing a man most famous for being a ring announcer. And that says pretty much all you need to know about this match, if you even want to call it that. Aside from a brief sequence, there is very little actual wrestling here. Instead, it is two grown men trying to rip incredibly cheap looking tuxedos off each other until one of them is left standing in his pants. And while we can certainly all agree that it's a unique stipulation, that still doesn't make for a great wrestling match. Unlucky, guys. Number 4. Cody Rhodes vs Big Show at Extreme Rules 
I guess it's a bit of a shame that Cody and Paul White didn't rerun this program when they were both in AEW, as they could have put right one of the worst WWE finishes of recent years. After an age of being humiliated at WrestleMania, Big Show finally got his big moment at the Showcase of the Immortals when he beat Cody Rhodes for the IC title. The Giant must have been running about 30 days slow at the time, because he actually managed to embarrass himself at Extreme Rules instead of at Mania. Big Show absolutely dominated the American Nightmare during their rematch, throwing him around like a rag doll. But unfortunately for the big man, this was a tables match, and all Cody needed was one lucky shot. He got that shot when he drop kicked Show off the apron. The champion stepped backwards, unaware that a table was right behind him, putting his foot through it and losing the match. So, just to wrap that all up, Big Show, whose whole story at the time was that he was finally being taken seriously after all these years, lost a championship because he accidentally stepped through a table. Just look at that face. He knows he's messed up. Number 3. CM Punk vs Ryback at Hell in a Cell Remember when we mentioned the rubbish ending of Ryback's undefeated streak earlier? Well, here it is. Ryback's run of dominance earned him a shot at CM Punk's WWE Championship inside Hell in a Cell. That meant the champ would have no help from his manager Paul Heyman, which stacked the odds firmly against him. In one of the shortest cell matches of all time, Ryback was about to win when the referee of all people hit him right in his big guys. He then fast counted the pin, giving Punk the victory. It was later revealed that the referee, former WWE wrestler Brad Maddox, had been paid off by Heyman to ensure Punk's victory. Whilst this sort of explained Brad's actions, the damage done to Ryback was irreversible. Having his undefeated streak end in such a lame way killed all his momentum stone dead and he would never taste main event success again. Considering their options were either to have Punk lose the title or Ryback lose his streak, it's a bit of a wonder that WWE even booked this match in the first place. Number 2. John Cena vs Michael Cole on Raw Do I really need to explain why this match was bad? Just listen to that title again. John Cena vs Michael Cole This was Cena at his most sceneriest and Cole at his unbearable heel worst in an actual sanctioned match on Monday Night Raw. In another instance of two grown men ripping off each other's clothes, Cena stripped Cole down to his undies, embarrassing the former war correspondent in front of millions. He then proceeded to cover Cole with barbecue sauce, blast him with a fire extinguisher, and win the match. Honestly, we're not sure if it would have been better or worse if Cole actually pinned Cena after Tensai ran interference. The character of heel Michael Cole was annoying, but Michael Cole the person and didn't deserve this, and nor did us fans. Number 1. John Laurinaitis vs John Cena at Over the Limit Imagine John Laurinaitis vs John Cena, then put it on pay-per-view, and then have the non-wrestler win. Does that sound suitably horrible? Good, because it was. After Johnny Ace had been butting heads with Cena for about a year or so, it was finally decided that the two Johns should meet face to face in the ring with the stipulation that, if he lost, John Laurinaitis was fired. Now, we've all since accepted that John Cena is a great wrestler, but he's not the sort of elite level talent that can drag a great match out of absolutely anyone. He can have an amazing bout with a great opponent, but 50 year old John Laurinaitis was not a great opponent. In fact, the last time he had been a regular in-ring competitor was 12 years prior. So for 17 agonizing minutes, Cena beat the ever-loving snot out of his boss before Big Show arrived, turned heel for the 465th time in his career, and cost Cena the match. Not only was the match itself long and tedious, not only was the final angle utterly nonsensical, not only does John bloody Laurinaitis have more pinfall wins over John Cena than Miro does, but it also main evented over the limit ahead of Daniel Bryan versus CM Punk for the WWE Championship. 2012 folks, what a year it was. 2011
There's an old saying in the world of football, or soccer for our incorrect American viewers, it's a game of two halves. And whilst that's true in the most literal of senses, it was also extremely accurate for WWE in the year 2011, which could be split into two distinctive eras. Anything before CM Punk's first pipe bomb on the 27th June episode of Monday Night Raw was pretty much utter tripe, WWE at its Cena-loving PG worst. Anything after that felt like it had a renewed sense of vigor, a feeling that anything could and would happen with this loose cannon at the top of the card. One thing remained constant across the entire year, however, and that was WWE putting on some absolutely shocking matches. Let's take a look at some, shall we? I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 2011. Join us. Number 10, the Royal Rumble match at the Royal Rumble. Co-founder of the Beach Boys, Mike Love, had a philosophy when it came to music. Don't F with the formula. Unfortunately, Mike Love wasn't booking WWE in 2011. If he was, then this whole mess might have been avoided. Save us, Mike Love. That year's edition of Royal Rumble was headlined by the traditional over-the-top battle royal, but this match was unlike any that had gone before it. An extra 10 participants were included, bumping the usual 30 entrants up to 40. More wrestlers means more fun, right? No. Maybe the extra manpower would have worked if WWE had more recognizable stars on its roster at the time. Instead, the Rumble was filled out with undercard names like Yoshi Tatsu, Mason Ryan, and Ezekiel Jackson. Even the surprise returns failed to excite, with legends Booker T and Diesel getting less than four in-ring minutes between them. The end result of this experiment was quite a slog that ended with Alberto Del Rio punching his ticket to WrestleMania. Nice try, WWE. WWE, but you should have listened to Mike. Number 9, Big Show, Kane, Kofi Kingston, and Santino Morella versus The Core at WrestleMania 27. Now we move to the biggest show of 2011, WrestleMania 27. And yes, we will be back here a few more times. Money in the Bank had been moved off Mania by this point, and the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal was still three years away, so WWE needed a new trick to get as many mid-carders on the show as possible. Their answer was this, a total totally pointless eight-man tag match pitting four assorted babyfaces against Nexus offshoot The Core. The story leading into this match was, well, there wasn't one really. The Core had just beaten up Big Show on SmackDown, and Kofi was a last-minute replacement for Vladimir Kozlov. That is all you need to know. The match itself lasted a whopping 92 seconds, which was just enough time for all the good guys to hit their finishers on the Core before Big Show pinned Heath Slater. What did this match add to WrestleMania? Nothing, and that is why we are not wasting any more of our precious time talking about it. Next! Number 8, The Divas Mistletoe on a Pole Match on SmackDown. SmackDown. Whilst less common than six or seven years prior, 2011 still sadly had a few matches that were designed to, in the words of maximum male models, titillate the juices of our guilty pleasures. A major example of this was a Christmas cringe fest from the December 2nd, 2011 edition of SmackDown. The Bella Twins, AJ Lee, Oxana, Tamina, Alicia Fox, Rosa Mendez, Natalia, and a Caitlyn in a pear tree, all dressed up in various holiday-themed outfits for this match, put together by Mick Foley, who was dressed as Santa Claus. Because of course he was. Foley said that the winner of the match, in which the objective was to retrieve a piece of mistletoe from the top of a pole, would receive a very special prize. 51 whole seconds later, and Brie Bella was the one entitled to said prize. Was her title match the opportunity to compete at WrestleMania? Tickets to one of Mick's stand-up gigs? Nope, it was the opportunity to kiss any superstar of Brie's choosing between now now and Christmas. If the costumes, the runtime, and the stakes of this match don't prove how dire WWE's women's division was at this time, then nothing will. Number 7, Kelly Kelly vs Brie Bella at Money in the Bank Money in the Bank 2011, what a show. Not only were the two ladder matches excellent, not only did Big Show and Mark Henry go to war, not only did Randy Orton and Christian put on a barn burner, but there was also that main event between CM Punk and John Cena. 
The one match from this card that is not fondly remembered though is the Divas Championship clash between Kelly Kelly and Brie Bella. K-Squared had recently beaten Brie for the gold on Raw, and their rematch went down in front of a rabid Chicago crowd. Unfortunately, not even they could bring life to this dull affair. Kelly Kelly was never a great wrestler, and she proved it in this match. The head scissors, in inverted commas, she hits on Brie in the opening 30 seconds looked about as realistic as Donald Trump's hair, and her offense didn't get much better throughout the match. Brie and Kelly might have gotten away with this one had it happened on a standard night, but the historic nature of the show means that it's relatively well remembered. Number 6, Sin Cara vs. Sin Cara at Hell in a Cell Known as Mystico in his native Mexico, the original Sin Cara had a lot of hype surrounding him when he debuted for WWE in 2011. Unfortunately, that hype died pretty much as soon as the character botched his first entrance. Things got worse when the Faceless One was handed a 30-day suspension for violating the wellness policy just three months into his run. During his time away, WWE introduced a new version of the character character with a darker persona. And by that, we mean this Sin Cara wore black instead of blue. The two Sin Caras faced off at the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view, and it was… bleh. For a match involving two supposed high flyers, the two men barely did anything exciting at all. It didn't help that the ring was bathed in that weird lighting, making it hard for fans in attendance or watching at home to tell which masked wrestler was which. The whole thing just fell flat, and the imposter storyline was dropped two weeks later when the newest scene Cara was unmasked. What a waste of time. Number 5. Triple H vs Kevin Nash at TLC An alien invasion. Giant killer bumblebees. John Cena pulling a mask off to reveal that he was David Arquette the whole time. These are just some of the twists WWE could have used in the Summer of Punk storyline that would have been better than Kevin Bloody Nash. Big Sexy's 2011 run took many turns, including getting involved in the main event of SummerSlam, attacking Triple H at Vengeance, and finally squaring off against the game in a sledgehammer ladder match at TLC. What's a sledgehammer ladder match, I hear you ask? A bad idea. That's what it is. It's fair to say that 42-year-old Triple H and 52-year-old Kevin Nash did not put on an all-time classic. Instead, the two click buddies spent most of this near 20-minute encounter walking around, hitting each other with plunder, and then walking around some more. It was far too long and had a far too complicated storyline behind it, plus there was the blatant nepotism of Trips giving his good friend a pay-per-view payday. Number 4, The Miz vs John Cena at WrestleMania 27 Poor Miz. It's really something to be the third most important part of your own singles main event at WrestleMania. Shortly before Mania 27, The Rock returned to WWE as the special guest host for the evening. It was clear to many that this appearance was actually to sow the seeds for a future encounter between the Great One and Miz's opponent for Mania, John Cena. With focus squarely on John vs. Dwayne, The Miz, who was WWE Champion at the time, felt completely out of place. What followed was a 15-minute match with zero heat to it and zero excitement generated by either participant. Things got more disappointing when the main event of WrestleMania ended in a double countout. Rocky then made his way down to the ring, restarted started the bout and hit Cena with a rock bottom to allow a concussed Miz to pick up the win. It was bland, it ended with a wet fart, one of the competitors got hurt, and it was all to set up a match in one year's time. There is a reason a lot of people call this the worst WrestleMania main event ever. Number 3. Jerry Lawler vs Michael Cole at Over the Limit if you aren't a fan of the words Michael Cole or Jerry the King Lawler, then put this video on mute, that way we still get the ad revenue, and go and do something else, because you're about to hear them a lot. After months of bickering, fighting, and the bringing up of deceased mothers, Cole and Lawler finally put their feud to bed in a Kiss My Foot match at Over the Limit. Cole tried to weasel out of the encounter by stating that his athlete's foot had become infected, even brandishing a note from his doctor. The referee then ripped the note up and started the match anyway, which in fairness shows blatant disregard for the safety of those involved. 
After three minutes of action, if you can call it that, in which Michael Cole actually got some offense in against Lawler, the King finally pinned his adversary and the crowd rejoiced in watching Cole kiss the feet of the Memphis legend. Number 2. Michael Cole and Jack Swagger vs Jerry Lawler and Jim Ross at Extreme Rules At the pay-per-view before Over the Limit, Cole and Lawler clashed once again, only this time they dragged poor Jack Swagger and Jim Ross into their awful storyline. The beloved Attitude Era commentary duo squared off against the baddies at Extreme Rules in what was being billed as a country whipping match. If you're wondering what a country whipping match is, then don't worry because I am too, and I've seen the match. It's like a fever dream, featuring several surreal sequences, including Lawler spanking the current Jake Hager on his big patriotic bottom. JR gets the coldest hot tag in history, whipping Cole and even putting an ankle lock on Swagger. This utterly bizarre match ends with Cole rolling up the Oklahoma native to end one of the oddest spectacles in wrestling history. Number 1. Michael Cole vs Jerry Lawler at WrestleMania 27 Here it is, folks, the match that starts started it all. Cole was in full heel mode at this point, putting Dominic Mysterio to shame by how hard he was subbing for WWE Champion The Miz. He even cost Lawler a title match, leading to this doomed face-off at the Showcase of the Immortals. If this had been a quick squash match to give Lawler the win and kill off heel Michael Cole, then it would have been fine, I guess. But it wasn't. It was nearly 15 minutes of Lawler selling Cole's offense like he was Minoru Suzuki. Not even Steve Austin as the special guest referee could make this match interesting before it mercifully ended when Lawler made Cole tap out to the ankle lock. But no, wait, it's not over yet. The anonymous Raw general manager then chimed in, reversing the decision due to Austin's antics awarding Cole the victory. For its abhorrent content, its stupid finish, and for giving us two other matches on this list, Michael Cole vs Jerry Lawler at WrestleMania isn't just the worst match of 2011, but it might just be one of the worst WWE matches of all time. 2010 with the start of a brand new decade comes a sense of optimism, hope that the next 10 years will see progress, innovation, and prosperity for all. 2010 offered a lot of good stuff for WWE fans, including the arrival of Daniel Bryan, the return of Edge at the Royal Rumble, and the stellar WrestleMania 26 main event between Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker. Other than that though, we have to be honest, the company got the 2010s off to a horrid start. The women's division was still in dire straits, John Cena was at his most John Cena-y, and the year ended with The Miz as an unconvincing WWE Champion. And that's without mentioning the countless terrible matches we all had to sit through. Oh wait, we are mentioning them? Oh god. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 2010. Join us! Number 10. The Tag Team Gauntlet Match at Extreme Rules by 2010, WWE had been producing pay-per-views for 25 years. You'd have thought that, in all that time, they'd have learnt how to open one of these shows with a decent match. However, as this slog from Extreme Rules 2010 proves, that clearly was not the case. In kayfabe, this bout was thrown together on the night, after tag team champions The Miz and Big Show complained about not having a match. And really, they should have kept their mouths shut, as fans were forced to sit through this utterly pointless gauntlet in which three other teams tried to beat the champs. Those teams were John Morrison and R-Truth, not a real tag team, MVP and Mark Henry, not a real tag team, and the Hart Dynasty, who were a real tag team, thank God. WWE have done some great gauntlet matches over the years, but this was not one of them. It went for less than six minutes and ended when Show turned on Miz to allow the Hart Dynasty to pick up the win. Not the best way to get people pumped up for three hours of wrestling. Number 9. Big Show vs Jack Swagger at Over the Limit One month on from costing his team the win at Extreme Rules, Big Show was challenging Jack Swagger for the World Heavyweight Championship at Over the Limit. Yes, Swagger was world champion in WWE, and yes, I had forgotten that as well. Did this match go any better for the Giant? Short answer, no. 
But the long answer is that Sho fought Swagger in an intensely dull affair that consisted mostly of the challenger knocking the champion around before Jackie Swags ran away to the outside. There was a brief comeback sequence for the All-American American, but this was quickly shut down too. In the end, Swagger decided that enough was enough and clocked Sho out with the belt to cause a DQ in just over five minutes. DQ finishes on pay-per-view aren't always a bad thing, but they need to be used sparingly and effectively. This was neither of those things, simply serving as a way to keep the belt on Jack without having him pin Big Show. Because heaven forbid WWE make him look strong or something, eh? A boring bout with a rubbish ending. This match never even got close to the limit, never mind over it. Number 8. Alicia Fox, Layla, Maurice, Michelle McCool and Vicky Guerrero versus Beth Phoenix, Eve Torres, Gail Kim, Kelly Kelly and Mickey James at WrestleMania 26. Rounding out our trilogy of short pay-per-view matches with rotten finishes is this 10-woman tag team match from the granddaddy of them all. At the 26th edition of WrestleMania, a bunch of face women and a bunch of heel women faced off for, well, they just did, alright? WWE never really gave us any reason why, so it clearly can't have been that important. Because they were only given three minutes, the match is mostly all of the wrestlers hitting their finishers on one another, except for the finish itself, which was something truly special. With the help of every other woman on her team, Vicky Guerrero scaled the top rope to hit a frog splash on Kelly Kelly. Unfortunately, she managed to lift Kelly's shoulders off the mat while pitting her, which meant that a new closing spot had to be improvised on the floor. Lie. This led to Vicky jumping on Kelly a bunch of times before mercifully ending this horror show. Talk about a WrestleMania moment to forget. Number 7. Randy Orton vs Wade Barrett at Bragging Rights the Nexus Invasion storyline dominated most of the summer and early autumn of WWE's 2010. And don't fret, we will be getting to the big Nexus match later on, because how could we not? The group's leader Wade Barrett got a couple of shots at the WWE Championship throughout 2010, but his first one-on-one -on -one match for the gold took place on the Bragging Rights pay-per-view. Not only was the title on the line, but so was John Cena's career. Cena had been roped into helping the Nexus, with Barrett stating that he would be fine if he didn't defeat Orton on this night. Quite how he had the power to do that was unclear. After a very slow and drawn out match, Cena did the most predictable thing possible and hit Barrett with an AA, winning him the match but not the championship. It would have been a shocking ending had everyone and their dog not already seen it coming. Somehow, in a match between Randy Orton and Wade Barrett for the WWE title, John Cena and his career were presented as the two most important things. This was emblematic of WWE's Cena first philosophy at the time, and fans did not take kindly to it. Number 6. Randy Orton vs Sheamus at SummerSlam Remember earlier when we mentioned how disappointed we were at Big Show vs Jack Swagger because it ended in a DQ? Take that disappointment and then apply it to a match that went nearly four times as long, then multiply accordingly. At SummerSlam 2010, Sheamus defended his WWE Championship against Randy Orton. Not only was the title on the line, but if Randy lost, then he would never be allowed to challenge for the title again as long as the Celtic Warrior was champ. Slow and methodical is fine in wrestling, but it usually usually builds to a high-octane, exciting ending. Not the case here. Instead, Sheamus got DQ'd for using a steel chair, an incredibly limp finish to a match that was about as exciting as two hours of ironing. Furthermore, Randy couldn't challenge for the belt ever again. Wait, what's that? He won it the very next month at Night of Champions in another match involving Sheamus? <laughs> oh yeah. Number 5. Big Show vs The Straight Edge Society at SummerSlam the Straight Edge Society was a fantastic idea that WWE, predictably, never fully embraced. CM Punk would brainwash fellow wrestlers into following his Straight Edge lifestyle, taking an ostensibly good thing and completely flipping it on its head. He managed to recruit Luke Gallows, Joey Mercury and Serena Deeb into the stable before its momentum fizzled out toward the end of 2010. A huge part of said fizzling was the baffling decision to have all three male members of the group take on the big show at SummerSlam and lose. The Society had been terrorizing show for weeks leading up to the pay-per-view, including crushing his hand in between the ring steps, so not only was the giant outnumbered, but he was also injured, and he still won! Show pinned Mercury to end the match and the threat of the Society in one fell swoop. How 
could anyone take the team seriously after they had just lost a three-on-one to a man with one hand? The answer? They couldn't. Number 4. Kane vs The Undertaker at Hell in a Cell with the exception of their clash at WrestleMania 14 and maybe their Inferno match at Unforgiven in your house, the Brothers of Destruction have never really been able to translate their epic history and story into great wrestling matches. This Hell in a Cell World Heavyweight Championship bout was no exception. It didn't help that the two behemoths had just fought each other at Night of Champions a month earlier. To be honest, the fans were already over this feud, so the last thing it needed was a plodding, overly long match to close out what was a very boring show overall. Taker and Kane's lack of chemistry was on full display as the two simply couldn't click. Oh, and the finish came about when Paul Bearer got involved to cost the dead man the match. I thought the whole point of the cell was to keep people out. To be fair, probably learned that from Kane himself. What should have been a titanic clash between two monsters played out more like a cheap kaiju movie in slow motion. The fact that Kane and The Undertaker were headlining pay-per-views together in 2010 was just the icing on the cake for many fans. If only they could have known what Taker would be doing 10 years later. Number 3. Maxine vs Caitlyn on NXT the third season of NXT, back when it was a game show, was the first to feature an all-female roster of rookies. Two of the hopeful contestants were future Divas champion Caitlyn and Maxine, who would become Lucha Underground's Katrina. We say hopeful, but what we actually mean is hopeless, as the pair had zero in-ring chemistry together. Caitlyn and Maxine clashed on the October 19th episode of NXT, and, well, it was a disaster. Neither woman could execute a move correctly, leading to awkward spot after awkward awkward spot until Maxine executed maybe the worst roll-up in wrestling history to win the match. It didn't help that Michael Cole was burying the entire thing whilst on commentary, except for when he took a break from the announce table to have a phone call with his mother. We would feel sorry for the women involved, but on the other hand, they were responsible for four minutes of utter despair. Speaking of despair, number two, Team WWE versus Team Nexus at SummerSlam. After all participating in NXT Season 1, Wade Barrett and the Nexus waged war on WWE's main roster. They tore up the ring, beat up top stars, and even choked out ring announcers. Although maybe don't remind Daniel Bryan of that last one. Naughty boy. After months of mayhem, the Nexus got their big main event at SummerSlam, a 7 on 7 elimination match against some of WWE's biggest stars. And our truth. This should have been a slam dunk for WWE, their chance to make the Nexus look incredible by having them face off against proper superstars and stand tall. Instead, John Cena fought back from a two-on-one disadvantage and a DDT on an exposed concrete floor to vanquish Justin Gabriel and Wade Barrett, winning the match for his team. Yeah, this match really got John Cena over. You know, the guy WWE had spent the last five years promoting as the company's top star. This humiliating loss cost the Nexus everything, and they were never seen as a similar threat ever again. Number 1. Bret Hart vs Mr McMahon at WrestleMania 26 after 12 years away from the company in the wake of something that happened in some Canadian city, but we're not sure, nobody's ever really talked about it, Bret the Hitman Hart made his triumphant return to WWE in January 2010. Unfortunately, this history-making moment would soon turn sour. None other than Vince McMahon himself challenged Hart to fight him at WrestleMania, a match that would bring the long, twisted saga of the screw job full circle. We mentioned slam dunks earlier, and when it comes to slam dunks, this should have been the slam Slammiest, dunkiest one of all. All they needed to do was have Brett beat Vince in quick fashion to finally get his revenge on the man who wronged him all those years ago. Instead, we got an overly complicated storyline involving double crosses, bribes, and fake broken legs, all leading to Brett and his entire family beating the stuffing out of Vince for an agonizing amount of time. This actually came off as a group of people ganging up on an old man, rather than a returning hero getting his vengeance. WWE completely dropped the ball with this one, turning what should have been an easy win into one of the worst WrestleMania matches of all time. 2009 
We did it, folks! We got through the 2010s and have entered a brand new decade in this series. It's the noughties! A decade defined by Blackberry phones, auto-tuned pop music, and some of the worst pairs of jeans you have ever seen in your life. And what's our reward for venturing into the brave new era, or old era, I guess, of professional wrestling? Sloppy matches, infantile storylines, raw guest hosts? Oh. The late noughties were a famously terrible time for WWE. Interest in wrestling was pretty low, as was the quality of what the company were putting out. John Cena dominated the main event scene to the great annoyance of many, and WWE felt more desperate than ever in reaching for that sweet mainstream attention. We had a hefty pile of plop to sift through for this particular list, but we have emerged from it with 10 of the absolute worst wrestling matches WWE put on all year. Nose pegs at the ready, Let's go. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 2009. Join us. Number 10. Mickie James vs Alicia Fox at Hell in a Cell It's no secret that women's wrestling was not treated with a lot of respect in the noughties. Well, certainly not in WWE anyway, but shout out to Gail Kim and Awesome Kong for giving us hope during these dark times. In spite of this, the big dub still had some very talented women on its books in 2009. Beth Phoenix, Natalia, the aforementioned Gail Kim, and the one and only Mickie James. Unfortunately, not even a wrestler of Mickie's quality could drag a good match out of Alicia Northern Lights Suplex Fox at this stage in her career. The two fought for the Divas Championship at the 2009 Hell in a Cell pay-per-view in a match that was as clunky as it was boring. Fox looked totally out of place, unable to keep up with Mickey's offense and quickness in the ring. There were several awkward moments across this five-minute match, which mercifully ended with James scoring the pin. Whilst far from the worst match ever, this encounter is the epitome of WWE WWE's women's division at the time, one very talented wrestler being held back by a performer who just wasn't yet up to scratch. Number 9. Randy Orton vs John Cena at Hell in a Cell Sticking with Hell in a Cell now, and one of the three, yes three, titular matches on the card that night. 2009 was most definitely the year of Orton vs Cena. The XOVW colleagues competed against each other in 14 different televised matches across the year, five of which were on pay-per-view. Somewhere in the middle of those insane numbers was their meeting at Hell in a Cell, which was, well, in one word, dull. It was the longest match on the card at over 21 minutes, an accolade it did nothing to earn. Neither man had a particularly thrilling moveset at the time, throwing bland move after bland move at one another as the crowd slowly mossed over in their seats. At least there was some excitement in the form of a WWE Championship change, but that just meant that the rivalry had to continue. Fans were absolutely sick of these two fighting, and there were still two more months left in the year. As the previous match summed up WWE's women's division, this one perfectly encapsulated the men's. Long, slow, uninspired, and populated by characters that desperately needed new creative direction. Number 8. Triple H vs Randy Orton at WrestleMania 25 WrestleMania 25, insert joke about it not actually being the 25th anniversary of WrestleMania here, played host to what many consider as the best WWE match of all time. Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker blew the roof off the Reliant Stadium in Houston with 30 minutes of unbelievable wrestling. Then came the so-called main event, and oh boy did it fail to keep the momentum going. The Viper challenging the game for the WWE title had some serious storyline weight behind it. Trips had invaded Randy's home not long before Mania as a response to Orton laying out the McMahon family including giving the creepiest kiss of all time to Stephanie. Did this blood feud reflect in the actual match itself? Did it balls? It was hampered right from the start by a stipulation that meant that Triple H would lose the title if he got disqualified. Instead of being a furious battle between two angry titans, the match moved at a glacial pace with almost zero thrills. Wrong step, wrong placement on the card, wrong night. A recipe for disaster. Number 7. Hornswoggle vs. Charlie 
Chavo Guerrero on Raw. To be honest, we could have chosen any of the cursed matches from the worst feud of the year between Chavo Guerrero and Hornswoggle. We're not quite sure how the feud started, and quite frankly, we don't care, because something this abhorrent is not worth wasting precious seconds of our time on Earth on. A boxing match, a Texas bull rope match, a blindfold match, Chavo and Swoggle competed in all of these stipulations and stank each and every one of them up. However, we have decided to go for the one that involves two adult men ripping the clothes off of one another. The pair met in a tuxedo match on the 20th July 2009 episode of Raw. Chavo could barely walk because someone had sewn his suit trouser legs together. Eddie Guerrero's nephew there, ladies and gentlemen. In the end, the former ECW cruiserweight and tag team champion lost to Swoggle and was sent running away in his underwear. This entire storyline, if you even want to call it that, was horrible from start to finish. Between this and Kerwin White, you can see why Chavo has never gone back to WWE since his release in 2011. Number 6. Santina Morella vs Beth Phoenix at Backlash If you are not a fan of the word Santina Morella, then I offer you my sincerest apologies. You're going to be hearing quite a lot of them from this point on. We will get to her origin story in a bit, but all you need to know is that Santina was the sister of Santino Morella. Except she wasn't, obviously. She was just the Milan miracle in drag. Bad drag at that. At Backlash 2009, Santina got herself into quite the pickle when the great Carly announced his intentions to kiss her. After first claiming that she was in love with Jim Ross, which JR took about as well as you would expect, this segment was thankfully interrupted by Beth Phoenix. The Glamazon challenged Santina to a match, but was then bopped on the head by Carly for some reason. This intergender action led to more intergender action as Santina pinned a hapless Beth in three seconds to win. Whilst it might be funny to look back on now, and it's definitely not, Santina was totally unwatchable at the time. The fact that this segment dragged so many talented people and Carly into it, as well as taking valuable pay-per-view time away, makes it as rotten as Morella's wig. Number 5. Kane vs The Great Carly at Breaking Point Another name we should have warned you about is The Great Carly, who will be reappearing on this list again very shortly. His summer feud with Kane was easily one of the worst of two 2009, and it might have gotten the nod as the worst had Swoggle and Chavo not been stripping each other on live TV. The pair's second pay-per-view encounter that year took place at the ill-fated Breaking Point. It was a Singapore cane match, which may well have been a tired pun on the Big Red Machine's name, not quite sure. As for the Singapore part, I genuinely believe that Vince McMahon may have thought Carly was from there. On paper, this sounds like two giant men whacking each other with sticks for five minutes. In reality, well, actually, that's exactly what happened. The pair spent most of the match playing pinata with each other until Kane hit an admittedly impressive chokeslam for the win. Working with Carly was a death sentence for many wrestlers, but smaller guys were able to get something out of him through the sheer mismatch of sizes. As nimble as Kane was for a big boy, there was nothing he could have done to get a better contest out of the Punjabi playboy. Honestly, he would have been better off wrestling one of the Kanes. Number 4. Kane versus The Great Carly Lee at SummerSlam. Told you Carly would be back. Also, I refuse to call him the Great Carly anymore. I've just sat through these two matches. I can assure you there is nothing great about him. Before they were smacking each other with twigs, Kane and Carly had a straight up singles match at the biggest party of the summer. The SummerSlam match had the same basic issues as the Breaking Point one Carly's complete lack of mobility, Carly's lackluster offense, Carly's inability to convey emotion through his body or face. Basically, everything. Carly did was a giant waste of time. SummerSlam is ahead of breaking point here because the match was twice as long and there weren't any weapon spots to distract from the awful in-ring wrestling, if you can call it that. Carly had been on WWE's books for three and a half years at this point and they still hadn't really figured out a way to use him properly. He dragged everyone he ever got in the ring with down and the Big Red Machine was no exception. I mean, Kane might be the devil's favourite demon, but feuding with Carly was the real hell. Number 3. CM Punk vs The Undertaker at Breaking Point After The Undertaker spoiled CM Punk's World Heavyweight Championship win at the end of SummerSlam, the Straight Edge Superstar and the Dead Man were booked to face each other for the title in a submission match at the aforementioned Breaking Point. Two entries on one list. There's a reason WWE never did a Breaking Point show ever again, right? Not only was Punk fighting a much larger opponent, but Taker has famously never lost a match via submission in his entire career. And before you start, that doesn't mean that he had never
never tapped out, but that's a story for another time. So, how did WWE get around this? Well, this pay-per-view took place in Montreal, so why don't you have a guess? The Phenom thought that he had won the match via Hell's Gate, but Teddy Long then came out to remind us that the move was banned. Punk then slapped on the Anaconda Vice, and the bell rang immediately without Taker's hand moving a smidge. This rehashing of the screw job achieved nothing, because Taker just squashed Punk for the title a month later. It was a flat ending to an already terrible show and deprived fans of what could have been a belter of a match. WrestleMania 29, this was not. Number 2, Santina Morella vs Vicky Guerrero and Chavo Guerrero at Extreme Rules. After beating Beth Phoenix at Backlash, Santina Morella faced her toughest opponent yet at Extreme Rules. Untrained wrestler Vicky Guerrero in a hog pen match. And also Chavo was there. Christ 2009, what the hell was going on? For 2 minutes and 43 seconds, Santino in drag rolled around a pit of mud with two members of one of the greatest dynasties in all of wrestling. There is an absurdist joy to be taken from the sight of Vicky Guerrero in a yellow ball gown covered in mud, or Chavo sailing over a wooden fence into an arena full of real, quite terrified pigs, but at the end of the day, this was not a good match. Santino won, not that it matters, pinning Vicky after dumping a bucket full of muck on poor Chavo's head. Thankfully, this was the end of the Santina character as a regular fixture of WWE TV. She had her fun, but she was fired on screen by Donald Trump, as if this storyline couldn't get any weirder. It's quite poetic that the Santina character died as part of this entry, as for our number one spot, we are going back to where the gimmick began. Number one, the Miss WrestleMania Battle Royal at WrestleMania 25. Forget what I said earlier about Mickey versus Alicia, this is the match that perfectly sums up how WWE felt about their women's division in 2009. What was meant to be a celebration of women's wrestling in WWE served as little more than a palate cleanser after a Kid Rock concert. 25 women from across various eras all competed in a battle royal to win the title of Miss WrestleMania. Huge names such as Victoria, Molly Holly and Sunny all made their returns for this match. We thought we would tell you that as WWE made absolutely no effort to tell us watching at home who was in the ring. No entrances, no announcements, just a 11 minutes of the commentators going, oh, I didn't know she was in this thing. And then to top it all off, this celebration of women's wrestling was won by the debuting Santina Morella, a man. From the total lack of interest WWE showed in promoting this match, to its sloppy execution, to the farcical winner, the Women's WrestleMania Battle Royal isn't even ironically good. It is a car crash from top to bottom, and an insulting one at that. 2008. The year of our Lord 2008 was quite the 12 month period. Barack Obama was elected President of the United States, The Dark Knight was released in cinemas, and the world suffered a massive financial crash that we are still recovering from. Good times. Also on the decline was the WWE product, which was still in what many consider to be one of its worst creative periods. John Cena still ran riot at the top, giant immovable monsters were pushed well above their pay grade, and as you're about to see, the women's division was in dire straits. There were some highlights from 2008, don't get me wrong, WrestleMania 24 was a pretty great show with highlights including a stellar Money in the Bank ladder match and Ric Flair's last ever outing, definitely last ever outing. We also got the Undertaker vs Edge feud that culminated inside Hell in a Cell, while Chris Jericho and Shawn Michaels had one of the defining rivalries of the decade. Other than that though, a lot of it was pretty pants, especially these 10 miserable bouts. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 2008. Join us! Number 10, Edge vs Triple H vs Vladimir Kozlov at Survivor Series Under the tried and tested gimmick of being from Russia, Vladimir Kozlov debuted as a monster heel in April 2008. His undefeated streak lasted most of the year, leading to a WWE Championship match with Triple H at Survivor Series. Jeff Hardy was meant to be involved, but in kayfabe was found unconscious at his hotel during the event. This meant the game and Kozlov were left to wrestle the match by themselves, and it was, well, it was laborious. The two men had zero chemistry, and the match mostly consisted of rest holds and Kozlov looking quite angry. 
Fans let management know exactly how they felt about this decision, chanting, we want Hardy and boring at various intervals. Things brightened up a smidge when Edge was announced as Hardy's replacement about 10 minutes into the match. And then Jeff came out anyway and started attacking people with chairs. Unfortunately, this match was as dull as dishwater and Kozlov never got a sniff of the main event again. Number 9. Mark Henry vs Kane vs Big Show at Night of Champions WWE's version of ECW was on its last legs in 2008 and matches like this did not help. A three-way for the brand's title saw defending champion Kane take on Big Show and Mark Henry in a match so meaty it could put a butchers out of business. Unfortunately, at this point in time, Show was about as mobile as the Himalayan mountain range and Henry wasn't exactly in his House of Pain era yet. It was very much up to the Big Red Machine to keep this one interesting, so obviously, WWE decided to have Kane taken out early and leave the other two to hit each other for most of the match. The Giants couldn't carry this match if it had had handles on it, and the crowd lost interest almost as soon as Kane went down. Number 8. Team Phoenix vs Team McCool at Survivor Series Of the 14 pay-per-view events that WWE ran in 2008, only 5 of them had women's singles matches on them. Some featured no women at all, but others resorted to clumping them together into teams and making them fight for no real rhyme or reason. Survivor Series was no exception to this rule, as a team from Raw led by Beth Phoenix battled a team from SmackDown led by Michelle McCool. There were some talented workers in this match, Match, including the two team captains, Mickey James and Natalia. However, it also featured some less heralded in ring workers like Kelly Kelly and Gillian Hall. At least she didn't have her wart at this point. The contest was utterly heatless, a prototype for the pointless Raw vs. SmackDown battles we would see in the 2010s. It also got super sloppy at points as the women tried to cram nine eliminations into a nine and a half minute match. In the end, the Glamazon stood tall for her crew and, well, it's just a shame that nobody really cared. These multi-women matches often felt pretty much identical. We won't say anything more about this one for now because we're moving on to number seven, the 12 woman tag team match at Backlash. The lineup of this encounter from Backlash is almost identical to the one at Survivor Series, except it subbed out Maurice for Layla, Ashley Mazzaro, and Cherry. If you don't remember who Cherry is, don't worry, you won't be the only one. Another let's get all the women on the card and have Jerry Lawler commentate match, this one had less experienced wrestlers and even less time for them to get over. The dozen women in this match had just over 30 seconds each between them to get their spots in and tell a cohesive story. It didn't exactly work. Whilst Beth, Mickey, and Natalia all did well together, most other combinations in this match were about as compatible as electricity and a fish tank. Number 6. The Mini Royal Rumble on Raw WWE's poor treatment of their female performers is matched only by their treatment of little people. It of course takes great dedication to become a wrestler whatever your size or shape, and little people have a long and varied history across the wrestling world. Not that you would know this if you only ever watched WWE, as they were almost always used as the butt of the joke. Hornswoggle had already qualified for the Royal Rumble when his dad, Mr. McMahon, made him compete in what he called a mini Royal Rumble. Rumble. A condensed version of the classic match, the man in the green suit took on mini versions of famous wrestlers including Kane, Mankind and Mr. Kennedy. There was even a gag about how the Kennedy substitute couldn't reach the microphone when it descended from the ceiling. Classy stuff. The unfunny comedy continued with the final entrant in the match, the great Carly. Who didn't see that one coming? The bout ended in a disqualification when Finley ran in and attacked the Giants. At least, I think it ended in a DQ. The whole thing just sort of faded out. Number 5. The Santa's Little Helpers Tag Team Match at Armageddon Armageddon was the final show of the year and took place just a few weeks out from Christmas. Naturally, you guessed it, WWE decided to round up its women and put them on display for all to see. Kelly Kelly, Maria, Michelle McCool and Mickey James took on Gillian Hall, Maurice, Natalia and Victoria in a tag match with a twist. That twist was that all these women were dressed up in sexy Christmas themed outfits, an often overlooked step in the women's revolution this. 
The action in this match is predictably tepid, but what makes it even worse is the commentary. All six men from the broadcast team share the mic for this one, taking it in turns to make lecherous comments and ask each other who their favourites are among the women's roster. They pay absolutely no attention to the in-ring action, which ended in under five minutes after McCall pinned Hall. We've talked about it enough during this list, but it bears repeating just how little respect WWE showed towards its female performers during this time period. And if you can believe it, we're not done with that topic yet. But first, number four, Matt Hardy versus Mark Henry at SummerSlam. Two months after winning the belt in his tour de crap with Big Show and Kane, Mark Henry was set to defend the ECW title against Matt Hardy at SummerSlam. The two had been steadily building to this match over a number of weeks, with many hoping that Matt could help the champion to his best match yet. Spoiler, he didn't. Matt had time to hit a single twist of fate on Henry before his opponent's manager, Tony Atlas, pulled him out of the ring. This led to a DQ, a Henry beatdown, and then a Hardy Boys reunion to pop the crowd. It sounds like straightforward stuff until you remember that this was a big four pay-per-view match and was supposed to be for one of the company's world titles. ECW had been dead in the water for some time, but this match really hammered that point home. The title's prestige had been sacrificed for the sake of a cheap nostalgia pop from the crowd who honestly cared more about Matt and Jeff laying out Henry than the title itself. It may not have been a surprise to anyone following WWE at the time, but looking back at the mistreatment of the ECW title in 2008, it's just sad. Number 3. Beth Phoenix and Melina vs Maria and Ashley at WrestleMania 24 This is our last women's match, we promise. We won't drag Beth Phoenix's name through the mud anymore. The Glamazon teamed with the Queen of Scream Melina to take on Maria and Ashley Mazzaro at WrestleMania 24 in a very special match. It was a oh, Playboy Bunny Mania Lumberjill match. What does that even mean? Well, it meant that fans were forced to sit through five minutes of terrible wrestling immediately after Shawn Michaels retired Ric Flair in one of the most emotional Mania bouts of all time. Unfortunately, as well as the bad premise and worse timing, the action was wasn't especially good either. Basic moves were botched, simple sequences thrown out of whack, and the Lumberjills added precisely zero excitement to the whole damn thing. Once again, not the wrestlers' fault at all. They were let down by so many people above them, but you can see why so many fans were down on women's wrestling when this sort of thing was all that they had to go by. Number 2. Big Show vs The Great Carly at Backlash we thought about giving this spot to Carly's WWE title match with Triple H at SummerSlam, but Trips did a pretty decent job carrying the Punjabi playboy to an okay-ish match. Big Show, however, wasn't so lucky. The two titans faced off at Backlash in yet another of Vince McMahon's naughty dreams come to life. Without being unkind, Carly is not a good wrestler, but he works best when positioned against smaller, more agile opponents who he can throw around. You may have noticed that Big Show is not that opponent. The most impressive part of the contest came when Sho picked Carly up for a big old body slam. That sounds like it should be the finish, right? Well, it wasn't. The finish was a not quite as good choke slam, but at least it meant the match was over. Swings and roundabouts. Number 1. Santino Morella vs The Honky Tonk Man at Cyber Sunday During Santino Morella's intercontinental title reign of 2008, he debuted a fantastic gimmick called the Honkometer. Santino compared his own IC title reign up against that of longest reigning champion ever, the Honky Tonk Man. This was all done to subliminally persuade WWE fans to vote for Honky as Morella's opponent at the viewer-controlled Cyber Sunday. And they did, just about. Roddy Piper nearly won, which would have been hilarious. The vote led to a painfully drawn-out segment between the fake Elvis and the fake Italian. Honky talked some smack, Santino talked some smack, Honky did a little dance, Santino did a little dance. It was all pretty rubbish. Then came the actual match, which ended in 66 seconds after Santino's girlfriend Beth Phoenix tripped the Honky Tonk Man up. All that build-up, all that stalling, all that awful dancing for this? Fans weren't expecting Dynamite Kid vs Tiger Mask, but WWE could have pulled out something more entertaining than this, surely? Why not just have Honky win the belt for a feel-good moment? He's cool, he's cocky, he's bad! And it's not like the belt was being treated with much legitimacy at the time anyway. 2007 
Truth be told, 2007 was probably one of the easiest years we've done so far to find worst matches for. And why is that? Well, dear viewer, because this was the first year that the Great Kali got a main event push. India's least mobile man debuted for the company the year before, but 2007 saw him win the World Heavyweight Championship and then famously hold it upside down, casting a dark shadow over SmackDown in the process. But don't worry, we're not here just just to rag on Carly, there's plenty of other rubbish wrestling that happened in 2007 too. However, it will mostly be Carly. You have been warned. I'm Adam Pachisi from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 2007. Join us. Number 10. The Divas Battle Royal at SummerSlam Thankfully, Carly wasn't anywhere near this 12-woman elimination match at SummerSlam 2007, although he was probably the only thing that could have made this display even worse. Women from across three WWE brands all fought to throw each other over the top rope and earn a shot at Candice Michelle's Women's Championship. Whoops, did I say over the top rope? Well, no, this is the era where women only needed to go through the ropes to be eliminated from battle royals. This contest is full of some of the finest talent the women's division had to offer in the mid-noughties. Gillian Hall, anyone? How about Crystal? Remember Brooke from Extreme Expose? No, of course you don't. Stop lying. Eliminations were as sloppy as they were quick, as the whole thing was won by Beth Phoenix in just over seven of the longest minutes of your life. At least a credible wrestler actually came away with the victory, but watching most of the other performers happily flail about was a stark reminder of the state of women's wrestling in WWE at the time. Number 9. Deuce and Domino vs Jimmy Snooker and Sergeant Slaughter at Vengeance Night of Champions Deuce and Domino will go down in history as… actually, they probably won't go down in history at all. Anyway, a pair of greasers, because WWE always has its finger on the cultural pulse, this duo were WWE Tag Team Champions for over four months. That is longer than Los Guerreros held the same titles across two different reigns, and they weren't cosplaying as Danny Zuko. It didn't exactly help their credibility that one of the T-Birds' few pay-per-view title defenses was against two men with an average age of 61. Jimmy Snooker and Sergeant Slaughter challenged for the titles after Deuce and Domino disrespected fellow legends Rick Martel and Tony Gurria, who were sat at ringside. The Sarge took a few bumps in the match, but as for snooker, he could barely walk. When it came to their offense, it looked about as effective as trying to eat soup with a fork. There is the nice little tidbit that snooker was Deuce's real-life father. However, that's the only nice thing we can think to say about this disaster. Or Superfly, for that matter. Number 8. The Great Carly vs Batista vs Kane at the Great American Bash Here he is, folks, the man of the hour, the guest of honor, the gift that just keeps on giving. Carly is here, and he's dragging two legends down with him. Just two days after winning the World Heavyweight Championship, the big man put the gold on the line against two other big men, Batista and Kane. Fans watched on in horror as two of SmackDown's biggest stars had to sell the slow bumbling offense of the new champion. The best Carly could manage was a pair of choke slams, but the rest of his attacks consisted solely of punches, clotheslines, and looking confused. Things picked up significantly when the two challengers put Carly through the announce table and wrestled each other for a few minutes. But this comparative bliss didn't last long as Carly got himself back in the ring and pinned Kane to retain the gold. This match is actually made worse by the brief one-on-one -on -one section. Fans got a glimpse of what a decent title match could have been only for it to be snuffed out by the return of the walking concrete slab. Not only that, but Carly won, obviously, meaning that his title reign would continue. Oh joy. Number 7. Melina vs. Ashley at WrestleMania 23 Today, we have epic blood rivalries and grand storyline quests for the ladies of WWE. However, back in the day, a WrestleMania women's feud could be started over something as simple as the cover of Playboy. 2005 Diva Search winner 
Gardner, Ashley Mazzaro graced the publication's front page in early 2007, much to the chagrin of women's champion Melina. This led to a Lumberjill match for the title at WrestleMania 23 that was so important that it was nearly cut for time. Gotta give those minutes to Vince McMahon getting his head shaved, I suppose. It feels really wrong to criticize Mazzaro considering that she had a horrible time in the company, but she could not wrestle well despite her best efforts. At the time, Melina was hardly a ring general either, so the match was very clunky and botchy. The Lumberjills barely had any impact on the action and were only there to brawl with each other after Melina got the win in under four minutes. Also, this was the only women's match on the entire card. And hey, if you can believe it, this isn't the most embarrassing thing that happened to Melina on pay-per-view in 2007. Don't worry, we'll get to that. Number six, Finley and Hornswoggle versus The Boogeyman and Lil Boogeyman at No Way Out. He's a worm eating, woo, clock smashing, woo, Booker T scaring, woo, legends contract receiving son of a gun. He is the boogeyman. And he's rubbish, sorry. After lying about his age during the million dollar tough enough, Marty Wright got signed to WWE anyway and debuted as the Boogeyman in 2005. In 2007, Boogie was feuding with Finlay after the Irishman and his helper Hornswoggle ended his undefeated streak. That's right, the Boogeyman had an undefeated streak. Impressive one too. To counteract the little bastard, which is what WWE actually called him at the time, Boogie recruited a little person of his own creatively named the Lil Boogeyman. The pairs faced off at No Way Out in a tag team match. The bits where Finley and Boogeyman wrestle each other are fine, I suppose, but the rest is a bunch of worm-based shenanigans until Finley absolutely wants Lil Boogeyman with a shillelagh for the win. The match just drags and drags and drags, replaying the same tired jokes that weren't even especially funny to begin with. Oh well, at least they only did this match once, eh? Wait a second, they ran it back a few months later, and then Lil Boogeyman got crushed by Mark Henry. I give up. Number 5. The Great Carly vs. Kane at WrestleMania 23 Sometimes one memorable spot is enough to save a match. Sadly, this is not one of those matches. Raw's Carly and SmackDown's Kane battled each other in this interpromotional dream match at WrestleMania, although it was more like one of those dreams you have if you eat too much cheese before bed. The lone highlight of this dismal affair was Kane picking up his enormous opponent and planting him with a body slam. Not only was this an impressive physical feat from the Big Red Machine, but it also mirrored Hulk Hogan slamming Andre the Giant 20 years earlier, although this move didn't nearly have the same effect. Carly recovered quickly from the spot and took Kane down for the win. Aside from the slam, Carly took barely any offense from his opponent, essentially making this a glorified squash match on the grandest stage of them all. Nobody wanted to see Kane get his ass handed to him like this, especially not by somebody who could barely stand up straight, let alone wrestle. That being said, this is Carly's best ever singles match at WrestleMania. Granted, it's his only singles match at WrestleMania, but still. Number 4. Batista vs. The Great Carly at SummerSlam. After failing to win the gold at the Great American Bash, Batista once again stepped up to Carly at the following month's SummerSlam. Only this time, he didn't have Kane to help him. This left the animal fully at the mercy of Carly's god awful attacks, plodding movement, and lackluster pin attempts. The giant could barely get down to the mat with any conviction, let alone make a satisfying cover. And what was the crowd's reward for sitting through this turd sandwich? Did they see their beloved hero finally? conquer his gigantic foe. No, this match ended in a DQ when Carly hit Batista with a chair. Can he hit me with a chair too, so I'd have to watch or think about this match ever again? Not only was this a world championship match on the second biggest show of the year, but it was also the semi-main event. This was the bout that was supposed to get fans amped up for the big finale. Instead, all it did was make people curse the day they first discovered pro wrestling and curse the fact that they were born with functioning eyes. Number 3. Batista vs. The Great Carly at No Mercy 
How do you make one of the worst SummerSlam matches of all time even worse? You shove it in a big bamboo cage, that's how! Batista thankfully ended Carly's world title reign at Unforgiven, although he had to get help from Rey Mysterio to do so. Unfortunately for fans of being happy, their rivalry continued to the following month's No Mercy. To tip the odds in his favour, Carly announced that the match would take place under a certain stipulation, a stipulation that has already appeared in this series and will most likely be appearing again. It is, of course, the Punjabi prison. Big Dave and Big Carl's clashed inside the giant wooden structure that made it almost impossible to see the ring. Actually, this was a blessing in disguise as the action inside said ring was sewage grade poor. Not only did the prison limit what each man could do, but the match also went on for 14 entire minutes. That's way longer than any of Carly's other matches on this list, and boy did it show. The one redeeming feature of this contest was that Carly didn't win. At least we can be thankful for that. Number 2. Candice Michelle vs Melina at One Night Stand Oh Melina, what did you do to deserve this? And Candice Michelle too, and everyone who had to watch this grotesque display from One Night Stand 2007. How did WWE think that they could top the previous two One Night Stand events? The shows that saw the rebirth of ECW and Rob Van Dam finally winning the WWE title Title. That's right, by having two women roll around in pudding for three minutes. The two women thrashed about in the brown stuff to a stunned silence from both the crowd and the commentators. When even Jerry Lawler has nothing to say about a TNA women's match, you know that something's wrong. The closing spot, if you want to call it that, saw Michelle win the title after she forced Melina to tap while attempting to drown her in the pudding. I mean, if I could choose a way to go, that would be right up there. What else do you want me to say about this? It was disgusting, it was humiliating, it was disgraceful, and it simultaneously made me hungry and put me off my dessert. Number 1. Donald Trump vs Rosie O'Donnell on Raw Future President Donald Trump, which is still a weird thing to say, was engaged in a very public, very nasty war of words with actor Rosie O'Donnell over comments the latter had made regarding the former's marital history. Vince McMahon, a real-life friend of the Donald, tried to cash in on the media storm by booking a match between two impersonators on the January 7th, 2007 edition of Raw. From the moment that Vince introduced Rosie as being full of lesbianic rage, fans knew exactly what they were in for. What followed was several minutes of grandstanding, jokes about Rosie's weight, and Donald playing with his hair. You can count on one hand full of tiny fingers the number of actual wrestling moves in this match. It ended when Trump hit Rosie in the face with a fudgy the whale cake and pinned her with a second rope hair butt. A bad match seemingly designed to entertain Vince and Vince alone, this is easily one of the most self-indulgently awful matches in Raw's long history. Watching it makes you want to, I don't know, bite Kenny Omega. Do you get it? Donald was played by a steal. The more you know. 2006 The world of wrestling got 2006 off to a flying start. The following things all happened in January. Sting resurfaced in TNA, Shinsuke Nakamura had a match with Brock Lesnar for the IWGP Heavyweight Championship, and Edge and Lita had a naughty little celebration in the middle of the ring. Guess which company was responsible for that last one, eh? Yes, WWE were clearly starting the year as they meant to continue it. The following 12 months saw some very silly wrestling, some very bad wrestling, and some downright offensive wrestling. But what was the top of the rubbish heap when the book of 2006 was finally written? Well, I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 2006. Join us! Number 10. Team DX vs Team Rated RKO at Survivor Series Buried is a word that gets thrown around a lot in wrestling, often incorrectly. But there is a good argument to be made that Triple H and Shawn Michaels had their shovels out for not one, not two, but five different wrestlers at Survivor Series 2006. Edge and Randy Orton had been a thorn in DX's side for months leading up to the event, where each duo recruited three friends to help them out. HBK and the game had CM Punk and the Hardys on their team whilst rated RKO. Well, to be honest, if I ran down their names, I would be speaking for longer than it took for them all to get eliminated. Yes, Edge and Randy's team lost in a devastating clean sweep. Spare a thought for Mike Knox, who was pinned in about a second after a sweet chin music. A 
HBK then mouthed, who was that? Because yeah, that'll help get the poor guy over. Whilst the action in this match is fine, the blatant abuse of power from DX really sours it and made everyone on the other team look like utter chumps. Number 9. Shelton Benjamin vs Viscera at New Year's Revolution One bad gimmick in a match is bad enough, but two? Lord help us all. Shelton Benjamin was having a tough time toward the tail end of 2005. He was on a huge losing streak and so did what any self-respecting grown-up would do. He called his mum. Mama Benjamin, played by actor Thea Vidal, was a loud-mouthed, overbearing character who put immense pressure on her son to win matches. On the other side of the ring was Viscera in perhaps the worst of all of his gimmicks, a creepy nymphomaniac dubbed the world's largest love machine. In the end, a shot from Mama's purse was enough to give her boy the win, but not before he had suffered the trauma of being humped by his giant opponent. Hooray for wrestling! Number 8. Kurt Angle vs Mark Henry at Royal Rumble It's conventional wrestling wisdom that the Royal Rumble match main events the Royal Rumble pay-per-view. However, there have been a few times where this hasn't been the case. Bret Hart fought The Undertaker for the world title in the main event of the 1996 show, The Rock ended CM Punk's legendary championship reign in 2013, and in 2006, Kurt Angle defended his world heavyweight championship against Mark Henry. Unfortunately, Henry's style didn't mesh well with the Olympians, slowing down Angle to a glacial pace. Kurt pinned his opponent in less than 10 minutes in one of the most disappointing championship matches of the year. The only reason the whole pay-per-view didn't end on a flat note was because The Undertaker returned immediately after this match. And then he broke the ring with his magical powers. Spooky. Number 7. Kane vs Imposter Kane at Vengeance For those who don't know, Luke Gallows used to be a fake Kane in an awful wig. What a time it was. Before he was in the Straight Edge Society, or even under the name Festus, Gallows was part of a storyline that was as confusing as it was ridiculous. After being haunted for weeks by the words May 19th, Kane got the surprise of a lifetime when, on the 29th for some reason, he was confronted by himself. Decked out in the classic Kane attire, mask and all, was Gallows acting as a man pretending to be Kane. Or was he supposed to be the real Kane? Alternate dimension Kane? Oh, who cares? The two demons squared off at the Vengeance pay-per-view and guess what? The fake Kane won! And then, after all that nonsense, actual Kane disposed of imposter Kane the very next night and the entire gimmick was dropped. Thanks for wasting all of our time and money, guys. At least see no evil got some promotion, I guess. Number 6. Crystal Marshall vs Ashley Mazzaro vs Gillian Hall vs Michelle McCool at the Great American Bash Ah, those classic multi-woman matches from the mid-2000s. The Great American Bash 2006 is best known for the several last-minute changes that took place due to several performers testing positive for elevated liver enzymes. One match that wasn't cancelled was this four-way bra and panties encounter. Lucky us. Michelle McCool was far from the performer she would become, meaning that Gillian Hall was somehow arguably the best worker in this match. In the end, Ashley won by removing Crystal's top, which is a really depressing thing to read out loud. She and Gillian were then booked to strip each other down because of course they were. The only way this match could have been worse is if there had been one more competitor and it had been held in January. Wait a second. Number 5. The Bra and Panties Gauntlet Match at New Year's Revolution Because one humiliating alter to misogyny on pay-per-view in 2006 just wasn't enough. Six months before the five-star classic at Great American Bash, Ashley Mazzaro won yet another lingerie-based match at New Year's Revolution. This time, her opponents were Maria, Victoria, Candice Michelle, and Tori Wilson. The match from January gets a higher billing in this list because it was presented in gauntlet fashion, which made it longer, and it featured a completely nonsensical interruption from the fabulous Moolah and Mae Young. The two old-timers teased that they were gonna get naked as Jerry Lawler's genitals shrunk to microscopic size. In the end, though, they stripped Victoria, allowing Ashley to get the win. All of this match was a total and utter mess. Even without May and Moolah, it would have been bad, but their extended cameo only served to accentuate the awfulness that was being presented on screen. By the way, this was the same show where Money in the Bank was cashed in for the very first time. 
talk about swings and roundabouts. Number four, The Boogeyman versus Booker T and Charmel at WrestleMania 22. He's the boogeyman and he's coming to put on a really bad match at WrestleMania. After defeating JBL at the Royal Rumble in a match that very nearly made this list, WWE's resident, um, boogeyman set his sights on Booker T and Charmel. Why? Again, no idea. Why are you trying to make sense of a character who eats worms? After Booker pulled out of a one-on-one -on -one encounter with Boogeyman, the two were booked to face off at WrestleMania 22 with Book's wife Charmel also a participant. In a match that was mercifully short at under four minutes, Booker did most of the heavy lifting. Charmel tried to whack Boogeyman with his own staff, but he avoided it and kissed her with a mouthful of worms. Ugh. This led to the finish, a boogie bomb on Booker to give Boogeyman the win. This match could have actually been longer had Boogeyman not hurt his bicep at a house show, and that thought genuinely fills me with dread. Number three, Tori Wilson versus Candice Michelle at WrestleMania 22. At WrestleMania 22, Trish Stratus and Mickie James had one of the best women's WrestleMania matches of all time. This pioneering moment in women's wrestling was cancelled out about an hour later when Tori Wilson took on Candice Michelle in a Playboy pillow fight. What is a Playboy pillow fight, you ask? Well, it's two unfortunate women rolling around in a wrestling ring with a bed in it. To give them credit, there are actual moves in this match, including a suplex and, well, that's about it. It also featured memorable spots like Michelle cutting open Wilson's dress with a pair of scissors, Tori dumping the bed on top of Candice before jumping on it, and Wilson rubbing her dog's ass into Michelle's face. She rubbed a dog's ass in her face. Truly lost for words. This pitiful pandering to the male gaze has all the same problems as the other women's matches on this list. Bad wrestling, humiliating stipulation, Jerry Lawler, but at least those ones weren't at WrestleMania. Number two, The Undertaker vs. Big Show at the Great American Bash. For the third and final time on this series, we bring you the Punjabi Prison Match. And not just any Punjabi Prison Match, the very first one right here. If you are wondering why the great Carly, the kayfabe inventor of the match, wasn't in its initial outing, that's because he was one of the many victims of elevated liver enzymes at the Great American Bash. His proxy for this fight against The Undertaker was The Big Show, presumably because Simon Dean was otherwise engaged. We've talked about this stipulation a lot already, but it bears repeating just how bafflingly bad it is. The bamboo cage that surrounded the ring was restrictive to the wrestlers and the fans, who could only see about 30% of what was happening at any given time. Add to this a stupid finish where Taker won by falling through the side of the prison, and you've got a recipe for a painfully long 21 minutes! At the very least, let's be grateful that Carly wasn't in this thing. Yes, it was rubbish, but it could have somehow been a whole lot worse. Number 1. The Extreme Elimination Chamber at ECW December to Dismember To call WWE's attempts to revive ECW half-assed would be an insult to asses everywhere, and we couldn't do that to Tori Wilson's dog. The event featured a stacked card, including Balls Mahoney vs. Matt Stryker, Ariel and Kevin Thorne vs. Mike Knox and Kelly Kelly, and the FBI vs. Elijah Burke and Sylvester Turkai. Who? The Rotten Cherry on the Diarrhea Sunday was the show's main event, a six-person elimination chamber match for the ECW title. The bout actually disappointed before it even began, as Sabu was removed in favour of Hardcore Holly. During the match itself, crowd favourites Rob Van Dam and CM Punk were eliminated early, leading to an epic showdown between the two most ECW wrestlers of all time, Bobby Lashley and Big Show. Lashers won, but nobody cared. This sloppy, poorly booked match was emblematic of WWE's attitude toward their third brand and a sign of the utter disdain that they would direct to it over the next few years. 2005 2005 was not only the turning point for the decade, but was also a pivotal moment for WWE as well. A new generation of top stars announced themselves to the world, as John Cena and Batista both won world championships for the first time. Randy Orton was continuing his ascent to the top of the card, and newcomer Bobby Lashley was just starting to make an impression. However, as the old saying goes, every silver lining has a cloud. For every big new idea that paid off in 2005, 
2005, there were about seven others that flopped massively. Hulking giants were still being pushed way above their pay grade, and WWE still refused to get behind several stars the fans clearly wanted to succeed. Let's have a look, shall we? I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 2005. Join us! Number 10. The Undertaker vs. Heidenreich at Royal Rumble The Undertaker had been feuding with WWE's resident creepy poet for several months when they clashed at Royal Rumble 2005. Sorry, I misspoke there. I meant to say several months too many. Heidenreich started out looking bad against Taker and got no better as their feud stretched on. It all came to a head when the two faced each other in a casket match. Oh good, the match where the objective is to roll your opponent into a box. The action was sloppy as Heidenreich failed to convincingly sell most of what the dead man was throwing at him. It didn't help that he was saddled with a preposterous scared of caskets gimmick at the time. Very convenient, that. Honestly, it didn't work with Yokozuna in 1994, and it certainly didn't work here. Even run-ins from Kane and Snitsky couldn't help this waterfall of sewage as Taker mercifully closed the lid on Heidenreich and won the match. Even more mercifully, the planned Brothers of Destruction vs Heidenreich and Snitsky tag team match for WrestleMania never happened either. Forget a bullet, we all dodged a cannonball on that one. Number 9. Hulk Hogan vs Shawn Michaels at SummerSlam The dream match between the Hulkster and HBK at SummerSlam 2005 is one of the most memorable matches of all time. To many, for all the wrong reasons. Allegedly sick of Hogan's backstage politicking taking away his future wins, Michaels threw a very public hissy fit at the Immortal One's expense. He oversold everything in this match with pantomime levels of acting, flopping around the ring like a fish on dry land. HBK's theatrics, plus the backstage reasons behind it, make this one of the funniest WWE matches of all time. And it's also one of the most cathartic, as Hogan is the one getting punked out for a change. Unfortunately, to some, this blatant unprofessionalism from the showstopper overshadowed what could have been a historic main event. Not to me though, I bloody love it. Worse doesn't necessarily mean not entertaining. Two of the greatest icons in the history of wrestling colliding for the first time ever soon became came little more than a meme in waiting. Yes, Hogan was a bellend for trying to weasel his way out of losing to Sean in the future, but was this really the most mature way to go about things? Then again, I'm not sure the word mature is something that either man has come across. Number 8. Kane vs Viscera at Backlash What motivates a man to fight? The love of his family? The desire to do the right thing? A chance to leave an imprint on history? Well, dear viewer, for Viscera at Backlash 2005, the answer was Trish Stratus in a skimpy outfit. Trish was in the corner of the world's largest love machine when he took on Kane, who was accompanied by his wife Lita. That's right, this was the whole forced marriage and pregnancy angle, also a genius piece of storytelling. Dodgy gimmicks aside, the two men had a very dull match that had no business being on Raw, let alone a pay-per-view. The most exciting part of the bout was when a chair-wielding Trish got smacked in the face by Lita and her crutch. Unfortunately for all involved, that was about as good as it got. Number 7. Orlando Jordan vs Heidenreich at Judgment Day We try not to focus too much on build-up in these countdowns because a poor storyline can unfairly reflect on a good end product. In this case though, the build was just too weird not to mention. After embarrassing himself against The Undertaker, Heidenreich inexplicably turned babyface after WrestleMania. Part of that character change involved making friends with audience members and reading them his <clears throat> delightful poems. This is exactly what happened at Judgment Day as Heidenreich chose a member of the crowd to sit at ringside for his match against Orlando Jordan for the US title. The young girl in question, whose name was Alex, must have been a plant because there is no way a normal 10-year-old would be this excited to listen to a Heidenreich poem. With all that out the way, the two men wrestled a clunky match with zero heat to it, which ended with a DDT. A bad match with a bad build-up, this whole thing was a mess from top to bottom. 
We just hope that Alex is okay wherever she is, because if we had been forced to watch this up close at her age, we would all be having therapy for the rest of our lives. Number 6. Edge vs Matt Hardy at SummerSlam One of the biggest news stories of the entire year was the affair between Edge and Lita and its fallout. Edge was married at the time, while Lita was in a high-profile relationship with fellow wrestler Matt Hardy, who made very public comments about the pair once knowledge of the infidelity became public. This resulted in Matt being fired from WWE, which in turn sparked huge controversy as fans believed that an innocent man had lost his job. The company actually listened to its audience for once and brought Matt back into the fold for an all-out war with Edge at SummerSlam. At least that's what we hoped would happen. In reality, the two brawled for a bit, then Edge busted Matt open on the ring post before the match was declared over after Hardy couldn't defend himself. This wasn't real, by the way, it was all executed as planned. To say the end result of this match was disappointing would be a huge understatement. WWE left so much money on the table by not having these two duke it out in a proper match, sacrificing all that momentum to give Edge a tarnished victory in less than five minutes. Number 5. The Fulfill Your Fantasy Battle Royal at Taboo Tuesday Another year in WWE, another women in their underwear match on pay-per-view. Hooray! This time around, the WWE Universe had control over the fates of the company's most popular divas, or at least their clothes. The whole gimmick of Taboo Tuesday was that the fans could vote on certain match stipulations, and this time they could decide what the contestants in this Fulfill Your Fantasy Battle Royal would be wearing. The options were lingerie, cheerleader, or leather and lace. The winner was lingerie, and so Maria, Candice, Michelle, Ashley, Victoria, and Mickey James all came down to the ring in their underwear to take on Trish Stratus for her women's title. Props to this match for at least trying to have a storyline running throughout. This took place during Mickey's days as a Trish superfan, and her efforts to save her hero from elimination added an interesting wrinkle. Also, props to Trish and Victoria for doing their best to actually wrestle in this thing. All that to one side, this is still six grown women rolling around in their underwear for five minutes, and no amount of story can ever fix that. Number 4. Shelton Benjamin vs Maven at New Year's Revolution Heidenreich's poetry promo was weird and creepy, but at least it didn't happen after the bell had rung. A New Year's Revolution, former Tough Enough winner and scourge of The Undertaker Maven challenged Shelton Benjamin for the IC Championship. Well, sort of. After the bell rang, Maven kept rolling out of the ring and stalling. He then grabbed a microphone and started berating the Puerto Rican crowd for over three uninterrupted minutes. He told them to shut up, told them to speak English, he shouted so loudly into one fan's face that he blew out a microphone. It was pretty dire stuff, and in the middle of a championship match to boot. Eventually, Maven got so sick of the crowd that he walked out, only to change his mind and run back into the ring. He was then promptly rolled up and pinned by Benjamin. Whilst the promo was undeniably effective at drawing boos from the crowd, this was not the time or the place to do it. It killed the entire match to the point where it's hard to even count it as a match at all. Number 3. Trish Stratus vs Christy Hemi at WrestleMania 21 The 2004 Diva Search was WWE's attempt to find the next great female wrestling star. Participants were tested on their power, speed, agility, technical prowess. Just kidding, they cut cringy, flirty promos every week and rubbed pie on themselves, okay? The winner was 23-year-old Christy Hemi, who fans may also remember from her TNA days. WWE pushed her straight away, putting her into a program with Trish Stratus for the Women's Championship at WrestleMania 21. Lita was even brought in on Christie's side as her kayfabe trainer. Unfortunately, the challenger looked like a deer in headlights and clearly lacked the experience needed at the time, failing to pull off even the most basic of spots with any sort of conviction. The whole thing was over and done with in just four minutes, with Trish walking away as the winner. As much as I just criticised her, none of this was Christie's fault. She was pushed way too high way too soon by the company, who were far more concerned with her looks than her 
in ringability. Number 2. Theodore Long vs Eric Bischoff at Survivor Series Some matches sound bad on paper, but are surprisingly good when the chips are down. Some matches sound bad on paper and are bad. Welcome to Eric Bischoff vs Theodore Teddy Long at Survivor Series 2005. The general managers of Raw and SmackDown respectively had been getting all up in each other's business leading up to the show for that most sacred of reasons, brand supremacy. This led to both men squaring off in an actual honest-to-god match. Now might be a good time to remind you that neither are actual wrestlers and their combined age at the time was 108. What followed was five agonizing minutes of Long shuffling out of Bischoff's way, hitting him with his shoe, and then being distracted by… Palmer uh, Cannon? Uh, Who? Uh, Things somehow got even worse when the damn boogeyman showed up to attack Eazy-E, allowing Teddy to slowly crawl over and make the cover. Bad idea, bad execution, bad everything. This match stunk to high heaven. But at least we didn't have to look at anyone's backside. Number 1. Akabono vs Big Show at WrestleMania 21 on the same show where Randy Orton nearly beat the streak, Shawn Michaels and Kurt Angle had a classic, and John Cena and Batista took their places as the future of WWE, Big Show got his entire ass out to lose a fake sumo match. Akabono, who, fun fact, once fought Brock Lesnar for the IWGP Heavyweight Championship, was a huge star in the world of sumo, so his appearance at WrestleMania 21 was actually a big deal, if you liked sumo wrestling, which it seems nobody in the audience did. WWE tried their best to present the match as authentically as possible, but all it did was grind the show to a screeching halt. And then came the actual bout itself, 60 seconds of pretend fumbling around until Akabono chucked Big Show right out of the ring. Not only was this entire segment clunky and uninteresting, but it didn't even build to anything exciting. Akabono won it, and that was that. No follow-up, no big angle, nothing. Despite their best intentions, WWE just wasted time on the biggest show of the year by pushing something nobody wanted to see. And we're not talking about Big Show's bum cheeks. Or am I? 2004 in terms of calendar years, few have ever been as up and down for WWE as 2004. In terms of the good stuff, WrestleMania 20 was an absolute triumph, Eddie Guerrero won his first and only WWE Championship, and Randy Orton became the youngest world champion in the entire history of the company. As for the bad, well, that's sort of why we're here, isn't it? 2004 was chock full of random pairings, terrible storylines, and bafflingly executed matches. Sometimes we with these lists, we have to turn to episodes of Raw or SmackDown to find the bad stuff, but not this time. WWE's pay-per-view output had us more than covered. Aren't we lucky? I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 2004. Join us. Number 10. Daniel Puder vs Mike Mizanin at Armageddon the final pay-per-view of 2004, Armageddon was a really weird evening. Big Show beat Kurt Angle, Luther Reigns and Mark Jindrak in a handicap match, John Cena wrestled Jesus after the latter stabbed the former, and oh yeah, Angle pulled double duty by also wrestling Santa Claus earlier that night. Another oddity that took place was the final of Tough Enough. Daniel Puder and Mike the Miz Mizanin had survived several gruelling weeks of competition and were tantalizingly close to getting their hands on the $1 million prize. How was this epic journey concluded? Why of course, with a boxing match, on a wrestling show, for a wrestling contract. Like most scripted boxing matches in wrestling, this bout wasn't the best. Hang on, was it scripted? Does anybody know? Does anybody care? Either way, this was as rough as a sandpaper enema as the pair flopped around the ring like two mad avatars on Wii Sports. This bizarre spectacle lasted three one-minute rounds before Pewter was declared the winner. He won the entire competition, shot on Kurt Angle, got beat up in the Royal Rumble, and was released in 2005. Lovely stuff. Number 9. Eugene vs Eric Bischoff at Taboo Tuesday 
In 2004, the world was introduced to Eugene, the wrestling savant character played by Nick Dinsmore. To say this gimmick was controversial would be like calling the human centipede controversial, except I think more people got upset with Eugene. In kayfabe, he was the nephew of Raw General Manager Eric Bischoff. Easy e wanted absolutely nothing to do with Eugene, so placed him in the care of William Regal. Eugene then ended up getting in a feud with Triple H, so you could say Regal did a terrible job there. After predictably losing to the game, Eugene entered into a rivalry with his uncle that culminated in a match at Taboo Tuesday. Well, I say match, what I mean is Eugene beating up Bischoff for two minutes before winning with a leg drop. The aftermath wasn't much better as Jonathan Coachman and Vince McMahon also got involved with the audience voting on Eric's punishment for losing. Because wrestling fans are evil, they decided that he should have his head shaved. You horrible people, how could you deny Eric his jet black locks? Oh well, at least we got Silver Fox Bischoff not too long after this. Fwoah. Number 8. Brock Lesnar vs Hardcore Holly at Royal Rumble In a cruel twist of fate, Bob Holly, a man notorious for stiffing people in the ring, suffered a terrifying unscripted moment while facing Brock Lesnar on an episode of SmackDown in 2002. And by terrifying moment, we mean got his neck broken, although some do speculate that Holly may have been deliberately trying to sandbag Brock and that the accident was more his own fault. When Angry Bob returned from his injury in late 2003, he went straight for the Beast Incarnate, trying to break his neck in return. The two did battle for Lesnar's WWE title at the Royal Rumble in a match that nobody expected the challenger to win, and he didn't. Admittedly, it got off to a hot start, but quickly became bogged down with rest holds until Brock dispatched Bob with an F5. The entire thing only went for 6 minutes and 22 seconds. A world title match on a big show took less time than I take to tie my shoes. Look, I'm not very dexterous, alright? Oh well, at least Hardcore Holly doesn't appear on this list again. I wish we could say the same for Brock. Number 7. Tori Wilson and Sable vs Miss Jackie and Stacey Keebler at WrestleMania 20 Oh boy, it is time for the overly sexualized ladies in their underwear match at WrestleMania. 2004's entry into this historic trend was the Playboy Evening Gown match pitting SmackDown's Tori Wilson and Sable against Raw's Stacey Keebler and Miss Jackie. Yep, this was an interpromotional match, clearly a feud so important that it spilled across both shows. In a unique twist on the match type, the ladies actually stripped themselves down to their underwear before it even started. Truly a groundbreaking moment for women's wrestling. The action, if you want to call it that, was exactly as bad as you would think. The four women fumbled around the ring, slapped each other, attempted a few roll-ups, and screamed their lungs out all the while. Fair play to Tori for hitting a top rope crossbody, but I wouldn't have blamed her if she had just saved the energy for something that actually mattered. Tori and Sable won, which at the very least extended the latter's WrestleMania streak to 3-0. No jokes, that is legitimately one of the best undefeated Mania streaks still out there, so maybe we should put a bit more respect on this match's name. Number 6. Jamie Noble vs Nidia at No Way Out Nydia was one of the first winners of Tough Enough back in 2001. While her male counterpart, Maven, got to eliminate The Undertaker at the 2002 Royal Rumble, Nydia had to put up with garbage like this. She was immediately put into an on-screen relationship with Jamie Noble as a trailer trash couple who hit it rich, Beverly Hillbilly style. The greatest piece of character development Nydia got was when she was blinded by Tajiri's Mist. Noble would then take advantage of Nydia's blindness to help him win matches until she turned on him and instigated this match at No Way Out. Noble was forced to wear a blindfold to take on his former partner, whose sight had miraculously returned. What followed was five minutes of Noble blundering around the ring, failing to find his opponent whilst she kicked him up the bum several times. Like all heels in blindfold matches, Noble subtly lifted his hood to get advantage and the win. And like all audiences watching blindfold matches, we wish somebody had sprayed us with mist so that we wouldn't have to sit through this awkward clunky mess. Number 5. Sable vs Tori Wilson at the Great American Bash Despite being a team that was forged in the fire of the, um, Playboy Evening Gown match, Sable and Tori soon fell apart after the latter was announced as the poster girl for the Great American Bash. 
To be fair, if someone else got to wear a Stars and Stripes bikini and I didn't, I would turn on them too. Neither woman was particularly famed for their in-ring ability, so it's no surprise that this match was a bit of a stinker. The bout went just a few seconds shy of Holly and Lesnar at the Rumble, but here they managed to mess up nearly every single spot they did. A sunset flip was more of a sunset flop. They had perhaps the worst double down of all time, and Sable even messed up the pin. It's like messing up the full stop at the end of a sentence. This match was so technically awful that you wonder why WWE even put these two on the pay-per-view at all. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> Number 4. Tyson Tomko vs Steven Richards at Unforgiven Former ECW wrestler and BWO member for, 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 for life, Stephen Richards was in WWE from 1999 to 2008. Apart from perhaps his run as the leader of Right to Censor, his time there is often forgotten by fans, which is maybe a good thing when it comes to segments like this. Around this time, Sweet Stevie had been dressing up as a woman to help Victoria win her matches, for reasons I still can't quite understand. After Richards attempted to help her win the women's championship at Unforgiven, Big Bad Tyson Tomko decided decided that he had had enough. He called the mystery woman out to the ring for an impromptu match. Then came six and a half minutes of Tomko beating the ever-loving juices out of Big Stevie Cool. The poor lad got absolutely humiliated, stripped down to his bra and pants as the bout dragged on and on and on to a deafening silence. Tomko won, but by that point it was far too late. Fans had completely lost interest in anything that was going on and just wanted to get to Chris Jericho vs Christian in a ladder match as quickly as possible. Number 3. Christy Hemi vs Carmella at Taboo Tuesday Whilst Daniel Pewter and The Miz were bopping each other with boxing gloves over on SmackDown, a female version of Tough Enough was festering over on Monday nights. The first ever televised diva search ran throughout 2004, the final two contestants being Christy Hemi and Carmella. No, not that one. After weeks of bikini contests, insult battles, and Christy rubbing pie into her bum, a winner was finally decided. And shockingly, given Tough Enough's track record, the person you've heard of actually won the thing. Shortly after Hemi's victory, the pair started a feud that came to a head at Taboo Tuesday. The stipulation was left up to a fan vote, of course, and oh boy, was it a tough choice. Lingerie pillow fight, evening gown match, or aerobics challenge? Seems a bit out of left field, but sure. Instead, though, the first option won, and so we were treated to two entirely untrained wrestlers clobbering each other with pillows like children at a sleepover. After the feathers settled, Christy was victorious once again in what would be Carmella's final appearance on WWE TV. To be honest, I reckon she couldn't have gotten out of there fast enough. Number 2. The Undertaker vs The Dudley Boys at The Great American Bash after three and a bit years of playing the American badass, The Undertaker returned to the dead man persona against his brother Kane at WrestleMania 20. He was accompanied by former manager and his mum's naughty friend, Paul Bearer. Whilst it was great to see Bearer back at the time, little could we have known that his return would have led to this hot mess. On the instructions of Paul Heyman, the Dudley boys kidnapped Bearer and used him as leverage over Taker. At the Great American Bash, the dead man fought the brothers in a handicap match with Bearer trapped in a glass box at the top of the stage. If the Phenom threw the match and let the Dudley boys beat him, Bearer would be set free. However, if he went rogue, his manager would be buried in cement. Even without that absolutely insane stipulation, this match was terrible. The action kept getting hampered by Heyman taunting The Undertaker on a house mic, repeatedly calling him a bad dog whenever he actually fought back. Eventually, though, Taker won, scared Heyman off with lightning powers and celebrated by covering Bearer in cement anyway. The bad guys had been absolutely taken care of. All he had to do was rescue his manager. So what was the point of this whole match then? I'm tired. Let's just move on. Number 1. Goldberg vs Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania 20 Because what else could it have been? An absolute dream match between two living behemoths, Goldberg vs Lesnar at WrestleMania had everything going for it. That is, right up until the news got out that this would be both men's final match in the company. Lesnar was off to try his meaty hands at American football, whilst Big Bill had just had enough. The fans were not happy. Those in attendance at Madison Square Garden dumped on this match like it was the inside of a toilet. They rained booze down on both men, and very 
very clearly, rather than trying to win them back, the participants just gave them even more reason to boo. They stalled, they locked up, they stalled again, they locked up again, repeating this tedious pattern over and over for 14 agonizing minutes. Not even special guest referee Steve Austin could save the day, as fans were delighted to see Goldberg pin Brock just because it meant that the match was over. A truly fascinating encounter, this put a stain on both men's legacies that wouldn't be removed until 13 years later. 2003 2003 is one of those years in WWE history that looks very strange when viewed with a bit of hindsight. It was very much a transitional year. The Ruthless Aggression era was still in its infancy, whilst a few vestiges of the Attitude era clung on for dear life. This meant that you got shows like WrestleMania 19, with huge matches like Shawn Michaels vs Chris Jericho, Brock Lesnar vs Kurt Angle, and Stone Cold vs The Rock all happening on the same night. 2003 was so star-studded it can therefore be easy to overlook some of the bad stuff that went down in this topsy-turvy year. Easy, but not impossible. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 2003. Join us! Number 10. Goldberg vs Triple H at Survivor Series WCW didn't get everything right, just ask anyone who was mad enough to still be watching Nitro in 2000, but one thing they excelled at was the initial rise of Goldberg. The company knew his limits and never pushed him above them, booking him in short explosive matches that showcased his immense power and speed. WWE had the perfect blueprint for Billy when he started for them in 2003. Did they bother to use it though? Did they balls? The company was for some reason dead set on putting Goldberg in longer matches that exposed his flaws rather than hiding them. Perhaps the worst example of this philosophy came at the 2003 Survivor Series, where Goldberg met Triple H in a World Heavyweight Championship defense. The champion just could not work the WWE big match style, leading to a flat, dull, drawn-out slog of a bout that only got interesting when Evolution made a run-in. It was also a very flat end to a very wacky and eventful pay-per-view, main eventing after Kane vs Shane McMahon, Vince literally burying The Undertaker, and a Shawn Michaels performance for the ages. Number 9. The APA Invitational Barroom Brawl at Vengeance when they weren't always pounding ass, Bradshaw and Farouk loved nothing more than a bar fight. They loved a bar fight so much that they decided to host a huge one at Vengeance and invite all their friends along. Their friends included the Brooklyn Brawler, Brother Love, Doink the Clown, and the Easter Bunny, by the way. By the way, those last two were played by Nick Eugene Dinsmore and the future Damian Sandow. Does that make this match any better? Not one tiny bit. In fact, the very word match is a loose description here. This was 20 or so guys in a fake pub smashing the wee wee out of one another for four and a half minutes. If you lean more toward the chaotic side of life, then you might get something out of this bizarre spectacle. But if you like your wrestling to have, you know, wrestling in it, then you will sit there wondering why anyone thought this was a good use of pay-per-view time. Oh, Bradshaw won, by the way, in case any of you cared. Number 8. Sable vs Stephanie McMahon at Vengeance Remember when Vince McMahon traumatized his daughter by openly cheating on her comatose mother in the build-up to WrestleMania X7? Remember when he did the exact same thing again with Sable just a few years later? Poor Steph. Much like she had done with Trish Stratus in 2001, Stephanie took on her father's mistress at Vengeance in a no count out match. The billion dollar princess was never a great wrestler or anything, but we've seen her do pretty well when paired with the right opponent. Sable was not the right opponent. They fumbled around both inside and outside the ring, hitting offense that could be best described as hopeful. The moment you might remember came when A-Train interfered on Sable's behalf, absolutely flattening Stephanie with a run-in to give the Wildcat the win. If the sloppy wrestling wasn't enough to get this match on the list, then the sight of a giant hairy man running down a 26-year-old woman definitely did the trick. Number 7. Tori Wilson vs Dawn Marie Wilson at Royal Rumble Depending on how ironically you enjoy wrestling, the storyline between Dawn Marie, Tori Wilson, and Tori's father Al is either the worst or best thing to ever happen. 
Recently divorced, Mr. Wilson found himself romantically involved with his daughter's co-worker. Despite repeated attempts to call the relationship off, Dawn and Al got hitched on an episode of SmackDown in their pants. Why have I never been invited to this sort of wedding? Married life got off to a rocky start when Al died in kayfabe. The reason for his passing? Too much badonka donking. What a way to go. This led to a match between stepmother and stepdaughter at the Royal Rumble. Unfortunately, a storyline that involved death descended into the usual women's fodder of the time. Badly executed moves, hair pulling, steamrolling the ref, you know the stuff. The fact that all of this was going on while Michael Cole and Taz were trying to seriously convey the grief that both women supposedly felt just made everything so much worse. Or better if you're a sicko like me. Number 6. Shane McMahon vs Eric Bischoff at SummerSlam Eric Bischoff has done some pretty despicable things. He helped form the NWO, tried to run TNA into the ground, and gave the world the kiss demon, but few of his actions were as viscerally upsetting as the time he forced himself on Linda McMahon in 2003. By the way, that means that Bischoff has kissed both the wife and daughter of his ultimate business rival. Wrestling's weird, isn't it? This infraction led to Eazy e taking on Shane McMahon at SummerSlam. As non wrestlers go, Shane was among the most entertaining in his prime. As for Eric, let's just say he's a better podcaster than worker. The presence of Bischoff's lackey, Jonathan Coachman, didn't help matters as he teamed up with his boss to lay waste to the young McMahon. Did we also need him doing solo commentary on a live mic the entire time? This train wreck was thankfully halted when Steve Austin made the save, allowing Shane O'Mac to brutalize his opponent with an elbow drop through the announcer's desk. Whilst it was nice to see Eric get his comeuppance, this was absolutely not the way to go about it. Number 5. Triple H vs Kevin Nash at Judgment Day The Click have had some great moments together. This group of real-life buddies often had great matches against one another, pulling together to get the best possible result every time they stepped in the ring. Well, not every time. Case in point, this World Heavyweight Championship match between Triple H and his good time boy Kevin Nash at Judgment Day 2003. These two were perhaps the Click members least suited to working together. The two friends had a lumbering, plodding affair that saw the referee get battered just as much as the competitors. Seriously, Earl Hebner takes one hell of a beating in this match, including a damn sledgehammer shot. This finally got the match thrown out, which fans might have reacted more strongly to if they weren't so relieved that it was finally over. Number 4. Mr. America vs. Roddy Piper at Judgment Day Immediately before the previous match, fans were treated to yet another opportunity to go to the bathroom when Rowdy Roddy Piper went head-to-head -head with Mr. America. For reasons that would take far too long to explain, Hulk Hogan was hiding out under his best Captain America cosplay to avoid getting fired by Vince McMahon. This led to a match with his old rival, Rowdy Roddy Piper. Hogan vs Piper was the rivalry that helped make the first WrestleMania such a success, but that was in 1985 close to 20 years before this encounter took place. Instead of an industry shifter, we got a sorry state of a match between two men for whom the phrase seen better days was sadly very much appropriate. The middle-aged legends threw punches and, well, they threw punches, that's basically all they did. Sean O'Hare got involved a bunch, remember when Sean O'Hare was Piper's running buddy, accidentally costing the hot rod by bashing in his skull with a lead pipe. Mr. America won, and this entire ridiculous saga would roll on until Hulk Hogan left the company a month later. Nice to see this was all worth it then. Number 3. Triple H vs Scott Steiner at No Way Out When Scott Steiner appeared at Survivor Series 2002, fans were ecstatic. While he had been in WWE before alongside his brother Rick, this was a very different man. This was a former WCW champion, Freakzilla, the big bad booty daddy! And then he asked for an effing mic and the rest of his WWE run went downhill from there. The world's angriest chainmail enthusiast went straight for the top, challenging Triple H for the World Heavyweight Championship a couple of months into his return. The two men's second encounter for the gold came at No Way Out 2003 and, well, it was pants. Among a litany of botches, it was also just plain boring. Steiner could do very little and the match lacked a single shred of credibility as Triple H tried and failed to convincingly sell for him. 
In the end, a pedigree felled the challenger, and this monstrosity was over. It didn't help that fans were booing Scott throughout the whole thing. Was this because they were in Canada, aka Bizarro World? Or was it because, number two, Scott Steiner vs Triple H at Royal Rumble? Just one month before putting on one of the worst World Heavyweight Championship matches in history, Scott Steiner and Triple H had another of the worst World Heavyweight Championship matches in history. Their first encounter was not helped by the fact that Steiner was working through a foot injury, which severely hampered his abilities. However, as we saw at No Way Out when he was healthy, it clearly wasn't holding him back all that much. The challenger also appeared out of ring shape throughout the contest, often taking time to pause and catch his breath. Sadly, they hadn't learnt this lesson by the Rumble, so fans were forced to sit through a puffed-up behemoth with a bad wheel, aimlessly chucking the game around as the boos grew louder and louder. Why WWE decided to give Scott another chance at the gold after this disaster is beyond me, but at least he had improved slightly by No Way Out? Still, that improvement didn't mean that he was any good, and it definitely didn't wash the taste of this turd smoothie out of everybody's mouths. Number 1. Mr. McMahon vs. Stephanie McMahon at No Mercy Vince McMahon facing his own son at WrestleMania was one thing, but him taking on his daughter in a brutal I Quit match on pay-per-view crosses a whole bunch of lines. It's like a family therapist's dream and nightmare all rolled into one. After growing tired of his daughter stepping out of line, Vince did the unthinkable and made the challenge to Steph for this battle at no mercy. Over the course of 10 minutes, viewers watched on in abject horror as a middle-aged multi-millionaire assaulted his own flesh and blood for our supposed entertainment. Even removing the disturbing optics of an older man choking out a younger woman with a lead pipe, this match was totally unnecessary. McMahon's self-indulgence, gratuitous intergender violence, a nonsensical storyline surrounding it, this match had it all and was an absolute shoo-in for the top of this list. 2002 2002 is one of the oddest years in WWE's entire history. Not quite the Attitude Era, but the very beginnings of this strange new Ruthless Aggression Era. Stone Cold was still wrestling, but he also sort of wasn't. The company seemed to have one top championship again, but wait a second, here's the World Heavyweight title to make things a little more interesting. In amongst the big positives like Rock vs Hogan and the debuts of guys like John Cena, Randy Orton, Batista and Brock Lesnar, there were some plain old terrible matches for us to cling on to. At least that'll never change, eh? I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 2002. Join us! Number 10. Batista vs Kane at Armageddon Sometimes putting two big beefy boys in a ring together and letting them fight is a license to print money. However, this technique doesn't work all the time, but in the mind of Vince McMahon, it's often the way to go. Hopefully Vinnie Mac enjoyed seeing Kane take on a rookie Batista at Armageddon in 2002, because that means at least somebody enjoyed watching these two tussle. Batista had just aligned himself with Ric Flair and was on the verge of joining Evolution. He needed to beat a big star on a big stage in a good match to cement himself as one to watch. Well, as Meatloaf would say, two out of three ain't bad. Big Dave was not the most versatile performer at this part of his career, and while a reliable performer, Kane wasn't really a ring general. The match just plodded on, with Flair occasionally getting involved, turtleneck and all. Whilst the up-and-comer did win, which was the right choice, the match itself was hardly a shining endorsement of somebody who was supposed to represent the future of the business. Number 9. Tori Wilson vs Dawn Marie at No Mercy In the previous video of this series, we talked about the infamous Tori Wilson's dad who died during Coitus storyline. It concluded in epic fashion at Royal Rumble 2003 but actually got its start the year before. Before Dawn Marie officially got hitched to Big Al Wilson, she fought his daughter Tori at the No Mercy event from October 2022. On a night that saw Triple H unify the World Heavyweight and IC Championships and Brock Lesnar defeat The Undertaker in a brutal Hell in a Cell match, two women went head to head for an old man's heart. Talk about a trilogy. To give these women some immense credit, this was just a boring match. 
It was nowhere near as sloppy or degrading as some of the other women's segments and matches from around this time, with Tori even hitting a really nice dropkick to the outside to start things off. It still wasn't very good though, don't get me wrong, probably because WWE puts absolutely zero effort into presenting women's wrestling as anything other than a sideshow. Number 8. Scott Hall vs Bradshaw at Backlash Individually, Scott Hall and John Bradshaw Layfield are two very accomplished wrestlers. JBL is a former WWE champion, and Hall is widely regarded as one of the greatest to never hold that belt. That said, neither had their best day at Backlash 2002. The two men shared the ring for just shy of six minutes and only hit about six different moves between them, 90% of which were punches. You would easily be fooled into thinking this was a worked boxing match, or even Rock'em Sock'em Robots for that matter. The only exciting part of the whole thing was when Farouk beat up X-Pac on the outside in a mini APA reunion. It wasn't enough, however, as Hall punched JBL in the knob and rolled him up to mercifully bring this one to an end. The crowd were molten hot at the beginning of this match, ready to see two stars collide headfirst in the ring. However, as it slowly wore on, they became quieter and quieter, to the point where you could have moved the ring to a library and nobody would have noticed. Number 7. Stone Cold Steve Austin vs Big Show at Insurrection WWE had two field trips to the UK in 2002 for two British-only pay-per-view events. SmackDown got Rebellion, while Raw got Insurrection, the first ever single-branded pay-per-view in company history. The UK crowd were red hot for Stone Cold Steve Austin, despite the fact that he was winding down his career as an in-ring competitor. So who did WWE call on to help carry a battered Austin to a good match? Well, oh, it's the big show. Austin might have had every injury in the book, but show didn't really fare much better when it came to stringing moves together. As a result, this match was just incredibly basic. Punches, kicks, more punches, even more punches. The NWO ran in to try and help their giant friend, but were fought off by Austin and Ric Flair. This all led to Austin winning the match and stunning Flair after the bell. A decent ending to pop the crowd, but not worth sitting through all that for. Number 6. The Undertaker vs Triple H at King of the Ring A main event doesn't necessarily have to be the best match on a pay-per-view. However, when the final encounter is the worst match on an already pretty terrible show, you know something has gone very wrong. This wasn't all The Undertaker and Triple H's fault though. The Rock had made an appearance backstage earlier in the night, and fans were far more interested in waiting for him to make a run-in than they were in the match. On the other hand, maybe if the two competitors had gone at a faster pace, the viewers might have cared a little bit more. For 23 yawn-inducing minutes, the game and the dead man slowly bopped each other around the ring while everyone watching fell into a medical coma. You can actually see people at ringside staring down the entranceway, choosing to maybe get an early glimpse of The Rock rather than watching this lumbering affair. Thank God Rocky did eventually show up, otherwise everyone in attendance might have ended up being fossilized. It woke up a lot of the audience, but it wasn't enough to wash the taste of so much boring wrestling out of our mouths. Number 5. Big Show vs Brock Lesnar at Survivor Series Between his debut the night after WrestleMania 18 and Survivor Series 2002, Brock Lesnar won King of the Ring, the WWE Championship, and was undefeated on television. But wait, who's that around the corner? Well, yes, I've done it again. The next big thing was defending his title against the literal big thing with good old trustworthy Paul Heyman in his corner. Wait, Paul, what are you doing? Put that chair down! Paul, no! Yes, Heyman betrayed his young prodigy to side with the big nasty. A chair shot and a choke slam later, and show was your new champ. On the list of best choices for who should have ended Brock Lesnar's undefeated run, show was somewhere toward the bottom, nestled in between Rico and Tony Chimmel. Heyman's turn made zero sense either, as there was no way anyone with half the intelligence of Paul Lee would choose this version of Big Show over nature's greatest killing machine. Oh, and also the match only went four minutes, and Lesnar was working it with a broken rib. Bit of a nightmare. Number 4. Hollywood Hulk Hogan vs Triple H at Backlash Sometimes something that seems good in the moment can have far-reaching and catastrophic consequences for the future. 
Take The Rock's match with Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania 18. It's widely regarded as one of the greatest in Mania history, especially for the crowd reaction, which organically turned Hogan face after they refused to boo him. While this was all great at the time, it did lead to this awful moment one month later. Hogan's unexpected surge in popularity led WWE to push him right back to the top of the card at the expense of newly minted WWE champion Triple H. The pair had a very clunky main event at Backlash, where Hogan dropped his middle-aged leg across the game's chest to win the gold for the sixth time. Yes, people were thrilled to see Hogan back, but as world champion, no thanks. Fans were anxious to see what a Hogan championship run would look like, but WWE thankfully saw sense and pulled the plug on it just 28 days later. Unfortunately, the match in which Hogan lost the belt was even worse than this one. More on that later. Number 3. Jazz vs Trish Stratus vs Lita at WrestleMania 18 On paper, this seems like a bloody decent clash. Jazz was a really good wrestler who honed her craft in ECW, while the resumes of Trish and Lita speak for themselves. So what is it doing on this list? list, and why is it so high up? The answer? There could have been a catastrophe at several points during this match. It started off fairly well, with defending women's champion Jazz throwing some stiff-looking offense. Then it was time for Trish and Lita to work together, and… oh no. The pair were nowhere near their peaks, with Trish having transitioned into full-time wrestling less than a year earlier. Lita hit Trish with a back body drop that could have separated her shoulder before almost dropping her directly on her head with a botched body slam. Then Trish fumbled a roll up and crashed into her opponent head first while charging out of the corner. There is a fine line between putting on a realistic match and being out of control, and unfortunately it looked like we got the latter here. A bad match is one thing, but a dangerous match? That's a whole nother level. But hey, at least Jazz looked alright. Number 2. The Undertaker vs Hollywood Hulk Hogan at Judgment Day A month after he was unwisely made WWE Champion, Hollywood Hulk Hogan had his final ever World Championship defense against the man who had beaten the Hulkster for his first world title a decade earlier. On the evidence of this bout alone, maybe it wasn't a particularly kind decade to either man. Undertaker's biker gimmick had run its course and fans were starting to get a little bit sick of him. As for Hogan, well, just go back and watch the entry about him versus Trips for an explanation. The iceberg that sunk the Titanic was more manoeuvrable than these two and is probably considered less of a tragedy than this match turned out to be. The absolute piece de resistance was the now infamous choke slam, the Undertaker nailing Hogan with all the force of someone tucking their kid into bed. You're meant to jump, Terry, that's kind of how this whole wrestling thing works. It's appropriate that Hogan was in this match as it very much felt like a WCW main event from the late 90s, a slow showcase of the stars of yesteryear that fans had absolutely zero interest in seeing dominate the card. Number 1. Christopher Nowinski and Jackie Gator vs Bradshaw and Trish Stratus on Raw This is it. It's THE match. The match widely considered to be the absolute worst in the history of Monday Night Raw. What a treat. Jackie Gator was thrust onto the main roster almost immediately after winning the second season of Tough Enough and, crucially, before she could receive any sort of proper training. She was totally fed to the wolves on the July 8th, 2002 episode of Raw, teaming with another newbie in Christopher Nowinski to take on relative newcomer Trish and big old Bradshaw, a man who does not like rookies. This match has to be seen to be believed. Gator botches everything, and I mean everything. She infamously sells a second rope bulldog about 10 minutes too late, and the crowd absolutely dump on her for it. It was a bad idea to give Gator so much time in this match. It was a bad idea to even give her a televised wrestling match at all, to be honest. She needed way more in-ring experience, but her chances of ever being taken seriously ever again went up in smoke as soon as the bell rang. 2001 2001 was home to one of the biggest and best shows WWE have ever put on, WrestleMania X7. TLC2, the hardcore triple threat, the gimmick battle royal, Zombie Linda! And then there is the main event, which ended with Stone Cold Steve Austin shaking hands with Satan himself as he recaptured the WWE title. It was a beautiful night, one that will live on in the hearts and minds of wrestling fans until the end of time. 
time. That being said, 2001 was also the year of the Invasion storyline. So let's focus on that instead and dump all over this beloved historic year in wrestling history. I'm Adam Pachisi from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 2001. Sorry, join us. Number 10, Big Show vs. Diamond Dallas Page at Rebellion. Two weeks out from the dramatic end of the Invasion storyline at Survivor Series, WWE ran Rebellion, one of their UK-exclusive pay-per-views. The show was rather strange, as many of the top stars appeared to be totally out of it, cutting bizarre backstage promos that were very clearly influenced by jet lag. Perhaps this explains why the Big Show vs. Diamond Dallas Page match, which went on midway through the show, was such a stinker. To give the former WCW men their credit, the match was only allotted three and a quarter minutes, which is hardly enough to put on a five-star classic. Still, surely they could have done better than this. A match that mostly involved DDP bouncing around for show, then hitting the diamond cutter, only to be too beaten up to capitalize. One choke slam from the ex-giant later and the founder of DDP Yoga was out for the count. He then tried to cut a promo about how bad the UK was, but show's music started playing over the top of him speaking to hilariously cut him off. He couldn't even beat the man's theme song. 2001 really wasn't DDP's year. Number 9, Stephen Richards vs. Jerry Lawler at No Way Out Stacey Carter, aka Miss Kitty, aka The Cat, had a very unique wrestling career. With the in-ring skills of a cauliflower, The Cat was mainly used to titillate the audience with her exhibitionist character. Basically, any chance to get her kit off on TV she would take. This predictably drew the ire of Right to Censor, a moralistic group on a crusade to keep WWE programming clean. Good luck with that one. Cat's feud with RTC led to a match between the White Sox wearing group's leader, Stephen Richards, and Cat's real-life husband, Jerry Lawler, at No Way Out. Despite the dated story, the match went alright for the most part. Lawler could still go and an irate Richards was an entertaining foil. Unfortunately, as the bout reached its conclusion, several things went wrong. First, Lawler missed his cue to stop Richards using a chair, leading to several awkward moments of just standing around. Then, Cat also jumped her spot when trying to attack Richards with Ivory's women's title belt, leaving the match mired in a very sloppy finish. Hey, at least this led to that intriguing storyline where Kat had to join the group. Oh wait, no, scrap that, she was fired two days later. Number 8, Ivory vs China at Royal Rumble A huge part of why China was so successful during her WWE career was that, for a period, she would almost exclusively wrestle men. So what did WWE decide to do with the ninth wonder of the world in 2001? Put her in the women's division, of course. This led to China facing women's champion Ivory at the Royal Rumble in January, and by facing, we actually mean beating the living hell out of. Ivory got decimated here, completely upstaged by the much more dominant woman. It looked as if China was easily going to capture the gold when she re-aggravated a kayfabe neck injury while attempting a handspring elbow. This allowed the right to censor member to pin and retain. What was essentially an extended squash match turned into a confusing mess, all because the company had no idea how to keep China looking strong without putting the belt on her. Number 7, Earl Hebner vs Nick Patrick at Invasion The Invasion pay-per-view from July 2001 is one of the most interesting wrestling shows of all time with the power of hindsight. The first major step in the arc of the same name, Invasion offered up the opportunity to pit some of the biggest names from WWE up against icons from ECW and WCW. So naturally, we got a six-man tag with Sean Stasiak, Canyon and Hugh Morris against Albert, Big Show and Billy Gunn. And we also got another match nobody expected, a referee fight between between WWE's Earl Hebner and WCW's Nick Patrick. This came about as a result of tensions between the two groups of officials backstage. Ah uh, yeah, the referees, the part of this storyline everybody was interested in. As you can imagine, a match between two middle-aged non-wrestlers went thusly. Lots of punches, lots of kicks, lots of shenanigans with the other refs on the outside, before Earl hit the worst spear of all time for the win. In an ironic sense, this is great fun actually, but unfortunately 
Apparently, we here at Cultaholic are very serious people and have no time for irony, and so that is why you are at number seven, Zebra Men. Number six, Tori Wilson versus Stacey Keebler at No Mercy. Sticking with the invasion now as we head to October's No Mercy pay-per-view. On a show where Edge faced Christian for the Intercontinental Championship and Steve Austin defended his world title in a triple threat main event, Stacey Keebler and Tori Wilson went to war in a lingerie match. Truly, the stakes had never been higher. But hang on a second, Adam. Weren't Keebler and Wilson both on the Alliance team? They both came over from WCW in the buyout. How come they were fighting? Well, Tori had recently begun an on-screen relationship with Tajiri, who was a member of Team WWF. Then, to get back at her, Stacy teamed up with the Dudley boys to... Wait, why am I getting into this much detail of a goddamn lingerie match? Basically, it was two attractive women rolling about in their underwear for the entertainment of the despicably horny, like myself. If you want me to get any more technical than that with my description, then prepare to be sorely disappointed. Oh, and Tori won, by the way, in a match that only just breached three minutes. To be fair to both ladies, they obviously looked lovely, respectfully. Number 5. The Brothers of Destruction vs Diamond Dallas Page and Canyon at SummerSlam Remember how we said that 2001 wasn't Diamond Dallas Page's year? This match would be key evidence in the murder of DDP's WWE career trial. Page first debuted for the company as the mystery stalker of The Undertaker's wife Sarah, revealing himself to a huge pop on an episode of Raw. After that, though, it was all downhill. After getting beaten to a bloody pulp by Taker at King of the Ring, Page would continue to feud with the dead man up until SummerSlam. By this point, DDP and former protege Canyon had won the WWE Tag Team Championships, whilst Taker was the WCW Tag Champ along with his demonic brother. A steel cage match was made for all the marbles, and my god was it one-sided. Like an adult man taking on a toddler in a running race one-sided. Canyon and DDP got their world championship backsides whooped as the brothers easily dispatched of them to win both sets of gold. Page was already a joke by this point, but the utter humiliation he suffered inside that cage proved that one of the most popular homegrown stars in the history of WCW was nothing more than a jobber in his new surroundings. Number 4. Trish Stratus and Lita vs Tori Wilson and Stacey Keebler at Invasion Back to the Invasion show now and yet another match aimed solely at that lucrative, horny, testosterone fueled male demographic. It was WWE in 2001, so that was like 97% of their audience, myself included. The Invasion pay-per-view was supposed to be a showcase of everything the two warring sides had to offer. You had the star-studded main event featuring some of the top talent from across all three brands, a mid card showdown between Jeff Hardy and Rob Van Dam, and the all-time classic that was that referee fight. It stands to reason that a women's match was needed on the card, so the company defaulted to their old habit of booking several ladies in skimpy outfits to rip each other's clothes off. WWE's Trish and Lita teamed up to take on Tori Wilson and Stacey Keebler in happier pre tajiri times. The action was sloppy, which isn't a shock when you consider that the WCW gals weren't trained wrestlers. The whole thing wrapped up in about five minutes after the Alliance women were stripped down to their undies. Oh, and Mick Foley was there too as the special guest referee. I'm sure he had a nice day. Number 3. Buff Bagwell vs Booker T on Raw Prior to the invasion, WWE had considered relaunching WCW as its own standalone brand, with the idea that Raw would become the WCW show. To trial that concept, they presented a WCW title match in the main event of the July 2nd, 2001 episode of Raw. And if WWE were on the fence about having WCW be a standalone brand beforehand, well, this match not only kicked them off the fence, but it set it on fire and then steamrolled the burning embers into the ground. Failing to even approach the standards expected of a headline bout, let alone a world title one, the match fell apart as fans duly turned on it. The chemistry was non-existent, the timing was off, and crucially, the audience just didn't want to see them square off since, you know, they'd bought tickets to see the Steve Austins and Kurt Angles of the world. Bagwell has tried to blame the reception it received on the show's Tacoma, Washington location, claiming it would have went down a storm in former WCW home base. Atlanta. Try sabotage all you want, Buff, but watching the footage back, it's readily apparent that you just didn't have the stuff. Sucker! 
Number 2. Trish Stratus vs Stacey Keebler on SmackDown At Survivor Series 2001, Trish Stratus won her first of seven women's championships by overcoming five other women in a six-pack challenge. This was the culmination of a long, hard journey for the Canadian former fitness model. She had worked her way up from humble manager to Vince McMahon's on-air plaything to bona fide female superstar in just a couple of short years. This title win was vindication of all her hard work work, and now the time had come for her to show what she was made of as champion. So, two days later, she fought Stacey Keebler in a match where you had to throw your opponent into a swimming pool full of gravy. Because Thanksgiving was just around the corner, WWE decided that the best medium for Trish to have her second ever title defense was a gravy bowl match. Trish and Stacey sat down at a dinner table, threw some mashed potato at each other, and then fell into the murky-looking liquid before Stratus forced Keebler to tap out. This was gross in every conceivable fashion. I just feel sorry for the two women involved and anyone who had to smell them afterwards, which I assume would be Jerry Lawler. Number 1. The Brothers of Destruction vs Chronic at Unforgiven Brian Clark and Brian Adams, no, not that one, were really starting to hit their stride when WCW went under. As Chronic, the pair reigned twice as WCW Tag Team Champions and were part of some prominent storylines in the company's dying days. Vince McMahon was keen to find a place for these two jacked dudes, wonder why, and so he put them in a program with the Brothers of Destruction in the build-up to Unforgiven 2001. Big mistake! Murphy's Law is the belief that anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Well, you might as well rename it Chronic's Law because that is exactly what happened here. All the moves looked like complete arse, with Taker getting so frustrated at the WCW boys that he ended up loudly calling spots for all to hear. Oh, and then screaming when they went tits up. For ten god-awful minutes, this charade dragged on until the demonic half-brothers finally won. As for Clark and Adams, this performance was so bad that it finished them as a team in WWE. You've probably heard people talk about just how bad this match is, but you owe it to yourself to check it out and witness firsthand just how chronically terrible it actually is. The Year 2000 Three, two, one. Happy New Year! Wait, why will the computer shut off? Thankfully, the Y2K virus didn't destroy civilization as we know it, and planet Earth kept on spinning into another millennium. The year 2000 is widely regarded as one of the best WWE have ever had in terms of popularity, business success, and creative outputs. Unfortunately though, even a bumper year has some stinkers hidden away, and these disasters are enough to make you wish the world really had ended. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of the year 2000. Join us! Number 10. Mark Henry vs Viscera at No Way Out Sometimes a match sounds good on paper and under-delivers in real life. Sometimes a match sounds rubbish on paper and actually exceeds expectations. Sometimes, though, a match comes along that sucks just as hard as you thought it would when you first heard it was happening. Mark Henry vs Viscera from No Way Out 2000, everybody! These two mammoth men squared off in a match presumably designed to trick Vince McMahon into thinking it was 1984 again. Apart from an admittedly very impressive spinning heel kick from the former Mabel, the action was slow, unathletic, and sloppy. But don't just take our word for it, take the word of the crowd in attendance who were deathly silent throughout. They only really popped for the interference of Henry's then squeeze Mae Young, who ran down to save her hand baby daddy from getting his backside kicked. When a wrestling crowd is more excited to see a 77-year-old woman than two competitors in their supposed primes, you know something has gone wrong. Young's presence was enough to distract Viscera, giving Henry the opportunity to win with a body slam. This really was 1984, wasn't it? Number 9. The New Age Outlaws vs The Acolytes at Royal Rumble Royal Rumble 2000 is famous for hosting one of the greatest world championship matches in WWE history. Triple H defended his title in a brutal street fight with Cactus Jack as Mick Foley attempted to wrestle the top prize away from the cocky upstart. In a match so good it essentially established Hunter as a true main eventer, the two men brutalized each other with chairs, thumbtacks, and even a barbed 
Ghostwire 2x4. The reason I'm going into that much detail about this match is so I don't have to spend time talking about the tag team title bout that came immediately before it. In all fairness, there isn't really that much to say about it. It lasted less than three minutes, with the finish coming out of nowhere following a ref bump. The match had actually been built quite well, so to see it end with such a damp squib was a massive disappointment. Although maybe it had something to do with how hard Bradshaw and Farouk were hitting Road Dogg and Billy Gunn in this match, I wouldn't have wanted to share the ring with them for two and a half seconds, let alone two and a half minutes. Number 8. Ivory vs Trish Stratus vs Molly Holly at Armageddon In much the same way that the Rumble is only really remembered for the street fight, Armageddon 2000 is almost unanimously associated with the bonkers main event six-man Hell in a Cell match. Steve Austin, The Rock, Triple H, Kurt Angle, The Undertaker, and Rikishi? Did he wander into the cell by accident and just go with it? These five megastars and The Usos' dad went to war with each other in one of the most memorable matches of the Attitude Era. Unfortunately, due to the size and scale of this monstrous main event, other matches on the Armageddon card were made to suffer. One was this triple threat for the women's title, pitting champion Ivory against Molly Holly and a very green Trish Stratus. The two more experienced women got a fairly decent showing out of the Canadian former fitness model, but there was very little they could do with the measly 2 minutes and 12 seconds they had been assigned. Ivory won after Holly hit Stratus with a powerbomb, and that was it. These women deserved better, and so did we. Number 7. Ivory vs Lita at Rebellion While she is rightly remembered as a legend today for her work in promoting women's wrestling as something more than a sideshow, a lot of fans tend to forget that, during the early part of her WWE career, Lita was a bit… um… not good? To give Lita some credit, she was pushed way too hard, way too soon by WWE. I mean, she had only made her in-ring debut in January of 1999 and won her first women's title in the summer of 2000. She then engaged in a feud with Ivory of Right to Censor, who won the belt off her on SmackDown. That led to this match at the UK exclusive pay per view Rebellion, and gee, thanks for saving all the good stuff for us. Lita still looked really unsure of herself at this point in time. She couldn't even really run the ropes without looking like she was going to stop and ask somebody for directions. This led to an unpolished, clunky match in which Ivory tried her best to lead the newbie through her spots. Whilst she tried, Right to Censor should have done us all a favour and censored this match from the broadcast. Number 6. TNA vs Head Cheese at WrestleMania 2000 Ah, WrestleMania 2000, the most up and down mania of all time, and that's including the one that had a literal roller coaster as part of the set. There was the Eurocontinental Triple Threat, which was good, but there was also Road Dog and X-Pac vs Kane and Rikishi, which was bad. There was the Triangle Ladder Match, which was good, but there was also the main event, which was… okay, you get the idea with that. One of the low points on this night was a tag team match pitting TNA against Head Cheese. For those uneducated swines who don't know, that is Testin Albert vs Steve Blackman and Al Snow. Despite all being competent workers in their own right, the four men in this match had absolutely zero chemistry with one another. It was a clumsy affair, one that really felt like it never got out of first gear, which is hardly what you want at WrestleMania. In the end, TNA won, and nobody cared. Oh, and also, there was a bloke in a cheese costume running around ringside, so that's good news for people who are into that. Number 5. The Cat vs Terry Runnels at Insurrection We are back in the UK now for the other British-only pay-per-view of the year, Insurrection. On a show that featured Big Show dressed up as Rikishi and Shane McMahon fighting for the WWE Championship, the absolute worst thing was the sole women's segment of the night featuring the Cat and Terry Runnels. One month into a rivalry that would somehow last four, the former Miss Kitty and the former Marlena squared off in London's Earl's Court in a brutal, vicious, unspeakingly violent arm wrestling match. Look, WWE counts it and it has the word match in the title, so we're allowed to put it on the list, alright? The two competitors came down to the ring to the soundtrack of Jerry Lawler perving on them on a live mic. They then stalled, wasting valuable pay-per-view time, pretending that the other lady had greased their hand, which wouldn't actually make it any easier to win an arm wrestling match, but whatever. Mae Young countered some cheating by dumping water onto Terry's head, allowing Katz to pick up the win. 
Moving swiftly on. Number four, William Regal versus Naked Midian at No Mercy. Clearly, WWE weren't happy with just making English crowds sit through some terrible wrestling as they had to put one of the nation's finest wrestlers through his own Herculean trial. William Regal, patron saint of blighty, brass knuckles and flirting with Excalibur, put his European Championship on the line at No Mercy 2000. His opponent was Midian, but not just any old Midian, Naked Midian. Great. Dennis Knight, who was famously turned into Midian by drinking the Undertaker's blood, decided that the best way to revamp his character was to wrestle in just a fanny pack and a thong. The famously sensible Regal said that he would only face Midian if he wore proper wrestling attire, which he did to start off with. Sadly though, he just couldn't help himself, slowly undressing throughout the match before whipping off his trousers and scarring a generation of young impressionables. We wouldn't have minded this so much if the action that led up to the disrobing wasn't also really boring. Actually, who am I kidding? Of course I would have minded. Dennis Knight's rear end is very low on the list of things I want to see. Number 3, Terry Runnels vs The Cat at WrestleMania 2000 Back to Terry and the Cat now and where it all began for one of the longest running rivalries of the entire year. In what was billed as a cat fight, which I think is a pun on the cat, but honestly I wouldn't put it past WWE to miss that fact, the two women battled in what was essentially a sumo match as the first woman to throw her opponents out of the ring would be declared the winner. There were antics with special guest referee Val Venus as both participants gave him a big old smooch to try and curry favour. And then Mae Young got involved, distracting Venus whilst Terry got chucked out. The exact same thing then happened again as the fabulous Moolah also started causing a ruckus and dear god how is this match still going? In the end, Moolah pulled Cat out of the ring and the big Valboski finally called for the bell. This entire charade was a total waste of time with zero stakes, zero excitement and absolutely zero actual wrestling. And the worst part of it all, this was the only singles match on the entire card. A Wrestlemania card. Number 2, The Cat vs Terry Runnels at SummerSlam We reach the end of our Cat Terry trilogy now with their absolute magnum opus from SummerSlam 2000. Although in this instance, magnum opus is Latin for somebody please gouge my eyes out with a rusty spoon. So far in this feud, we've had a match where the objective was to pin your opponent's arm down and a match where the objective was to throw your opponent out of the ring. So what was the goal in this battle, I hear you ask? That's right, to rub your bum in your opponent's face. The Thong Stink Face match, as it was called, went on third to last, which means that it's hilariously categorized on Wikipedia as one of the show's main event matches. The two women pranced around in their underwear, still not being able to actually wrestle, whilst their valets watched on from ringside. Wait a second, what happened to Mae Young and Fabulous Moolah? Do you transform into Al Snow and Perry Saturn when you turn 80? I bloody hope so. Charles Dickens wouldn't have been able to create drama given this stipulation, so it's not surprising that WWE's writing team at the time failed miserably in making this match anywhere near entertaining. Oh, and by the way, Cat won with the butt. Number 1, Pat Patterson vs Gerald Briscoe at King of the Ring Mr. McMahon's stooges Pat Patterson and Gerald Briscoe were both very accomplished wrestlers back in the day. Briscoe won multiple titles in the NWA, whilst Pat was WWE's first ever Intercontinental Champ. However, when those things happened, Woolly Mammoth still existed. Not only were Patterson and Briscoe as old as the sun when they fought for the hardcore title at King of the Ring 2000, but they were also dressed in drag. Why? Because 2000 was a swirling vortex of hatred designed solely to keep me awake at night, that is why. They hit each other with their wigs, they rubbed their backsides in each other's faces, Patterson even used a sanitary pad as a weapon and then shoved a banana down Briscoe's throat for some reason, we all know the reason. The whole thing was an embarrassment that mercifully ended when Crash Holly ran in and pinned Patterson to reclaim the belt. I get that this was probably put together for a very small audience backstage, but these days it looks like a made-up match willed into existence by some bastardized artificial intelligence program gone rogue. 1999 
Goodbye, smelly old 21st century. We have finally entered the greatest decade of all time, the 1990s. Everything about it was excellent. Well, except for some of the fashion and the cheesy pop music and some of the social attitudes. Wait, did the 90s suck? Nah. Despite the Attitude Era being in full swing at this point, there was still plenty of bad wrestling to go around in the final year of the millennium. How bad was it? Well, let's just say that kids at the time weren't lining up to call any of these bouts da bomb. God, I'm cool. I'm Adam Pachisi from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 1999. Join us. Number 10, Big Show vs. Big Boss Man, Midian, Prince Albert, and Viscera at Survivor Series. Survivor Series 1999 is mostly remembered as the night Stone Cold Steve Austin got hit by a car. Because he was out of action, the Big Show took his place in the triple threat main event for the WWE Championship, and then only went and won the bloody thing. But that wasn't Big Show's only match of the night. What was he doing earlier? Competing in a rubbish handicap match, that's what. After laying out all all of his partners in Kai and Tai, Sho went solo and destroyed four members of WWE's midcard in less than two minutes. But instead of making Paul White look like a beast, this match just made all of his opponents look like total losers and a pretty clear rush job to prepare the crowd for his sudden title win later in the night. Big Show might have ended the event as WWE Champion, but that wasn't enough to wash the stink of this encounter out of his admittedly flowing hair. Number 9. Big Show vs Big Boss Man at Armageddon Just one month after eliminating himself from the Survivor Series match by running away, Big Boss Man faced the Big Show again in a WWE title match on pay-per-view? Despite being a career mid-carder and fleeing from Show's wrath a few weeks earlier, the man from Cobb County, Georgia somehow wormed his way into a shot at the grand prize. The story leading up to this match is one of the most memorable of all time, albeit for all all the wrong reasons. Big Show's dad had recently died, and Boss Man offered the giant absolutely zero sympathy for his loss. I'm not sure what the worst moment was, the horrible poem Boss Man wrote, or his decision to crash the funeral and steal the coffin. Probably the second one, actually, isn't it? And what was the end result of this ultra-personal, highly melodramatic rivalry? A three-minute match that earned a boring chant from the crowd, that's what. This has to be one of the most underwhelming WWE title matches in pay-per-view history. Number 8, The Undertaker vs. The Big Boss Man at WrestleMania 15. It's Boss Man with the hat trick of bad matches, and the crowd goes wild. Sadly, the crowd did not go wild when Ray Trailer squared off against The Undertaker inside Hell in a Cell at WrestleMania 15. The first Cell match in Mania history, Taker represented his Ministry of Darkness against the Corporation in one of the many clashes between the two stables on this night. By the way, who would have thought that Shane McMahon would be in the best one? The two men just didn't explore the stipulation effectively, leading to a pretty boring version of what should have been a bloody violent affair. We would say that they weren't used to the structure yet, except Taker had already had one of the most iconic cell matches of all time on his very first try. Things somehow got even worse once the bell rang and the brood descended down from the rafters. The sexy vampires passed a noose through the cell roof, which Taker then used to hang his opponent. Like the coffin stealing angle earlier, it is another famously poor piece of Attitude Era history, and we're starting to feel a bit bad for the boss man always being booked in these situations. Number 7, Deborah the Fabulous Moolah, Mae Young and Tori vs. Ivory, Jacqueline, Luna, and Terry Runnels at Savannah. Survivor Series. WWE bunging all their women into one rubbish match at Survivor Series wasn't just a 2010s tradition, it was certainly happening as far back as the 90s. Of the eight women involved, you could argue that only three could really wrestle. Oh, and they were all on the same team. Now I know Scott Steiner, but I don't like the look of those numbers. The five other women were mainly valets or managers, as the likes of Deborah and Terry never really took to the whole wrestling part of wrestling. And as for the other two, well, they had a combined age of 152. Not that that stopped Mae Young from taking more bumps than anyone else. 
Thankfully, this match was over in less than two minutes, as May and Moolah hit a double clothesline on Ivory. I guess at least this wasn't an elimination match, because even WWE weren't mad enough to make it go on any longer than it needed to. A sloppy short match that ended with the women's champion getting pinned by a pensioner. And not for the first time that year either. More on that later. Number 6. Butterbean vs. Bart Gunn at WrestleMania 15 For those lucky enough not to know, the Brawl for All was a series of shoot fights between a bunch of mid-carders. It was partly designed to get Dr. Death Steve Williams over, but that idea went down the toilet when Bart Gunn injured his hamstring and knocked him out. Bart, kayfabe brother of Billy, went on to be the last man standing. Instead of praising Gunn for his legitimate toughness, WWE decided to punish him for winning the tournament, which is just as crazy as it sounds, but has also always sort of been their thing, hasn't it? You've gotten yourself over without us doing it for you? How dare you? A match was booked for WrestleMania between Bart and professional boxer Butterbean. Yes, the bout was a real fight, and yes, Butterbean easily, terrifyingly won. Because he wasn't a proper combat athlete, Gunn did not stand a chance against Mr. Bean. No, not that one. Bart was knocked out in 35 seconds to put the whole miserable Brawl for All saga to bed. Number 5. Ivory vs. Tori at SummerSlam We've mentioned her once already, but it's worth going over exactly who Tori is. Tori got her start in wrestling as a valet for Scotty the Body, the future Raven. She would then go on to work for All Japan Women's Pro Wrestling, sharing the the ring with some absolute legends in the process. Unfortunately, none of this experience transferred over to her WWE run that started in 1998. Tori would receive several high-profile matches, including this one for the Women's Championship at SummerSlam 99. She was going up against an experienced opponent in Ivory, but this did little to improve the match. It was clunky, it was unathletic, and they messed up the finish so badly that they had to do it again. Regardless, after this match, Tori continued to get a push and, of course, ended up as the on-screen girlfriend of Kane during his feud with X-Pac. Number 4. The Royal Rumble Match at Royal Rumble Vince McMahon was having a hell of a time in 1999. Not only was his company finally turning the tide on WCW, but he actually main-evented four of their pay-per-views that year. That is a third of their global outputs. One of those main events shouldn't really count as it was the Royal Rumble. Rumble, but the entire match was kind of built around him, so it still does. McMahon started the match opposite his greatest rival, Stone Cold Steve Austin, a continuation of their epic feud. Unfortunately, though, this chapter was far from legendary. The backstage Austin McMahon antics dominated this bout to the point where it detracted from everything else that was going on. Austin's brawls with the corporation were shown on screen instead of the action in the arena, and there were even parts of the match where the ring was just empty. Also, who else was going to win if it wasn't Austin or Vince? Tiger Alley Singh? Kurgan? Steve Blackman, only in Jack the Jobber's dreams. Eventually, it was Vince who won the whole thing, casting even more shade on a match that was already completely blacked out. Not a great rumble by any stretch of the imagination. Number 3. Sable vs. Tori at WrestleMania 15 Hooray! Tori's back, and she's replaced Ivory with Sable. Oh, good. Tori joined the company to play the role of a Sable superfan. In a storyline they would repeat many years later with Trish Stratus and Mickey James, Tori's obsession soon turned to hatred and the pair squared off at WrestleMania. A big difference between this storyline and the Trish Mickey one was, well, unfortunately, the quality of the wrestling. Tori wasn't exactly a natural, and Sable, well, she was Sable. The two women tried and failed multiple times to string moves together, bouncing off each other like the same ends of a magnet. Eventually, a ref bump led to Nicole Bass getting in the ring to take Tori out, allowing Sable to retain. Without the steady hand of an ivory to guide either woman through this match, it was quite a shambles and one of the worst women's matches in WrestleMania history. That said, as we're about to find out, having ivory in a match isn't always a recipe for success. Number 2. The Fabulous Moolah vs. Ivory at No Mercy the Fabulous Moolah is one of wrestling's most controversial figures for her alleged actions outside the ring. Inside the ring, things go from sinister to shambolic as she had a pay-per-view singles match for the Women's Championship at the age of 76, which 
she won. Much like with Tori, Ivory was charged with guiding Moolah through this match, except Tori wasn't a teenager when World War II started. Moolah could move decently for a 76-year-old, but that's like saying Lassie could write a book decently for a dog. Even Ivory messed up at one stage with a botched dive to the outside. Whatever Moolah had, it was clearly contagious. Aside from Mae Young taking some completely insane bumps at ringside, her poor knees, there is nothing to salvage from the this match. The roll-up Moolah gives Ivory to win the belt takes about 50 years and is the perfect summary of how WWE treated the women's division as a whole at the time. I guess at least she only held the gold for a week? Thank heavens for small mercies, eh? Number 1. Al Snow vs Big Boss Man at Unforgiven Ray Trailer's 1999 was completely bonkers. He got hanged, stole a man's casket, and then there was his feud with Al Snow. The two battles for the Hardcore Championship throughout the summer, a feud that featured one of the most memorable moments of the entire Attitude Era. Of course, I am talking about the time Bossman kidnapped, killed, and cooked Snow's beloved dog Pepper and then fed him to his owner in disguise. This bizarre and twisted storyline led to one of the most infamous match stipulations of all time, the Kennel from Hell. Around the ring, a steel cage. Around that, the Hell in a Cell. In between, a pack of vicious, bloodthirsty dogs who would rip anyone who got in their way to pieces. At least that was the plan. The dogs were actually more interested in humping and pooing than they were playing along with this stupid charade. The whole thing devolved into a farce, and it remains one of the best so-bad-it's-good matches in WWE history. And as funny as it is, it is still the worst of an impressively bad bunch from the year that was 1999. 1998 by the time 1998 rolled around, WWE was in full-on Attitude Era mode. Steve Austin was WWE Champion, Vince McMahon was the evil corporate overlord, and people were talking about their privates with reckless abandon. What a time to be alive. Unfortunately, this didn't always translate to stellar in-ring wrestling. Whilst the characters and storylines might have been great, what went on between the ropes still left a lot to be desired. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 1998. Join us! Number 10. The Disciples of Apocalypse vs LOD 2000 at Fully Loaded in Your House the Road Warriors are often considered one of the greatest tag teams of all time, and quite rightly so. Hawk and Animal were absolute megastars in their heyday, plowing through the competition across the country with their trademark combination of power, speed, and no-selling the hell out of everything. Unfortunately, these spiky-shouldered legends couldn't parlay their success elsewhere into a truly spectacular WWE run. Take, for instance, the time they came back as Legion of Doom 2000 and had a feud with their ex-manager Paul Ellering and his new team, the Disciples of Apocalypse. DOA, here represented by the Harris twins, uh-oh, seemed to be a good match for LOD on paper. They were both big, they were both powerful, and they both rode motorcycles. What could possibly go wrong? Well, pretty much everything, because this match was super boring and went on for way, way longer than it should have. Chuck in a boatload of Ellering interference and a finish that incorporated some good old twin magic, and you have a recipe for one giant waste of everybody's time. Oh, what a disappointment this match was. Number 9. The Undertaker and Stone Cold Steve Austin vs Kane and Mankind on Raw The first Hell in a Cell match from Bad Blood 1997 was an instant classic that gave the world the debut of Kane. The third Hell in a Cell match from King of the Ring 1998 is one of the most famous wrestling matches of all time, thanks to the two huge bumps Mick Foley took off the top of the structure. As for the Cell match that came in between those two, well… On the June 15th episode of Raw is War, just two weeks out from King of the Ring, WWE decided it would be a good idea to throw everyone involved in the big matches on that show into a metal box and hope for the best. 
Taker doesn't show up for most of the match, leaving Austin to fight off his two opponents on his own, outside of the cell. So why is it there then? When Undertaker did appear, it was to attack Paul Bearer, who wasn't even part of the match. In the end, Austin picked up the win, but only after Raw had gone off the air. Number 8. The Godwins vs. The Quebecers at No Way Out of Texas in Your House The age-old rivalry between Quebec and Arkansas came to a head when these two representatives took each other on at the first ever No Way Out pay-per-view. There isn't really a rivalry, by the way, that was just a joke. I don't want anyone from either of those places to come after me, please. The Godwins, Henry O and Phineas I, went to war with Jacques Rougeau and Pierre Roulet in a match that had almost entirely been built on Shotgun Saturday night. Since the number of people who had seen the build to this match rounded up to about 10, there was absolutely no heat to this tussle whatsoever. One team here moved, the other team here moved, the other team dodged a move, rinse and repeat until the pig farmers won the day. Zero consequences, zero excitement, zero redeeming features. Number 7. The Headbangers vs. The Oddities at Rock Bottom in Your House The Oddities were, well, an oddity in WWE. Comprised of Golga, who was the former Earthquake under a mask, the Giants Silver and Kurgan, these three huge men were at various points associated with the Jackal, Sable, and the Insane Clown Posse. They were around for less than a year, but got on multiple pay-per-view cards across 1998. One of them was Rock Bottom, a show that more than lived down to its name. Once again, this bout had absolutely no heat behind it. The crowd sat on their hands for most of the duration, only getting involved sporadically as the two teams played it very, very safe. It all came to an end when Mosh blind tagged himself in to hit a top rope something on Golga. He sort of just jumped on him. There it is. Number 6. The Undertaker vs Kane vs Stone Cold Steve Austin at Breakdown in Your House The Breakdown pay-per-view from September 1998 began one of the strangest time periods in the history of the WWE title. From the end of this night to Survivor Series in mid-November, the title was held by… nobody. It was just vacant for 50 days. This happened because this show's main event had a screwy finish as a result of a screwy set of rules. Steve Austin, who was fully into his terrorizing Vince McMahon phase, was defending the belt against both Brothers of Destruction in a triple threat. However, per the orders of Vince, Kane and Taker weren't allowed to pin each other. If Vince really wanted the title off of Austin, then why did he restrict the number of people his two opponents could pin? Makes no sense. This stupid stipulation complicated what should have really been a very fun match. Instead, it was broken up by endless bickering between the two brothers and it ended when both men pinned Austin at the exact same time. A bad match that many thought made Austin look a bit weak, Kane and Taker look a bit stupid and threw the company's top prize completely out of whack. Good job, everyone. Number 5. The Oddities vs Kai and Tai at SummerSlam Hooray! The Oddities are back! And this time, the enormous giant Silver is actually wrestling! Oh joy! Because people being different is the funniest thing in the world to Vince McMahon, he decided to book a 4-on-3 handicap match, pitting the trio of behemoths against the light heavyweight stable Kai and Tai. Takamishinoku, Shofu Naki, Men's Teo, and Dick Togo were all very talented wrestlers, but never got the chance to really show that because WWE thought anybody under 6 foot 4 was useless. Instead, they were put into this comedy match and made to bump around for their much larger opponents while very occasionally getting on top via double, triple, or even quadruple team attacks. What might have made for a fun little squash match got super old super quickly. Honestly, this just more than outstayed its welcome, clocking in at over 10 minutes. That's longer than the Lion's Den match from later on in the night. Number 4. The Undertaker vs Kane on Raw No storyline in the history of professional wrestling has delivered so strongly on lore and so poorly on actual matches as the twisted tale of the Brothers of Destruction. After going straight for Undertaker upon his arrival in WWE, Kane challenged his brother to a match at WrestleMania 14. This would be one of the only really good matches the pair would have together, maybe even the only one, unfortunately. That didn't stop the pair from fighting a lot throughout 1998 though, including 
following this ill-fated casket match on the October 19th edition of Monday Night Raw. What started out fairly promising soon descended into a big, confusing blob when both men ended up inside the giant casket at the same time. They then started fighting inside of it, although it kind of looked like they were doing something else. After that, they broke the casket a little bit, got back out, carried on fighting up the ramp, and headed to the back. There was no winner declared, and the whole thing just sort of fizzled out. Oh, and this was all happening while Stone Cold Steve Austin was holding Mr. McMahon hostage, by the way. The Attitude Era was a weird time. Number 3. The Undertaker vs. Kane at Judgment Day in Your House the month after the triple threat at Breakdown, Taker and Kane fought one-on-one -on -one to determine the new holder of the vacant WWE title. Mr. McMahon had inserted Stone Cold into the mix as the special guest referee on the grounds that he wanted to humiliate Austin by having him count the pin that was going to cost him the title. A nice idea in theory, but it also did give power to the one man who hated Vince more than anything in the world. Not smart. In a move that surprised absolutely nobody, Austin ended up taking matters into his own hands, leaving both Brothers of Destruction laid out while he countered the pin and declared himself the winner. Another screwy finish, another month of having no WWE champion. Ah oh well, at least WWE didn't do anything really stupid like, I don't know, set the ring on fire. Oh wait. Number 2. The Undertaker vs. Kane at Unforgiven in Your House One month removed from their gothic epic at WrestleMania 14, the two satanic siblings tried to one-up themselves and it went so, so wrong. Unforgiven 1998 was home to the company's first ever Inferno match. Unfortunately, this was not the company's last ever Inferno match because this stipulation never fully lives up to its promise, does it? When two wrestlers are trapped inside the ring by a cage, at least they can use their confinement as part of the match, as a weapon or something to leap off of, for example. But there was no way they could do this with a ring of fire unless they wanted to get seriously hurt. Yes, the match had its moments, the Undertaker dive to the outside was pretty spectacular, but the stipulation severely limited what these two men could actually do. Combine that with the pair's lack of in-ring chemistry and a runtime of 16 minutes, and that is a recipe for one boring match. Not even Kane getting his arm set alight could rescue this torrid affair. Number 1. Too Much vs Al Snow and Head at King of the Ring Following a stint in ECW, Al Snow was on a mission in 1998 to get a job back with WWE. He enlisted the help of Jerry Lawler in his quest, who said that he could sign a contract if he beat the team of Too Much at King of the Ring. Too Much, by the way, with a proto form of Too Cool. Scotty Too Hotty was called Scott Taylor and Grandmaster Sexe was called Brian Christopher. You can see why they changed their names. So, Snow needed to find a partner for this match, but there was nobody available. Nobody. No. Body. See where this is going? That's right, Al actually teamed up with his favorite detached mannequin head for this match. Al would wrestle normally, and then when he tagged head in, he would run around bonking people with it like it was alive. This really happened. In the end, Christopher attached a bottle of head and shoulder shampoo to head so that he could pin it. Do you get it? Because it has shoulders now. Genius. Some people will love this match, and even though we totally respect their opinion, they are definitely, definitely wrong. 1997 1997 was one of the most important and infamous years in the entire history of WWE. It was the year Shawn Michaels lost his smile, the year that Steve Austin broke his neck, and oh yeah, something happened in a place called Montreal. Not entirely sure what that was, but people seem to talk about it a lot. Although there were plenty of history-making moments across the year, the in-ring wrestling, well, some of that was on the pretty rubbish side. How rubbish, I hear you ask? Let's find out. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 1997. Join us! Number 10. Rocky Maivia vs. The Sultan at WrestleMania 13 Ha! Oh, WrestleMania 13. You better believe we'll be checking in with this show a few times on the list. The first singles match on the card was an IC title bout pitting young champion Rocky Maivia against the mysterious Sultan. The Sultan was marketed as a silent warrior from a far-off land, with legends the Iron Sheik and Bob Backlund in his corner. It was actually the future Rikishi under a plastic mask, by the way. The pair were decent 
decent enough competitors at this point in time, but neither had quite found the groove that would make them beloved Attitude Era names. It also didn't help that the match had zero heat behind it. Not really what you want for a title match on your biggest show of the year. In the end, Maya Villa won the match with a roll-up to retain the gold, which still wasn't enough to get the fans to stop chanting, Rocky sucks! As for our boy the Sultan, he disappeared about nine months later and was never seen again. Number nine, Mark Mero versus Leaf Cassidy at In Your House 13 Final Four. Sticking with popular Attitude Era wrestlers who were working under different names in 1997, Al Snow used to wrestle for WWE under the utterly rubbish name of Leaf Cassidy. After initially partnering up with Marty Jannetty as the new rockers, Mr. Cassidy went on a singles run that included a pay-per-view singles match with Mark Mero. While four men were tussling for the vacant world title in the main event, Leaf and the Wild Man were putting on a pretty dull encounter to open the show, with Sable doing her best to interfere from ringside. Mero hitting a shooting star press to get the win was certainly impressive. We're surprised he wasn't tried for witchcraft for this in 97, but that did little to enhance this truly bland encounter. Hey, at least Mark Mero got an actual win. Seeing one of those was pretty rare. Number eight, Savio Vega versus Crush versus Farouk at Ground Zero in your house. A large portion of 1997 was dominated by what WWE called Gang Wars. This multi-faction saga began when Crush and Savio Vega were both kicked out of the Nation of Domination. This led to them forming their own special clubs. Vega headed up Los Bariquas while Crush was in charge of the Disciples of Apocalypse. Presumably they were trying to bring about the end of the world with bad wrestling. The leaders of these three troops eventually all faced off in a triple threat match at Ground Zero in September. On paper, this could have been really interesting. Unfortunately though, wrestling matches don't happen on paper, apart from those weird e-feds online. Gross. The match felt sluggish and undynamic, the three men half-heartedly trading moves back and forth while going for pinfalls every 30 seconds or so. It got a bit better when two participants would team up to take on the third, but that's about as exciting as things got. Number 7. Tiger Ali Singh vs Leaf Cassidy at One Night Only One Night Only, the UK show famous for the British Bulldog dedicating his upcoming win to his sister who was suffering with cancer, only for Shawn Michaels to change the finish and decide that he was going over instead. Great guy. Two people who might have actually been grateful that HBK pulled this stunt were Tiger Ali Singh and our man, Leaf Cassidy. Why is that? Well, because it meant that nobody was talking about their stinker of a match from earlier in the night. Despite only being given four minutes to work with, the two still managed to screw up basic moves like putting somebody on the top rope. Tiger eventually got the win with a top rope bulldog, which Vince McMahon decided to call a tiger bomb even though that was already a move. This was an utterly pointless battle, but hopefully they got some nice fish and chippies out of their journey, eh? Number six, Brian Christopher versus Scott Putski at Ground Zero in your house. Brian Christopher and Jerry Lawler's joke of denying that they were related was a pretty decent run and gag around this time. Unfortunately, it was also by far the best thing about this baffling bout from Ground Zero, where Christopher took on another second generation star in Scott Putski. Son of the Polish hammer Ivan Putski, Scott not only had the heritage, but also the body. Seriously, he looked like Vince McMahon had personally designed him on a supercomputer. The wrestling wasn't half bad either, as the duo threw some pretty impressive stuff at each other. Christopher even hit a skull-crushing finale out of nowhere. He came to play. Sadly, this match is on our list because of the finish. Putski got hit by a dive to the outside and then sold an injury to his knee. Instead of hopping back up to continue the match like a valiant babyface, Putski stayed down until he was counted out after just shy of five minutes of ring time. It didn't feel like a legit injury, which begs the question of why WWE would book a match to have such a confusing and deflating finish on one of their pay-per-views. Putski would be out of the door shortly afterwards. Number five, Los Bariquas versus the Disciples of Apocalypse at SummerSlam. Despite having a common enemy in the Nation of Domination, 
explanation, Crush and Savio Vega decided to spend their energy fighting each other instead. Savio's Los Bariquas, a stable consisting entirely of Puerto Rican wrestlers, took on the motorcycle-loving Disciples of Apocalypse at SummerSlam. Unfortunately, the Gang Wars story was just sort of rubbish, wasn't it? The match started in a low gear and never shifted up, crawling along at a glacial pace until the nation surrounded the ring to allow the Puerto Ricans to win. See? These are the guys you should all be fighting! Get yourselves organized out there! Even though it only went for less than 10 minutes, this whole thing was a giant waste of time. In fact, you could call the entire Gang Wars storyline the exact same thing. Number 4. The Truth Commission vs The Disciples of Apocalypse at Survivor Series After DOA stopped feuding with the nation and Los Bariquas, they started up a rivalry with a faction that was somehow even worse. The Truth Commission was styled as a bunch of South African militants, which is super dodgy if you know anything about the history of that country. The Commission's members included the Interrogator, who would go on to become Kurgan in the Oddities, Recon, the future Bull Buchanan, Sniper, who didn't do much of note anywhere else, and the Jackal, who was only bloody Don Callis. Does that mean there's a reality out there where Kurgan becomes a legend in New Japan and beats John Moxley for the AEW Championship? Ugh. Back to the match, and without being too harsh, Brian Adams being one of the best workers in a pay-per-view bout is a sign that things are not about to go well. You could argue that Callis actually hit the most athletic move of the match with a flying knee drop, but it was no-sold almost immediately. Sorry, Don. Number 3. The Fatal 4-Way Elimination Tag at WrestleMania 13 WrestleMania 13 got started in earnest with a 4-Way Elimination Tag match pitting the Headbangers against the Godwins, Doug Furness and Philip Lafon, and the New Blackjacks. The match was to decide who would become number one contenders to the tag team titles, which is a great indicator of just how thin the tag division was at the time. The champions were Owen Hart and the British Bulldog, who were trying their very best despite having no more than a handful of gimmicky teams to feud with. This match is full of very strange moments. At one point, both headbangers were the legal men at the same time and actually fought each other for some reason. And then Blackjack Bradshaw, the future JBL, just shoved the ref over out of nowhere to get his team and Furness and Lafon DQ'd. This led to the grand finale of the headbangers versus the Godwins. Mosh and Thrasher won, setting up a tag title match. They didn't even win. Number two, Triple H versus Sergeant. Slaughter at D-Generation X in your house. Back in the day, Sergeant Slaughter was a bona fide attraction, capable of putting on huge matches and selling out venues up and down the country. Unfortunately, that time was 1977 rather than 1997. By the time December of that year rolled around, Slaughter was nearing 50 and had settled into his role as WWE's on-screen commissioner. This position of power put him in conflict with the newly formed D-Generation X, which culminated in this bout at the final pay-per-view of the year. The boot camp match was a long-running gimmick for the Sarge, acting as his version of No Holds Barred. Whilst it might have sold out Madison Square Garden in the 80s, it did little to excite this crowd in Massachusetts. Watching young up-and-comer Triple H sell for a man old enough to be his dad was incredibly jarring and threatened to stall Helmsley's momentum. He actually needed China's help to win this match, as he was even going to tap out in the Cobra Clutch before she got involved. Number 1. The Undertaker vs Psycho Sid at WrestleMania 13. Mr. Justice, or Vicious, or even just Sid, had two total matches at WrestleMania. Both of these were main events, and sadly, both of which rank among the worst closers in the history of the big nights. In 1997, Psycho Sid was heading into the event as world champion after a convoluted series of events put the belt around his waist. His challenger was The Undertaker, his first main event at the show he would become synonymous with. The the two behemoths trudged around the ring as the audience slowly lost the will to live over the course of 21 agonizing minutes. When Taker finally pinned Sid to win the title, it's surprising that there was any response at all, especially given the poor pacing and structure of the show. I mean, about an hour ago, they had been watching Bret and Austin put on one of the best WrestleMania matches of all time. Unfortunately, Taker vs. Sid is remembered as one of the most underwhelming main events in Mania history, but at least it did give us that rumor about Sid pooing his pants during a tombstone, eh? Thanks for watching. 1996. 
1996 was a year of peaks and troughs for the Fed. Shawn Michaels won the WWE Championship for the first time, but his click buddies Kevin Nash and Scott Hall split for WCW. Austin 316 was born, but the company made a total pig's ear of pushing Vader. As for the quality of wrestling, well, there was HBK vs. Mankind at Mind Games, Bret Hart vs. Stone Cold Steve Austin at Survivor Series, and then there was mostly stuff like this. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 1996. Join us! Number 10, The Body Donners vs. The Smoking Guns at In Your House 9 International Incident. The main event of this In Your House show from July was a gigantic six-man tag pitting Camp Cornette against the People's Posse. Sadly, this wasn't an early version of the Mean Street Posse. Pete Gas was nowhere to be found. Instead, it was the super team of Shawn Michaels, Psycho Sid, and Ahmed Johnson battling Owen Hart, the British Bulldog, and Vader. It was a really good match, easily the best thing on the entire card. If only the show had opened in the same way it had closed. However, the first bout that night was a tag team affair pitting the body donners against the smoking guns. Not exactly two teams that inspire excitement. The tag team division at this time was paper thin, leaving a pair of fitness streaks and cowboys as the best of a bad bunch. The match, put simply, was pretty boring, which is hardly what you want from the Curzon Razor. Number 9, Mark Henry vs. Jerry the King Lawler at In Your House 10 Mind Games. For any newer or younger wrestling fans out there, it might surprise you to learn that Mark Henry, the man who finally became World Heavyweight Champion in 2011, debuted for WWE all the way back in 1996. A talented powerlifter who competed at the 1996 Summer Olympics, Henry was signed to a whopping 10-year deal by the Federation. Unfortunately, it was only after he put pen to paper that they realized that he wasn't that good yet. At the Mind Games event in September, Henry had his first WWE match against the man who had been taunting him for weeks, Jerry the King Lawler. Jerry Lawler causing trouble? Doesn't sound like him at all. The match was kept simple, with the King doing most of the heavy lifting. Well, figuratively speaking, Mark Henry literally lifted Lawler above his head at one point. You can count on one hand the number of different moves Henry does in the match, and one of them is the hip wiggle. He was just 25 years old at the time and clearly needed some more training, so his debut match was never going to set the world on fire. If only he had come out wearing a salmon jacket. Number 8. Hunter Hearst Helmsley vs Duke the Dumpster Drossy in your house 6. A man who collects trash for a living taking on a snooty rich kid? What possible symbolism could there be to this feud? If the subtext here hadn't bashed you over the head hard enough, then the quality of the actual wrestling would definitely have finished you off. Hunter Hearst Helmsley and Duke the Dumpster Drossy met in a singles bout at In Your House 6, mere moments after Razor Ramon had put the 1-2-3 kid in a diaper as part of their crybaby match. Somehow, this was worse than the grown man wearing a nappy. I mean, at least the in-ring stuff was good there. The two men just never clicked in this one. Trips would of course develop into a ring general over time, but he was a long way off getting his stripes at this point. The icing on this putrid cake was the involvement of Elizabeth Hilden, a glamour model who accompanied Hunter down to the ring. Jerry Lawler kept trying to interview her during the match, obviously, to which she responded like she would rather be anywhere else. To be fair, you and me both, Liz. Number 7, Owen Hart and the British Bulldog vs Fake Razor Ramon and Fake Diesel at In Your House 12, It's Time. After Scott Hall and Kevin Nash bolted for WCW, Vince McMahon decided that he could just keep using their characters and nobody would care. Spoiler alert, people cared. Rick Bogner and Glenn Jacobs, yes, that is the future Kane, were rebranded as Fake Razor Ramon and Fake Diesel in September 1996. Despite their disguises being as thin as baking paper, the company inexplicably gave the two phonies a tag team title match at their December pay-per-view. Not only did fans have to suspend their disbelief at the two doppelgangers, but they also had to work out who to cheer for as both teams in the match were heel. As if that wasn't confusing enough, the bout was also interrupted by two wrestlers from AAA and Stone Cold Steve Austin. I guess at least none of them were pretending to be other people. Not even Vince was mad enough to put his tag straps on two impersonators and Bulldog and Owen won after a little over 10 minutes. A boring match made even worse by complicated run-ins and baffling booking decisions, all while the real Hall and Nash were laughing it up on Nitro. 
Number 6, The Undertaker vs The Executioner at In Your House 12, it's time. On the very same night that Fake Diesel and Fake Razor fought for the tag titles, another utterly rubbish gimmick was doing battle with a company's stalwarts. Terry Gordy of Fabulous Freebirds fame was brought into WWE in 96 as The Executioner, a man who executed people? I think that was his side hustle. This match just got way more disturbing. The Executioner had helped mankind bury The Undertaker alive earlier in the year, and now the dead man was out for revenge. Wrestling's good. This led to an Armageddon rules match, possibly named because it was so bad people wanted the world to end. Okay, no, that's not fair. The portion of this match where Taker and Terry brawl outside the ring is actually pretty entertaining, and Mick Foley made a welcome run-in, even if he did trip over the mat while doing so. Everything before this happens, though? Garbage. The first portion of the match is your standard walk and brawl, which is about as exciting as getting a toothbrush for Christmas. And not even an electric one. A bit of an improvement in the second half, but not enough to rescue this wretched encounter. Number 5, The Ultimate Warrior vs Hunter Hearst Helmsley at WrestleMania 12. Ah, The Ultimate Warrior, we will be talking about you a lot from now on. The former world champion made his comeback to the promotion at the biggest show of the year, facing off against young up-and-comer Hunter Hearst Helmsley. Obviously, the legend was going to win in his big return match, but nobody expected him to do so in such brutal fashion. This match is most famous for the Warrior completely no-selling the pedigree, getting right back up immediately after taking the move. Warrior then started his comeback, hit his patented four moves of doom, and pinned the Blue Blood in just under 100 seconds. In theory, there was absolutely nothing wrong with a big name making his grand return in a squash match. However, did it really have to be against one of the company's fastest rising stars? And you know what? It also makes the devastating pedigree look really silly in hindsight, doesn't it? Given all the people that fell victim to it over the next two decades. Hey, at least Triple H said he felt honoured by working with such an icon. Or did he feel humiliated? The answer changes depending on which documentary you watch. Number 4, The Ultimate Warrior vs Jerry the King Lawler at King of the Ring A few months after beating the King of Kings, the Warrior turned his sights to the regular old king instead. Old Jerry ended up in Warrior's crosshairs after he got offended that he wasn't asked to contribute to his comic book. Apparently the comics were actually written by Warrior himself, and yes, they were absolutely insane and awful. This bad blood between Lawler and Warrior led to a match between the two future Hall of Famers at King of the Ring, the very same night as the first ever Austin 316. Don't expect anything from this match to end up on a t-shirt though. Lawler jumped his opponent from the get-go, using every heel trick in the book to try to make this match more interesting. After hitting him with his scepter and choking him out with wrist tape, Jerry hit his pile driver and the warrior just stood right up again, obviously. This guy would have kicked out of the one-winged angel if he had had the chance. Warrior ended up beating King with a shoulder tackle of all things. Devastating. Number 3, Jose Lothario vs Jim Cornette at In Your House 10 Mind Games Oh good, a manager fight. These are always a treat. Long before he got I Hate the Young Bucks tattooed across his buttocks, Jim Cornette was one of the most prominent managers in WWE. His Camp Cornette stable included the British Bulldog, Owen Hart, Vader, and Yoko Zuna over the years, and he was involved in some of the biggest angles of 1996 as a result. However, to balance out the karmic wheel of life, he was also in this dumpster fire. Cornette was scheduled to wrestle Shawn Michaels' manager, Jose Lothario. In his prime, Jose had been a successful performer, winning multiple titles across the NWA. But his prime was a long, long time ago. At the age of 62, there really wasn't that much that Lothario could do or have done for him. As for Cornette, well, his signature move was to hit people with a tennis racket. Lothario beat Corny in less than a minute after throwing some punches that could be described as weak at best and arthritic at worst. Mechanically, this is the worst match on this list, but at least nobody had their hopes up for it. Number 2, Jerry the King Lawler vs Jake the Snake Roberts at SummerSlam Some of the best storylines in wrestling history have carefully trodden the line between reality and fiction. 
Jerry Lawler saw that line in 1996, ran straight past it, and then ran back to smudge it with his foot. Jake the Snake Roberts' issues with alcohol have been well documented, and the legendary grappler was at a low point in 1996. Naturally, Lawler and WWE took full advantage of a very real and sensitive situation. Coming down to the ring with a jacket full of bottles, Lawler got on the mic to make several jokes about his opponent's addiction. After trying to bribe the snake with an enormous bottle of champagne, Lawler then won the short encounter with the help of some Jim Beam. Roberts has gone on record to say that he absolutely hated this storyline. I mean, of course he did. Here was a man going through one of the roughest periods of his life, and the company he worked for was broadcasting his personal problems for the world to see. The match itself was bad enough, but the way this whole thing was conducted leaves an incredibly bad taste. Oh, and there was actually real booze in the bottle. Tossers. Number 1. The Ultimate Warrior vs. Goldust to In Your House 7 Good Friends, Better Enemies Pretty much everything that the Ultimate Warrior did in his comeback run was cursed, but nothing went down worse than this utterly mind-boggling moment from the April In Your House event. After brushing the future head booker of the company aside like he was nothing, Warrior entered into a feud with IC champion Goldust. Plans for the two to fight over the title were derailed when Goldie hurt his knee, but that didn't stop WWE from putting the two in a segment together on pay-per-view. Although I really wish it had. After several minutes of stalling, Warrior invited Goldust to sit in the ring on Marlena's director's chair. The two then mucked around smoking cigars until Warrior burnt the bizarre one, causing him to flee. Oh, and Mantar was there in a suit just for good measure, by the way. Although this sounds like a segment, the bell did actually ring, meaning that this was an official match that clocked in at an agonizing seven and a half minutes. Even if it hadn't been an actual match, this was still one of the worst parts of one of the worst runs of the entire calendar year. Hooray! 1995 Well, here we are, the year widely regarded as the worst in WWE's history. And we're doing a series of videos about the worst wrestling matches of each year. What on earth have we gotten ourselves into? The mid-90s are often looked upon as a real creative low point for the company before the Attitude Era came along and gave it a desperately needed shot in the arm. But aside from the uninspiring storylines and a lack of star quality compared to the years gone by, the in-ring action itself was pretty bloody terrible as well. So with that said, let's just roll the intro. I want to get this over with as quickly as possible. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and God help me, these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 1995. Join us! Number 10, Mabel vs. Adam Bomb at In Your House As you're about to find out from this video, the year of 1995 was defined by the push of one man wearing a shiny purple bin bag. Mabel and Moe of Men on a Mission turned heel in the spring, discarding their friendly hip-hop image in favour of a new mean streak. This transformation was solidified at the first ever In Your House event, when Mabel took on beloved hero Adam Bomb. He was a face here. Wow. Anyway, Mabel jumped Adam before the bell with a pair of strikes that could be described as unimpressive. Bomb got back into the match very briefly before Mabel hit him with a slam to pick up the win in under two minutes. The match was possibly kept short to hammer home Mabel's dominance. Unfortunately, it was still a pretty boring squash match despite the length and took up valuable airtime, which could have gone towards something else. So why was it given a pay-per-view spotlight, eh? Well, dear viewer, this was a King of the Ring qualifying match, and we all know how that ended up. Or if you don't, you certainly will later on. Number 9. Hunter Hearst Helmsley vs. Henry O. Godwin at In Your House 5 we all have to start somewhere in life, just look at little Fraser Porter. Never was this more clearly demonstrated than in late 1995 by a certain Hunter Hearst Helmsley. The man who would one day have creative reign over WWE was, at the time, feuding with a character who liked to throw buckets of muck over people. Hardly the most dignifying start to a legendary WWE career. Things somehow got more humiliating for Helmsley when, at In Your House 5 in December, he took on Henry O. Godwin in an Arkansas hogpen match. The Godwins were from Arkansas, you see, and Hillbilly Jim even showed up as special guest ref. The objective of this ridiculous encounter was to throw your opponent into a gated enclosure full of real slop and some real terrified-looking pigs. Poor little guys. 
However, this stupid stipulation hung over the entire match, much to the detriment of the two men who were doing their best to at least make it watchable. Henry ended up losing, but Triple H got slammed into the slop as well. Way! On the plus side, this match wasn't nearly as awful as the second Hogpen match between Santina and Vicky Guerrero 14 years later, mainly because that would be physically impossible. Number 8, Bertha Faye vs Alundra Blaze at SummerSlam In what was only the second women's match in the history of SummerSlam, despite the show being 7 years old by this point, women's champion Alundra Blaze defended the belt against Bertha Faye. Ronda Singh was a very capable wrestler who had found great success in Japan as a monster character. So, naturally, WWE turned her into a laughing stock who was romantically involved with Harvey Whippleman. Do you get it? He's a small man, she's a tall woman. Great stuff, pal. Faye did get a push, though, and actually ended up beating Blaze on this night. It's just a shame that the match itself was far from ideal. Aside from a few moments of athleticism from Blaze, the match had nothing to really offer in terms of spectacle. It never got out of first gear and ended with a powerbomb that damn near broke Blaze's neck. WWE's women's division was in a dire state at this time, and matches like this only highlight that fact. Things would get worse, however, as by the end of the year, their women's title would be in a trash can over on Monday Nitro. Number 7, The Undertaker vs King Kong Bundy at WrestleMania 11 At WrestleMania 2, King Kong Bundy was main eventing the show against Hulk Hogan for the world title. Nine years later, well, he was doing something very different. Bundy had been gone from the company for almost a decade when he was brought back in to join Ted DiBiase's Million Dollar Corporation. This led to a feud with the dead man and a huge pay-per-view payday for the walking condominium. Taker and Bundy squared off at WrestleMania 11 in a match that was mostly about what was going on outside the ring. DiBiase had stolen Taker's magical urn, only for Paul Bearer to get it back during this contest. Then Karma Mustafa came out and stole it back to melt it down into some chains. Oh yeah, sorry, there's a match going on. Forgot about that. Unfortunately, the actual action in this one was slow, lumbering, and uninspired. The Phenom didn't even really bother to break out any of the big moves, pinning his foe after a leaping clothesline of all things. Alright Taker, tell us how you really feel. This would be Bundy's final ever pay-per-view appearance for the Federation. What a way to go out. Number 6, The Allied Powers vs The Blue Brothers at WrestleMania 11 What a difference a year makes. At WrestleMania 10, Lex Luger was challenging Yokozuna for the gold as a co-winner of the 1994 Royal Rumble. At WrestleMania 11, he was one half of a tag team taking on the Blue Brothers. No, not the Blues Brothers, these rubbish ones instead. As the Allied Powers, Luger and the British Bulldog took on Eli and Jacob Blue, aka the Harris Twins. I mean, looking at those four names on paper doesn't exactly scream technical masterpiece, does it? This match was just as clunky in practice as well, with Bulldog and Lex nearly killing their opponents with a pair of sloppy simultaneous power slams. The action didn't get much better from there and ended when Bulldog tried to hit a sunset flip but essentially just fell off the top turnbuckle and pinned one of the brothers in the process. All in all, this was not a particularly exciting start to the biggest show of the year. If the plan was to get Bulldog and Luger over as a new team, then maybe they should have wrestled some opponents that, you know, fans actually cared about. Number 5. Bret Hart vs Bob Backlund at WrestleMania 11 Three entries in a row, three trips to Mania 11. You can see why this is down as many fans' worst WrestleMania of all time, eh? Similarly to the total package, Bret Hart had seriously slipped down the WrestleMania card in the space of a single year. He had ended Mania 10 as world champ, pulling double duty and avenging his loss to Yokozuna from the year before. At number 11, he was rolling around with Bob Backlund while Rowdy Roddy Piper kept yelling into a microphone. Backlund had beaten Hart in an upset at Survivor Series to become a two-time WWE Champion in the process. Now, these two foes would meet in a brutal I Quit match that would push the boundaries of violence in the sport. That, or it would just end with Backlund making funny noises into the mic. After nearly 10 minutes of pretty boring submissions, Hart trapped Backlund in his own patented crossface chicken wing. When Piper asked the old timer what he wanted to do, he replied, Blah! And despite specifically being an I Quit match, that was apparently good enough. 
You could argue that technically, as Backlund never actually said he quit, this match has been going on for almost three decades. What an achievement! Number 4, Yokozuna vs King Mabel at In Your House 4 I'd like to start by saying I have nothing personal against the late Nelson Frazier Jr, by the way. Why am I saying that? Well, because he's involved in the next four entries in some form or another. It was not a banner year for the future ministry member. By this point, Yokozuna was a former champion and one of the most memorable heels of his era. Unfortunately, Mabel perhaps wasn't the ideal wrestler to match him up against. This was not a thrill ride, to put it politely. First Yoko threw Mabel out, then they took a break, then Mabel threw Yoko out, then they took a break. Then Mabel got a little bit of an advantage before getting shoved into the ring post. Yokozuna then fell on top of Jim Cornette and both men got counted out. That's it. That's the entire match. The worst part is maybe the finish, or at least what the finish made clear. WWE clearly didn't want either man to lose, so why book them to fight each other in the first place? Honestly, I need to lie down, but there is no time because now we have to talk about number three, Mabel vs. Savio Vega at King of the Ring. King of the Ring 1995, widely regarded as one of the worst WWE pay-per-views in history. Despite wrestlers such as Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker being involved, King of the Ring came down to Mabel and the newcomer Savio Vega. Unfortunately, unlike the delirious scenes that greeted his return at Backlash 2023, Vega had gathered little support as a hero in matches against the likes of IRS and The Roadie. Once again, Mabel was being purposefully prevented from doing a great deal in this tournament. He had had a bye on his journey to the final and spent most of this match holding Savio in a bear hug. To be honest, I needed a hug as well after watching this. Finally, mercifully, Mabel hit a big splash to become King of the Ring in superbly underwhelming fashion. The worst ending to the worst tournament on one of the worst nights in the company's history. And this is only number three. Number two, the Royal Rumble match at Royal Rumble. Royal Rumbles are always at a disadvantage because we expect so much from them. They're meant to be the most fun match of the entire year, and so, when they're not, we reach for our pitchforks and start looking up the address of WWE writers on the internet. Well, some of us do. Not me. I said too much. Anyway, 1995 is generally considered to be one of the worst Rumble matches of all time, if not the worst. If you're going to do a 30-man match, then you should probably have 30 men at your disposal that people might actually recognize. WWE didn't manage to do this in 1995, which is why this Rumble is filled with the likes of Mantar, Stephen Dunn, Timothy Well, and Quang. Throw in the fact that the interval between entrants was just 60 seconds, and nothing about this match feels right. Never has WWE's most popular stipulation felt more like a rushed piece of homework. Outside of Shawn Michaels going the distance to win from number one, there is nothing memorable about any of it, and it's still a chore to get through to this very day, even at just 38 minutes in length. That is almost two episodes of Future Armor, and I know which one I would prefer. Oh, and Mabel was in there. Told you he was involved. Number one, Diesel versus King Mabel at SummerSlam. We have had the worst King of the Ring final, the worst Royal Rumble match, and one of the worst Undertaker WrestleMania matches. So let's round things off with the worst main event in the history of SummerSlam. As a result of winning King of the Ring, Mabel was given a title shot at the biggest party of the summer. So when he was paired up with the relatively inexperienced champion Diesel, you would be right to have some doubts. What followed was a nightmare in human form. Bumbling offense, large portions of nothing, Mabel damn near snapping Kevin Nash's spine with a big sit. The only good thing to say about this encounter is that at least Mabel didn't win. Even with the power of hindsight, the year of 1995 more than lives up to its shocking reputation. Or should that be lives down to? Anyway, if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna have that lie down now. Bye! 1994 1994 presented the biggest struggle for us in this series so far. Not because the wrestling was particularly awful, but because WWE only put on five pay-per-views across the entire year. The Royal Rumble, WrestleMania, King of the Ring, SummerSlam, and Survivor Series. Don't you worry though, because there was still more than enough cack to fill a list. I'm Adam Pacizzi from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 1994. Join us! 
Number 10, Alundra Blaze vs Leilani Kai at WrestleMania 10. On one hand, this match for the Women's Championship was the first time the belt had been defended at the Showcase of the Immortals in eight years. On the other hand, it was a bit crap. Alundra Blaze was the biggest female star the company had had in a while, combining her natural athleticism with techniques learned in Japan to create a style unique to America at the time. As for Leilani Kai, well, she hadn't been at WrestleMania since the very first event back in 1985 and represented a style of women's wrestling that could be best described as meh. They weren't given much time either, which certainly didn't help. After about three and a half minutes of basic back and forth, Blaze hit the bridging German suplex to pin and retain the gold. It feels a bit wrong to dump on two legends of the women's game, but honestly, the circumstances were not in their favour to have a decent match on this night. Don't feel too bad for Blaze though, she would have a much better showing against Bull Nakano at SummerSlam later of that year. Number 9. Earthquake vs Adam Bomb at WrestleMania 10 Whilst Blaze and Kai only got about 3 minutes for their Mania match, that is still almost 6 times as long as it took Earthquake to utterly obliterate Adam Bomb. The nuclear powered man was a late substitute for Ludwig Borger, who had been taken out of the show with an injury. And what was his reward for stepping in and saving the show? Being sat on by a giant hairy man. Lucky boy. Adam's manager Harvey Whippleman got all up in Howard Finkel's face, which resulted in the Fink giving him a shove. Out came Bomb to beat up the beloved announcer, only for Earthquake to run in and save the day. 35 seconds later and after only about three moves were hit, Quake picked up the win in one of the shortest WrestleMania matches of all time. And hey, we're not saying that quick matches are inherently bad. Ultimate Warrior sprinting out to dethrone Honky Tonk Man was an electrifying moment. The crowd loved it when Rey Mysterio beat JBL in seconds, but this one felt a bit out of place. There was certainly a reaction when Tenta pinned Adam Bomb, but it's perhaps best described as a polite hooray. Number 8. The Head Shrinkers vs Crush and Yokozuna at King of the Ring A match featuring Yokozuna and the future Rikishi with Art Donovan on commentary? You better believe he was asking how much everybody weighed. The 1994 King of the Ring pay-per-view featured three matches that had nothing to do with the actual tournament. One was Bret Hart versus Diesel, which was pretty damn good. The other two? Well, just sit tight. Fatu and Samu were defending their tag team titles against the heel duo of Crush and Yokozuna, Fatu's real-life cousin. Unfortunately, the pair being related did very little to add to the overall quality of this match. This bout was bogged down by its offense, which was mostly the two baddies trying to hit Samu and Fatu on the head to no effect. You know, because they're Samoans. It's a questionable wrestling joke as old as time. They also seemingly botched the finish when Crush kicked out of a roll-up that looked like it was supposed to signal the end. This led to Fatu entering the ring illegally and scoring the pin instead. Not a great match then, but hey, at least Donovan had fun. Number 7. Yokozuna vs The Undertaker at Royal Rumble Yokozuna would begin the year as world champion and have his first major title defense at the 1994 Royal Rumble. His opponent, The Undertaker. To make things even more interesting, this title bout was also a casket match. But wait, Yokozuna is deathly afraid of caskets. How convenient. The bout just wasn't that exciting as both big boys stomped around the ring without much semblance of a story playing out. That's possibly because they were stalling because suddenly every wrestler who ever lived got him involved in the match. Yoko and his army of heels dumped the phenom in the casket to bring this dull affair to an end. Then, to cap it all off, WWE's production team worked hard to imply that Taker had died and his soul had ascended to heaven. Oh, and apparently that was Marty Jannetty playing Taker's soul rising out of the arena. Beat that, HBK. Number 6. Erwin R. Scheister vs Mabel at King of the Ring Back to King of the Ring we go, and easily the worst match in the entire tournament bracket. Although he would famously have an even worse time at the following year's events, Mabel still managed to stink up one match at the 94 edition. His unfortunate dance partner was Erwin R. Scheister, the best wrestling tax collector since, uh, well, he's probably the only one, isn't he? There was little IRS could do with a man of Mabel's size, and the big lad wasn't able to hit any offense that looked even remotely intimidating. The tax man scored the win after his opponent foolishly went up to the second rope. IRS knocked him off and then pinned him whilst holding the ropes, an underwhelming finish to a pretty unlikable match. On the plus side, this was the match where Art Donovan first asked how much somebody weighed, and history
history was written right before our very eyes. Number 5. The Million Dollar Team vs Guts and Glory at Survivor Series Sadly, Guts and Glory was not a repackaged version of the Team Power and Glory with Bastian Booger replacing Paul Roma. Instead, it was a good guy group led by Lex Luger to take on the evil Ted DiBiase and his Million Dollar Team. There were plenty of skilled wrestlers in this 5-on-5 five -five encounter, Bam Bam Bigelow and Tom Pritchard for example, as well as the star power of Luger, the hulking physical presence of men like Mabel and King Kong Bundy, and so on. What I'm saying is, this should have been better than it was. In fact, the match might have been better had it not been given a preposterous 23 minutes to fill. There simply wasn't enough entertainment to take up all that time, and as a result, this long encounter felt saggy and underdeveloped. At least Bam Bam looked pretty strong, and he got to be one of the survivors. And with that momentum, he would lose to a non-wrestler at the next year's WrestleMania. Number 4. Roddy Piper vs Jerry Lawler at King of the Ring In the main event of 1994's King of the Ring, Owen Hart defeated Razor Ramon to win the crown and establish himself as his brother Brett's next major challenger. Hang on, there's still about half an hour of the show left. What could possibly be more important than this? Oh, two middle-aged men punching each other for half that time. Oh yeah. Yes, the real main event of this show was the semi-retired Roddy Piper taking on the semi-retired Jerry Lawler. Lawler had built the feud almost entirely on his own, as Piper wasn't around much on TV. This meant that the match had little to no heat to it, and the wrestlers involved did little to change this. There was a bit more of a storyline hastily jammed in on the night, though. Roddy revealed that in his corner would be a young fan, previously humiliated by Lawler on one of his King's Court segments. Jerry's heelish ways would come back to haunt him as Piper's young fan stopped him from using his feet on the ropes during a pinfall attempt and Roddy would get the win shortly after. If I've made that sound heartwarming and wonderful, I'm really sorry. It was actually quite, quite underwhelming. Number 3. Lex Luger vs Yokozuna at WrestleMania 10 at Royal Rumble 1994, both Bret Hart and Lex Luger tumbled out of the ring at the same time to win the match together. This was done so the company could essentially have their cake and eat it too. They wanted to push Luger as the next Hulk Hogan, but Hart remained over with the fans as a talented workhorse. So why not have both of them challenge for the world title at WrestleMania? What could possibly go wrong? Bret's battle with Yokozuna isn't regarded as the best Mania closer ever or anything, but it's generally considered to be fine. The same could not be said for the night's first world championship bout. Luger and Yoko spent 15 sluggish minutes bumping into one another before guest referee Mr. Perfect disqualified Luger for, brace yourselves, shoving him. Even more annoyingly, it was a totally pointless DQ as it was supposed to lead to a Luger Perfect feud that never ended up happening. Number 2. The Royal Family vs Clowns R Us at Survivor Series Little people have long been part of wrestling's history. While some promotions have taken the demographic seriously, others have used them mainly as comedy fodder. Guess which one of those categories WWE comes under? One of the prime examples of this took place at the 1994 Survivor Series, where Jerry Lawler and Doink the Clown looked to blow off their feud. Doink had been accompanied by a sidekick named Dink for a while, which led to Lawler recruiting his own smaller wrestlers to form the royal family. Their names were oh, Cheesy, Queasy, and Sleazy. Doink's crew, which consisted of Dink, Wink, and Pink, were named Clowns are us. Safe to say, this four on four match was the absolute pits. It was almost entirely tired jokes about the wrestler's short stature and cringe inducing comedy spots until the royal family won with a clean sweep. Oh, wait, we're not done because now all the little people are ganging up on Jerry and Doink is hitting him with a pie. This is wrestling. Number one, The Undertaker versus The Undertaker at SummerSlam. We mentioned in our last list that the main event of SummerSlam 1995 between Diesel and King May was the worst closer in the show's history. Well, it turns out we might have called our shot too early, because this utterly abominable encounter from the year before might just take the cake. You might remember that The Undertaker was genuinely killed and ascended to heaven at the Royal Rumble. This led to the Million Dollar Man introducing his own imposter version of the Phenom. This Undertaker, who we're just going to call Underfaker, was actually Brian Lee, the future chains. Paul Bearer announced that the real Taker was coming back at SummerSlam, and with that, the fight was on. Actually, no, it wasn't, because the two men had a surprisingly bland match given the unique circumstances of the feud. At least give us a doink mirror spot 
or something. Taker's style at the time wasn't as exciting as it would become, so having two people do it in the same match was a recipe for a total snooze fest. What's more, the bout before this happened to be the absolute classic steel cage match between Bret and Owen Hart. As if this one wasn't doomed enough already. 1993 much like in 1994, WWE only put on five pay-per-views in 1993. Also much like in 1994, there was plenty of rubbish across those shows to satisfy our sick fascination with terrible wrestling. WWE was desperately trying to fill the Hulk Hogan-shaped hole in the company following his departure as the much derided New Generation era attempted to find its feet. Did it achieve this goal? Well, watch this video first, then make your mind up. I'm Adam Pacino from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 1993. Join us! Number 10. The Hart Family vs. Shawn Michaels and His Knights at Survivor Series the final pay-per-view of 1993 was certainly a memorable one, but not for the reasons you might expect. Various wrestlers booked for Survivor Series couldn't make it to the event, causing matches to be changed up and down the card. One affected bout was the proposed battle between Bret Hart and his brothers and Jerry Lawler and his three masked knights. The King was unable to attend the show, meaning that the company needed to find a replacement. Let's just say Jerry had legal troubles and leave it at that. Not a particularly nice story. Shawn Michaels was parachuted in to replace Lawler despite having nothing to do with the storyline or the Knights gimmick. The result was a match that didn't really make a lot of sense, and a boring one at that. Hart's brothers Keith and Bruce were not on the same level as Bret and Owen, I mean who was really, and the match struggled to gather momentum as a result. At least Owen's elimination helped fuel his and Bret's eventual program, but other than that, this was a weird waste of time. Number 9. Shawn Michaels vs Crush at King of the Ring Two matches in and both of them have Shawn Michaels involved? 1993 must have been cursed or something. The main attraction of the 93 King of the Ring show was Bret Hart winning the tournament for the second time. However, other matches were needed to fill out the card, including this thunderingly dull fight over the IC title. HBK was a few weeks into his second run with the gold and was given the task of getting a good match out of Crush. The Hawaiian star relied mostly on his massive size to make his bouts work, but while the height difference certainly presented something of an obstacle for Michaels, this wasn't enough to tell a convincing story over 11 laborious minutes. To make matters worse, the champion couldn't beat his hulking challenger on his own. He needed help from two fellas dressed as Doink the Clown. By the way, if you're a fan of Doink, then you're really not going to enjoy this list. He'll be appearing quite a lot. Number 8. Lex Luger vs Yokozuna at SummerSlam when Hulk Hogan fled WWE for Pastures New, he left a red, white, and blue gap in the promotion that needed filling. Naturally, Vince McMahon found the nearest Hogan-shaped person and tried to shove him into that hole until they broke. Lex Luger was chosen as the Hulkster's successor, even getting his own special bus to ride around America in, letting people know how much he loved apple pie and eagles and all the other things Americans like, like jeans. This was all in preparation for Luger's big crowning achievement at SummerSlam, where he would defeat the villainous Yokozuna to bring the world title back home. Well, he did one of those things. The image of the total package being raised into the air without the championship around his waist is a reminder of one of the most baffling booking decisions of all time. Hey, if you want to learn more about the whole story of this match when you're done with this one, check out our video, The True Story of Lex Luger's Failed WWE Mega Push. Number 7. Lex Luger vs Tatonka at King of the Ring Look kids, Lex is back and he's brought with us another bad match to enjoy. Thanks Mr. Luger! Bret Hart's opponent in the King of the Ring final was Bam Bam Bigelow, who had actually received a bye in the semi-finals. This was because the match that would have determined his semi-final opponent ended in a disappointing no contest. And as you may have guessed, that match was Luger vs Tatonka. Luger and Tatonka were two of the more popular stars in WWE at the time, so a battle between the two of them made sense. Unfortunately, popular does not necessarily mean the same thing as entertaining. The two men wrestled a pretty boring match, with neither performer seemingly that committed to giving fans something to cheer for. The fact that this encounter went for 15 whole minutes and didn't even yield a winner only added insult to, well, more insult. What's even worse is that WWE decided to put the pair into another program the very next year. Cheers, Vince. Number 6. Razor Ramon vs Bob Backlund at WrestleMania 9 
One was an ultra-cool badass who liked to throw toothpicks at people. One was a former clean-cut babyface who ended up trying to run for president. Put them together, and what do you get? Seriously, can somebody tell me? These two barely had enough of a match for me to notice. The bad guy Razor Ramon and former world champion Bob Backlund squared off at WrestleMania 9 for reasons I have yet to determine. And you know what? After watching this match, I'm still none the wiser. Backlund hit a couple of hip tosses on Ramon before going for a body slam. Razor then countered this into a small package, and that's your lot. All over and done with in under four minutes, with Scott Hall victorious in his Mania debut. While there's nothing wrong with giving a promising star a win in his first WrestleMania match, we're not really sure why the match needed to happen if they were given such limited time to work with, only for Razor to win with a quick roll up. It's safe to say that Hall would go on to have better moments at WrestleMania. I'm talking about the ladder match with HBK, not the time Austin stunned him about 12 feet into the air. Number 5. Doink the Clown vs Crush at WrestleMania 9 We are going back to back on Mania 9, and you better believe we'll be back here again later. As we mentioned earlier, Doink and Crush had a fair bit of beef in 1993, enough for the two men to land a spot on the biggest show of the year. Doink was the baddie here, with Crush attempting to put an end to his spree of malicious pranks. As it turned out, the joke was on all of us for being made to sit through this terrible wrestling match. If Shawn Michaels couldn't get a decent encounter out of Crush, there was also no way Matt Bourne was going to. The only memorable thing about this one was the ending, where a second Doink appeared out of nowhere to smack Crush with a prosthetic arm. You know, that classic wrestling weapon. The evil clown picked up the win on this night as the crowd showed a complete lack of opinion on what had just happened. As the two doinks did a little mime routine, no one was happy, no one was particularly sad, everyone was just a bit confused and maybe even wanted to go home. This was only the third match on the card, by the way. Number 4. The Four Doinks vs Team Bigelow at Survivor Series Depending on how you look at it, this match either contained four times as many doinks as expected, or zero times as many. I'll explain. After giving up smashing people with fake arms, Doink turned to the good side and started tormenting Bam Bam Bigelow. This was supposed to lead to the two men captaining teams at Survivor Series until Matt Bourne got fired for drug use. This led to WWE replacing the clown with four men in circus makeup, the Bushwhackers, Luke and Butch, and Mabel and Moe of Men on a Mission. The four replacement clowns squared off against Bam Bam the Head Shrinkers and Bastion Booger. Any semblance of an actual wrestling match fell apart almost immediately as bananas, water balloons, and even a scooter made an appearance. Every single elimination was some sort of goofy gag, and the whole thing ended with all four doinks piling on top of Bigelow to score a clean sweep. Number 3. Hulk Hogan vs Yokozuna at WrestleMania 9 the final moments of WrestleMania 9 are permanently seared into most wrestling fans' memories, whether they've seen the show or not. That is, of course, because it's gone down as one of the biggest backward steps in booking history. Bret Hart had just lost to Yokozuna after interference from Mr. Fuji, which brought down his best buddy Hulk Hogan to check on the defeated Hitman. Then, out of nowhere, Fuji challenged Hulk to a title match on his client's behalf, despite the fact that the big man looked like he could have keeled over at any any points. By the way, I'm going to say this, in the realm of kayfabe, Hogan has to go down as one of the most unbeatable wrestlers of all time, right? So I'll say it, this was a bad managerial decision by Mr. Fuji, and I hope Yokozuna had strong bloody words afterwards. Anyway, being the humble guy he is, Hogan immediately leapt at the chance to upstage everyone, dodged a handful of salt from Fuji, and pinned Yokozuna to win the belt for America. Where do I start? Not only did Hogan's title match have no storyline reason behind it, not only did it make Yokozuna look like a total chump, but it also led to nothing as Hogan went back on his promise to put Brett over further down the line. This is easily one of the worst endings to a WrestleMania of all time, even if it only lasted less than half a minute. Number 2. The Undertaker vs Giant Gonzalez at SummerSlam Giant Gonzalez had an infamously bad match in 1993, didn't he? We've not mentioned it yet, but in the context of this video format, I think you know what that means. Stay tuned! Despite having that particular bad match, however, he was somehow given another showcase, this time at the biggest party of the summer. The eight-foot monster and his companions Harvey Whippleman and Kamala had stolen The Undertaker's magical urn, and the dead man was determined to get it back. This all led to a rest-in-peace match at SummerSlam, which was 
Actually, I have no idea what it was. I think it was just going to be a regular match that WWE felt the need to jazz up because they knew it wasn't going to be Tiger Mask versus Dynamite Kid. Poor Gonzalez had about as much mobility as a small island, and Taker wasn't yet the ring general he would become. The end result was a clunky, frustrating match that mercifully saw the Phenom beat the former Ellie Gonte to reclaim the urn and send his enormous enemy on his way. Sadly, Gonzalez would not appear at Survivor Series to continue his run of form. Number 1. The Undertaker vs Giant Gonzalez at WrestleMania 9 Here it is, folks, the one you've all been waiting for. This was the rotten cherry on the disgraceful cake that was WrestleMania 9, the first encounter between the future Hall of Famer and a man dressed in a furry naked bodysuit. All the problems that plagued Taker and Gonzalez's SummerSlam match were, as you might have guessed, also present at Caesar's Palace. The two men's lack of chemistry, the absence of exciting moves or moments, Gonzalez's lack of ability to walk in a straight line, let alone have a wrestling match. The SummerSlam match was longer, so you could argue it deserves top spot here, but to that point I say, at least it didn't end with the big man incapacitating the Phenom with chloroform. Hilariously, this match is technically part of the greatest winning streak in all of wrestling history. It is technically a part of the very fabric of WrestleMania itself, and for that, we simply had to give it top spot. In fact, because he's the only streak opponent to lose via DQ, you could argue that Giant Gonzalez represented the greatest threat to under Undertaker until Brock Lesnar came along 20 years later. Here's to you, Giant Gonzalez, the terror of WrestleMania. Goodbye. 1992 1992 was the final year before the King of the Ring pay-per-view was introduced, so the only big shows WWE ran all year were its big four. Surely that meant high quality across the board, right? Um... Still, despite the relatively small pool of matches, we are never one to back down from a challenge, so we've done some digging and pulled even more wrestling tat out for you to enjoy. You can thank us later. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 1992. Join us! Number 10. Bret Hart vs. The Mountie on Primetime Wrestling Primetime Wrestling was a weekly WWE show that ran from 1986 to 1993, right before Monday Night Raw came along and stole its spot for good. The program would play footage of matches from WWE live events, as well as host interviews and bring viewers up to date on the goings-on in the company. On October 26, 1992, Primetime Wrestling aired a match between WWE Champion Bret Hart and The Mountie. There was actually a really good story here, as The Mountie had beaten Bret for the IC title earlier in the year. Now the Canadian law enforcement expert was out to see whether or not he could do it again for the biggest prize in the business. So, what happened? Well, Hart beat the maple syrup out of his fellow countrymen and won with a suplex in 30 seconds. Great. This match was too short to be really bad, but imagine how annoyed you would have been if you thought you were getting a world title match on TV, only for it to end like this. Number 9. Crush vs Repo Man at SummerSlam SummerSlam 1992, London, England, Wembley Stadium, one of the most attended, most iconic wrestling shows of all time. Just a shame there were a fair few stinkers on it. One match that was more boring than outright terrible was this sub-six-minute clash between Crush and the Repo Man. The pair had both been part of Demolition, but it felt like the storyline potential here wasn't really taken advantage of. Perhaps because it would have had to involve telling people that Smash now repossessed people's items for a living and it just wasn't worth it. Instead, we got a pretty bland match designed to put over the power of the younger guy. This bout was positioned between the tag team and world title matches on the evening, so it's clear that it was solely designed as a palate cleanser. Still, palate cleansers can be good sometimes, so this has no excuse. Number 8. Owen Hart vs Skinner at WrestleMania 8 The 8th edition of wrestling's biggest show advertised two matches as main events. Actually, I guess that's quite conservative compared to today's Mania cards, isn't it? So, WWE had Savage vs Flair, they had Hogan vs Sid, but the question still remained. What about the other seven matches on the show? Well, somebody had the bright idea of pitting a man who likes alligators against a bloke wearing a giant colourful tent. I hope they got fired. Owen Hart made his way down to the ring, got beaten up by Skinner for a bit, and then rolled up the Swamp Man to win in 1 minute and 36 seconds. Yep, that was it. That was the whole match. Skinner didn't even get an entrance. Why this match had to be on WrestleMania is just beyond me, and it was the second to last match of the night. 
This was technically the semi-main event. What the hell? Squash matches were still very much a part of WrestleMania at this time, but this was a particularly bad one. Owen got nothing out of looking weak for 90% of the match, and Skinner lost to the guy who he had just made look rubbish for most of the bout. Number 7. Big Boss Man vs Nails at Survivor Series what a year Kevin Wackolt had in 1992. The man behind the Nails gimmick debuted early in the year, had a series of pretty bad matches over the next 12 or so months, and then got released from his contract after he allegedly attacked Vince McMahon backstage over a pay dispute. That is one hell of a way to get fired. The ex-convict's final major match for the company took place at Survivor Series and was just as awful as everything else he had done that year. Well, except for the alleged assault and all that. Nails' main feud had been with the big boss man, whom he accused of violently beating him when he was in prison. Bloody hell, that is quite dark, isn't it? This led to the nightstick on a pole match, which sounds exciting, but actually followed a pretty dull formula. One person goes to get the stick, then they get knocked down, then the other person goes for the stick, then they get knocked down, rinse and repeat. Boss Man eventually won, but this was a total slog to get through. Honestly, they should have both served time for this one. Way! Number 6. The Undertaker vs Kamala at Survivor Series On the same night that Nails and Bossman bored everyone to death with their match, another long-running feud also ended in underwhelming fashion. The Undertaker and Kamala had been beefing since the summer and were set to finish their rivalry once and for all in the first ever coffin match. No, not a casket match. WWE hadn't decided they preferred that word yet. Coffin or casket matches are still rarely that fun to watch over 30 years later, so imagine how mind-bendingly boring this one must have been. Much has been said about early Undertaker's style not meshing well with other big men, and this slow plodding battle is prime proof of that. These two monoliths went back and forth for a little over five minutes before a well-placed urn to the dome allowed Taker to get the pinfall victory. Wait a second, I thought you had to put them in the coffin to win. Why was there a pinfall? Kamala ended up in the coffin anyway, but as the match was already over, a lot of the drama was gone. Still, this contest does have the distinction of being the best Undertaker vs Kamala match on pay-per-view in 1992. More on that later. Number 5. The Natural Disasters vs Money Inc at WrestleMania 8 A good match can be ruined by a bad finish. This wasn't a good match. Just before Owen Hart and Skinner put on their five-star classic, the natural disasters of Earthquake and Typhoon challenged Ted DiBiase and Erwin R. Scheister for the World Tag Team titles. Despite the big lads being over his faces and Money Inc. being despised heels, this match drew very little reaction from the WrestleMania crowd. Unfortunately, it was just a bit of a plodding one. The big man got the advantage only for the baddies to cheat. This pattern repeated over and over again, the crowd losing more and more interest each time. And then what happens? Jimmy Hart pulled IRS out of the way of an earthquake splash and the heel champions just walked away. That was it. The villains taking a count-out loss to keep their titles is a tried and tested wrestling ploy, but did it really have to come at the end of such a nothing match? And on the biggest show of the year too? No clear winner, no new champions, no nothing. This match was a disaster, alright? Number 4. The Beverly Brothers vs The Bushwhackers at Royal Rumble Royal Rumble 1992 is famous for one thing and one thing only. That guy who wouldn't put out his cigarette during Ric Flair's promo? Thanks for sorting them out, Mean Gene. In all seriousness, the show is most remembered and loved for the Royal Rumble match itself, won by the Nature Boy from the number 3 spot. The contest is still many fans' favourite Rumble of all time, often praised for its storytelling, Flair's endurance, the varied cast of stars, and of course Bobby Heenan's magnificent performance on commentary. There were only four other matches on the rest of the card, ranging in quality from decent to pretty good fun. Except for one. One was really bad. The Beverly Brothers, aka Von Wagner's dad and not Von Wagner's dad, squared off against Butch and Luke of the Bushwhackers. As you might expect, this was a comedy match that would be perfectly fine to show a five-year-old. But guess what? I'm not five years old, and this is my video. This match was just hard to enjoy as an adult, full of goofy nonsense like butt biting, tripping over, and that stupid dance the Bushwhackers do that I'll be seeing on repeat when I go to hell. An unfortunate blight on an otherwise great night of wrestling. 
Number three, The Undertaker versus Kamala at SummerSlam. Hey, look who's back. It is amazing that WWE put on another Taker Kamala match after their first one at SummerSlam went down like a lead balloon. This contest at Wendley had all the same problems as the one from Survivor Series, slow pacing, a lack of variety in moves, and so on. However, at least the one in November had the novelty of the casket at ringside and a proper outcome. Their first bout ended after less than three and a half minutes after Kamala's handler Kim Chi ran in and whacked Taker with his helmet. No, that wasn't a euphemism. Get your mind out the gutter. This ended the match in a DQ before Kamala squished Taker with a bunch of splashes only for the dead man to sit up and no sell them all. I mean, that was pretty cool. It's just a shame it all happened after the final bell instead of, I don't know, in the match itself. Number two, Nails versus Virgil at SummerSlam. When Nails went up against the big boss man at Survivor Series, he had veteran Ray Trailer to work with and the added interest of a giant pole sticking out of one of the turnbuckles. It still wasn't great, as we've seen, but it could have been much worse. When Nails fought Virgil at SummerSlam, he had neither of those things, and it showed. Congratulations really should be given out to these two as they managed to bend the laws of physics such that this four minute match felt like it lasted a hundred years. Nails chokes Virgil for a bit, then the babyface gets some offense in, then more choking, more offense, more choking as I feel my eyeballs slowly start to melt inside my skull. The world's most popular wrestler isn't much better than Nails here either, unfortunately, hitting some pretty sloppy offense throughout. He would also lose the bout, passing out to, you'll never believe it, a chokehold. In terms of actual in-ring wrestling, this was undoubtedly the worst match of all of 1992. However, at least there wasn't a massive all-time botch in it, and at least it didn't come at the end of WrestleMania. Number one, Hulk Hogan vs. Sid Justice at WrestleMania 8. Imagine if Marvel secured the rights to Batman, teased a movie where Spider-Man fights him, and then changed their minds and subbed out Batman for Sid Justice. That is what WWE did when all signs pointed to Hulk Hogan facing Ric Flair in the main event of WrestleMania 8. For a variety of reasons that may never truly be known, the dream match was scrapped in favor of Flair facing Randy Savage and Hogan going up against Sid Justice in the night's main event. Hogan vs. Sid is famous for two things, the fact that it wasn't Hogan vs. Flair and Papa Shango's botched run-in. The future Godfather was supposed to break up Hogan's pinfall but missed his cue, forcing Sid to kick out of the heavily protected leg drop. This then led to a beatdown which brought out the Ultimate Warrior for the save, but it was all too little too late. Not only was the in-ring action subpar, not only was there a gigantic screw-up, not only did it come at the expense of another more interesting match, but this was the main event of WrestleMania. For all those reasons, Hogan vs. Sid not only rounded off WrestleMania 8, but it rounds off this list as well. And if this video was that match, Shango's finally arrived to the ring now. See you next time. 1991 in a low-key sense, 1991 was one of the worst years in WWE history. After leading the company for almost the past decade or so, Hulk Hogan was beginning to lose some shine in the eyes of the fans. Hulkamania was on the decline throughout the year, setting in motion a difficult period for the company as they scrambled around trying to replace him. But why should Terry get all the credit? Plenty of other wrestlers stunk up the year as well. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 1991. Join us! Number 10. Hulk Hogan vs. Sergeant Slaughter at WrestleMania 7 When George H.W. Bush launched Operation Desert Storm, I do wonder if he knew he would be responsible for one of the most underwhelming WrestleMania main events of all time. To capitalize on real-life anxiety surrounding the Gulf War, WWE turned Sergeant Slaughter into an Iraqi sympathizer, gave him the title, and pitted him against the most American man in the world, Hulk Hogan. However, this battle for America's soul didn't live up to its billing, as Slaughter never really presented much of a threat to Hogan, who seemed to be without his usual big match fire. For many, this was the beginning of the end of Hulkamania, as the charm of the red and yellow began to wear off. Number 9. IRS vs. Greg Valentine at SummerSlam Just in case you need to remind yourself of Vince McMahon's political beliefs, when Mike Rotunda returned to WWE in 1991, he did so under the gimmick of an evil tax collector. IRS made his pay-per-view debut at SummerSlam, facing off against Greg the Hammer Valentine. 
However, although he is an industry legend, I think it's fair to say that Valentine isn't the most natural babyface around. The unusual dynamic impacted the match, as the fans seemed to find it hard to get invested in a clash between a new heel character and a hero who wasn't usually presented as a hero. After a little while, IRS countered a figure four leg lock into a pinfall for the win. Both men could usually be relied upon to turn in a good performance on any given night, but this one really struggled to get any sort of momentum going. Number 8. The Mountie vs Tito Santana at WrestleMania 7 Did you know that WrestleMania 7 had 14 different matches? And given its placement on the card, no wonder this bout isn't looked back upon very fondly. Tito vs The Mountie was a match that absolutely did not need to be on the show, but ended up taking place just before the main event. Canada's favorite law enforcement officer squared off against the reliable babyface Tito, who dominated 99% of proceedings, including a comedy head-clonking spot between the Mountie and Jimmy Hart on the outside. But just when it looked like Santana had the win in the bag, the Mountie jabbed him with the cattle prod and won the match. By the way, this all took place in about 90 seconds. Number 7. The Undertaker vs Hulk Hogan at Survivor Series At the previous year's Survivor Series, Undertaker made his now iconic debut as part of a classic 5-on-5 five -five elimination tag match. Just one year later, he defeated Hulk Hogan in the main event to become world champion for the first time. It's just a shame the match he did it in was a bit naff. Early Undertaker was an undead zombie and or mortician without any of the more human elements that would add flavor to his later in-ring persona. No motorcycle, no MMA gloves, no kid rock. Form your own opinions. As a result, his in-ring style was also kept deliberately wooden and basic. Early Taker's offense largely consisted of slowly walking around the ring, choking people, and occasionally doing some punches. This style didn't mesh well with Hogan's, who was always most effective against an emotive and dastardly heel opponent. At the end of a match that felt way longer than the 12 minutes it actually went, Ric Flair assisted Taker with the aid of a steel chair. You could drive a bloody bus through that gap, Terry! Three seconds later, and the Phenom was WWE Champion for six days until Hogan got his win back. Hey, at least they'd have a chance to run it back 11 years later at Judgment Day, and what a rematch it was, oh dear. Number 6. The Ultimate Warrior vs Sergeant Slaughter at the Royal Rumble The title match at the 1991 Royal Rumble was pivotal in setting up two marquee matches for WrestleMania 7. The Ultimate Warrior was defending his title against the previously mentioned heel Sergeant Slaughter, a match you would expect the kayfabe unstoppable warrior to win. Instead, Macho King Randy Savage ran down to ringside and attacked the champ with his scepter, allowing Slaughter to pick up the win and the gold. Unfortunately, despite his massive popularity and incredible aesthetic, Warrior always needed a more technically proficient hand to guide him through, and Slaughter was not the man for the job on this night. The one positive to come out of this bout, however, was that Warrior would seek revenge against Savage at WrestleMania in an all-time classic. Then again, on the other hand, it also gave us that underwhelming Hogan Slaughter main event. Hmm. Number 5. Team Slaughter vs Team Mustafa at Survivor Series We are sticking with the not actually a sergeant sergeant for this one and his big match at the 1991 Survivor Series. After dropping the title, Slaughter decided being Iraqi wasn't his vibe anymore and went back to loving the good old US of A. This led to him forming a tag team with America's favorite beardy son, Hacksaw Jim Duggan, Ho! resulting in a four-on-four -four tag match at the Survivor Series. Slaughter and Duggan teamed with the Texas Tornado and Tito Santana to take on the Berserker, Skinner, Hercules, and Slaughter's old running buddy, Colonel Mustafa. The more observant of you may realize that's actually the Iron Sheik. Rest in peace, Bubba. Most wrestling fans would probably assume that the central drama of the match would involve Slaughter trying to get his hands on his old pal, and they would be wrong as Mustafa was the first man eliminated. Right, sure. In the end, the babyface team survived with no losses, and everyone was glad to see the match come to an end. Number 4. The Natural Disasters vs. The Bushwhackers at SummerSlam this bout saw Luke and Butch trotted out to face Earthquake and Typhoon in what was probably Vince McMahon's ultimate idea of a humorous matchup. Neither of these teams had a particularly dynamic chemistry with the other, leading to over six minutes of plodding action. The Bushwhackers tried and failed to push the two larger men around, and even the presence of Andre the Giant at ringside failed to liven up a drab affair. 
The disaster's one, leading to a stare-down between Earthquake and Andre to hype a match that never ended up happening. Meanwhile, Butch and Luke were trying to stuff their brains back into their heads after being utterly dominated throughout. The fact that this took place directly after an all-time classic between Mr. Perfect and Bret Hart for the IC title just added further insult. Number 3. Demolition vs. Genichiro, Tenryu, and Koji Katao at WrestleMania 7 Before they became their own weird little island, WWE used to have working relationships with various other promotions from around the world. In 1991, they put on a showcase match featuring one of their most popular tag teams and two stars from the Japanese wrestling world. Unfortunately for everyone involved, it was pretty bad. Kitao and Tenryu were both big names in their own right, the former building off his previous career as a sumo wrestler and the latter for his legendary work in All Japan Pro Wrestling. As for Demolition, this was the smash and crush edition of the pairing, so make of that what you will. Sadly, WWE just hadn't done a good job with their presentation of the Japanese talent, failing to make the crowd care about the babyfaces of the match. They also barely gave them any time to shine in the bout itself, which was over and done with in under five minutes. This had the potential to be really special, but unfortunately, just wasn't. Number 2. Hulk Hogan and the Ultimate Warrior vs Sergeant Slaughter, Colonel Mustafa, and General Adnan at SummerSlam SummerSlam 1991 was main evented by a wedding. The kayfabe union of Randy Savage and Miss Elizabeth closed out the broadcast of WWE's second biggest show of the year. It was fantastic, and it can't be overstated how popular the pair were back in the day, although they'd already been married in real life since 1984. The ceremony was billed as a match made in heaven, while the actual competitive main event of the show was a match made in hell. And boy were they right about that. To close out the Hogan vs Slaughter angle that had dominated much of the year, the Hulkster and Ultimate Warrior squared off in a 3-on-2 handicap match against the Sarge, Colonel Mustafa, and General Adnan. That is a team with an average age of 48. Although the numbers may have been stacked against the babyface team, the fact that Mustafa and Adnan barely lifted a finger actually means it was more of a handicap match against poor old Slaughter. It was slow, it was boring, it was predictable. In fact, this makes me even more glad a fake wedding closed out a major Big Four pay-per-view. Number 1. Jake Roberts vs Rick Martel at WrestleMania 7 The first and only blindfold match in Mania history came about when the model blinded Jake by spraying his signature cologne in his eyes. And while it certainly was a bad match, I imagine there's probably quite a lot of defenders out there too. Not necessarily because they're huge fans of Jake the Snake or because they've got bottles of Martel's arrogance at home, but because it's actually quite funny, isn't it? The sight of two men fumbling around a ring with bags over their heads is not exactly what you expect to see on the grandest stage of them all. And to be fair, there is some joy to be taken from watching Martel bump around the ring like a snivelling heel, accidentally finding Damien the Snake in the process. However, from a wrestling standpoint, this was essentially a joke, and for all its campy charm, we simply had to make it our worst WWE match of 1991. Sorry. 1990 The 90s were a time of change for the World Wrestling Federation. WrestleMania in 1990 was headlined by Hulk Hogan vs The Ultimate Warrior. Fast forward to the decade's end and that spot would go to Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock. Stars like Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart had risen and fallen, The Undertaker had completely evolved his character, and the Monday Night Wars had begun and almost ended. However, despite all the change, one thing that was constant from the very first year of the decade was WWE putting out some utterly dreadful wrestling. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 1990. Join us! Number 10. The Hart Foundation vs The Bolsheviks at WrestleMania 6 WrestleMania 6 was a grand event, headlined by the aforementioned classic between WWE Champion Hulk Hogan and Intercontinental Champion The Ultimate Warrior. As for the rest of the card, it wasn't that great. This was the first mania to be held outside of the States, emanating from the Sky Dome in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. When you think of Canadian wrestling around this time, you naturally think of the Hart Foundation, so it made sense for them to be on the card. What didn't make sense was for them to be in a squash match that ran about the length of a TikTok. Brett and Jim dominated Nikolai Volkov and Boris Zukov, pinning the latter with a heart attack after just 19 seconds. 
That makes it the shortest ever WrestleMania tag team match, and the fourth shortest match in the history of the event. Having the Hearts win in Canada was a good idea, obviously, but a better idea would have been to have given them a victory in a match that actually meant something. The only reason this isn't any higher on this list is because we've literally run out of things to say about it. Number 9. Jim Duggan and Nikolai Volkov vs The Orient Express at SummerSlam About five months after being squashed by the Hart Foundation in Canada, Nikolai Volkov was on the winning side of a different tag team match, this time in Philadelphia. Now, the singing Russian's partner was Hacksaw Jim Duggan in what I assume was WWE's clumsy attempt at promoting strong US-Soviet relations. Their opponents were Sato and Tanaka of the Orient Express, making this contest a big confusing mess of national stereotypes and jingoistic pride. The actual wrestling wasn't that good either. While the two Japanese wrestlers were usually good in the ring, their opponents weren't exactly the most dynamic of foes. It didn't make for a great stylistic clash. This uninspiring contest only lasted three and a half minutes before Duggan took down Tanaka with that most devastating of finishing maneuvers, a clothesline. There really wasn't much point to having this bout on the card apart from getting over Duggan and Volkov as a new unit. Wait, what's that? They would never wrestle another televised match as a tag team ever again? Well, isn't that just fantastic? Number 8. The Warlord vs Tito Santana at SummerSlam Earlier that same night in Philly, veteran wrestler Tito Santana was charged with getting over a new monster. Unfortunately, that monster moved like he was made out of Lego bricks. The Warlord, who at this point looked like somebody had turned up all the settings on a video game version of Stone Cold Steve Austin, was put over before the match as a powerhouse force to be reckoned with. However, as Roddy Piper said on commentary during this match, just because you're big doesn't mean you can wrestle. Santana carried the contest, executing all the exciting moves and near falls. As for Warlord, his most thrilling maneuver was either the power slam he won the match with or when he rolled to the outside. Look at him go! This was a big problem with WWE in the pre-Raw days. Matches like this, which should have been done before the pay-per-view to build talent up, had to take up time on the most important shows of the year. Number 7. The Hulkamaniacs vs The Natural Disasters at Survivor Series this is the only match from the 1990 Survivor Series you will find on this list. Not because it was an especially good show mind, but rather an inoffensive one. Well, except for the gobbledygooker. That was pretty damn offensive. This edition of the Thanksgiving show consisted of five traditional elimination matches, with the survivors of those going through to the main event to fight again. In kayfabe, that means there could have been 20 people in that match. Almost wish that had happened now, just for the chaos. Jim Duggan, Big Boss Man and Tugboat backed Hulk Hogan against Earthquake's crew of Haku, The Barbarian and Dino Bravo. Whilst this match certainly had star power, once the action got underway it was clearly quite lacking in wrestling acumen. This battle is just thunderingly dull. Barely anyone lifts a finger, the action is ludicrously drawn out and Duggan gets eliminated for hitting somebody with his 2x4. How do you not know the rules by now, Jim? In the end, Hogan was the last man standing, shocker, and advanced to the main event. That match wasn't great either, but at least it was better than this. Number 6. Jim Duggan vs Dino Bravo at WrestleMania 6 Jim Duggan keeps popping up on this list, and we're not done with him yet. The plank-wielding America-loving grappler took on Dino Bravo at WrestleMania 6. Duggan was the patriotic babyface, patriotic about the United States of America, at a show in Canada, right? Strange alignments to one side, this match suffered from the very same issue as every other one of Duggan's performances. His moveset was really, really limited. Hey, I like a clothesline as much as the next person, unless the next person is JBL, but do we really need a match where they make up 80% of the moves? The action was also bogged down by Earthquake, who decided to show up at ringside to interfere on Bravo's behalf. Jimmy Hart was also there, and it was he who ultimately decided the outcome. The Mouth of the South tried to slide Duggan's 2x4 to Dino, only for Hacksaw to intercept it and bash Bravo in the back to get the win. A slightly heelish move from Jim, but I suppose turnabout is fair play and all that. Number 5. Jake Roberts vs Bad News Brown at SummerSlam if we were ranking matches based on their build, then Bad News Brown vs Roddy Piper from WrestleMania 6 definitely would have been on this list. That was the one with the body paint. Don't really need to explain why it isn't looked back upon fondly. 
The actual in-ring stuff between the two wasn't half bad, but Brown did find his way onto this list thanks to the time he took on Jake the Snake Roberts at SummerSlam. Instead of a regular referee, this bout was overseen by the Big Boss Man. Sadly, they didn't give him a black and white version of his signature outfit. All he got was a funny hat. The two men never really got going here, as Brown looked like he was struggling mightily throughout. They also weren't given much time to play with, as Brown smacked Roberts in the stomach with a chair, resulting in a DQ finish after less than five minutes. Once again, this feels like a match that should have been on Raw had it existed at the time. Hey, at least Bossman's hat was cool, eh? Number 4. Jim Duggan vs Big Bossman at Royal Rumble For God's sake, Jim, will you please stop clotheslining people? For Duggan's final appearance on this list, thank God, we go back to the beginning of the year and the 1990 Royal Rumble event. Big Boss Man was being primed for a Big Boss face turn in the next few weeks, so the company would need him to put on a good final few performances as a heel. They thought Hacksaw could make this happen. They thought wrong. The two wrestled a very stilted, very bland match that followed a mind-numbingly dull formula. The babyface has some fire, the heel shuts it down with rest holds, maybe the heel manager gets involved, which leads to, you guessed it, more rest holds. The match ended in DQ after Bossman struck Duggan with his nightstick. No, that's not a euphemism, mind out of the gutter. Pay-per-view matches ending this way wasn't uncommon at the time, but this one felt especially pointless as the bout in question had been so uneventful. Number 3. Big Boss Man vs Akeem at WrestleMania 6 From 1988 to 1990, Big Boss Man and Akeem the African Dream were a menacing heel tag team. After challenging for the tag titles and playing a huge part in the Mega Powers Explode storyline in the lead-up to WrestleMania 5, the duo split when Boss Man turned good in early 1990. This led to a match at WrestleMania 6 that was huge in every single way. I mean, seriously, look at the size of these lads. Even though Two Large Gentlemen is seemingly Vince McMahon's personal idea of heaven, not every wrestling fan necessarily feels the same way. The pair just did not mix well together, with the majority of Akeem's attacks looking like he was humping his former partner in the corner. Bossman then took over and threw Akeem back and forth between two turnbuckles like he was glitching out in a 2K game. Bossman got the win with a Bossman slam, putting the marquee match to bed after less than two minutes of insultingly poor action. Number 2. Brutus Beefcake vs The Genius at Royal Rumble We've already established that WWE were not afraid to end pay-per-view matches via DQ back in the early 90s. Having a 3 or 4 minute match end with no definitive winner is one thing, but one that goes 11 minutes? Come on, that's just not on. Brutus the Barber Beefcake took on Genius the Genius Genius at the 1990 Royal Rumble. On paper, this doesn't exactly scream excitement, but wrestling matches shouldn't be judged on paper. They should be judged on terrible wrestling instead. For over 10 minutes of our precious lives, the two men mucked about outside the ring and very occasionally did something that resembled competent wrestling. This battle had zero stakes to it, zero enthusiasm from the crowd, and zero reason to be on this card. So why in God's name did the company give it so much time? What did we do to deserve this? The match ended when Mr. Perfect ran in and attacked Beefcake, which led to both men getting disqualified. Why? What did Beefer do? What did Beefer do? Number 1. Randy Savage vs Dusty Rhodes at SummerSlam At SummerSlam 1990, two absolute legends of the sport squared off in a pay-per-view singles match for the first time ever. Dusty Rhodes, the face of the NWA and Southern Wrestling for many years, had joined the World Wrestling Federation in the summer of 1989. He fought Randy Savage in a mixed tag match at WrestleMania, but now the time had come for these two icons to go one-on-one. -on -one. So, what happens? Well, Randy jumped Dusty from behind, dominated the match, and then hit his opponent with a loaded purse for the win in just over two minutes. How dare WWE offer up something as exciting as Rhodes vs Savage and then give us this nonsense? How dare they never put them in another pay-per-view match ever again? How dare they book them to have a better match on primetime wrestling for free? Oh, Dusty's first run in WWE was a disaster for many reasons, all of which are present in his utterly disgraceful match with the Macho Man at SummerSlam 1990. Cody can add this to the list of things he needs to avenge his dad for. And finally, the 80s. 
The 1980s was the decade that WWE became a truly global phenomenon. It was the decade of an aggressive national expansion spearheaded by Vince McMahon Jr., the decade of rock and wrestling crossover, and the decade that birthed Hulkamania. A golden era, but the 80s were also a decade where character was truly king and work rate was sorely lacking much of the time. That may have given fans some larger-than-life personalities to cheer or boo, but it also gave gave them some piss poor matches too. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of the 1980s. Join us. Number 10, Rick Rude vs Jake Roberts at WrestleMania 4. When you spot the names of these two Hall of Famers next to each other on the bill, you expect it to be nothing less than very good. And at WrestleMania, well, Jake Roberts and Rick Rude had the capacity to steal the damn show together. Not at WrestleMania 4, though. Oh no, rather than steal the show, they almost stopped the show by putting everybody to sleep. To be fair to the match, it's not that it's actively terrible or that they're botching spots left, right and centre, it's more that it's just so interminably dull. Ravishing Rick and the Snake always had the capacity to change the pace of their matches and bring the crowd on the proverbial emotional rollercoaster ride with them. But they didn't do that here, failing to get out of second gear and returning to the dreaded chin lock time and time again. Not only did this test the viewer's patience, but it also completely telegraphed the end result of this WWE title tournament match. After 15 uneventful minutes, the match was rendered a draw and nobody advanced to the quarterfinals. Serves the boring bastards right. Number 9. Bad News Brown vs Ken Patera at SummerSlam 1988 Another of WWE's original Big Four pay-per-views, SummerSlam has also not been immune to hosting the occasional stinker. In fact, quite a few took place on the very first one. A red-hot, sold-out Madison Square Garden was treated to such barn burners as Dino Bravo vs Don Morocco, Junkyard Dog taking on Rick Rude, and a tag-team showdown between the Bolsheviks and the Powers of Pain. Worst of all, however, was Bad News Brown's clangor with Ken Patera. Both men were legit badasses and could certainly put on a good match on their day, but SummerSlam 1988 was decidedly not their day. It feels like a random thrown-together affair and it quickly goes down downhill. Patera, in particular, badly mucks up some stuff while moving at a glacial pace. Hindering things further, the MSG faithful didn't buy into the Olympic strongman at all and it didn't take long for the boring chance to start up. Thankfully, it's all wrapped up in under seven minutes, with Brown picking up the win with the Ghetto Blaster. Based on his performance here, it's no shock that Patera was gone just a few months later. Number 8. The Islanders vs The Young Stallions at Royal Rumble 1988 Along with the first SummerSlam, 1988 was also the year of the first televised Royal Rumble, that year's version airing as a TV special before it became one of WWE's most anticipated pay-per-view events. Considering the event was named after the experimental Battle Royal, you might expect it to headline, no? Well, no. The Royal Rumble was actually the semi-main event, with a two-hour three-falls tag team match between the Islanders and the Young Stallions going on last. With all due respect to Haku, Tama, Paul Romer and Jim Powers, and especially Haku because I fear he would turn my bones into dust by simply looking menacingly in my direction, their 15-minute effort was a massive come-down after, you know, the first ever televised Royal Rumble. The action was just about acceptable, granted, but the production was all over the place and W. WWE made the strange decision to have an Andre the Giant promo take place in the middle of it. That decision ended up robbing the match of what little heat it had, and the building couldn't clear out quick enough when the Islanders made it two falls to zero. Number 7. The Bushwhackers vs The Fabulous Rougeau Brothers at WrestleMania 5 The Bushwhackers, like being punched repeatedly in the crotch, are an acquired taste. Hey look, seriously, there are guys out there who actually like having that done to them. No judgement here, but it's not for me. I will, however, judge anyone who professes to get sincere pleasure from the wacky antics of Butch and Luke. The goofy tag team was strictly lower card material and were usually palatable as long as they got out of the way early. At WrestleMania 5, the Bushwhackers went on fourth and were given almost 10 minutes to play with. 
I say play with, but really the only thing they played with was Jay's tallywhacker when Luke was hoisted up for a slam. I would call that the one lone highlight of this turgid mess, which was slow, unfunny, needlessly long, and very one-sided. And after getting their asses kicked for much of the duration of the contest, the Bushwhackers managed to sneak a win thanks to their eye-rolling battering ram. The match was a total crowd killer, and only isn't lower because at the very least it gave me the chance to listen to the Rougeau's fabulous theme music. Number 6. The Wild Samoans and Samu vs Rocky Johnson, SD Jones and Bobo Brazil in MSG This six-man from Madison Square Garden was all about the return of the legendary Bobo Brazil. Reportedly one of Vince McMahon's favorite ever wrestlers, Bobo was put over big as the most important African-American wrestler in history as he made his introduction. Regrettably, the then 59-year-old was unable to convince anyone who might not have seen him in his prime just why he was such a big deal. Brazil looked to be in tremendous physical shape for his age, but immediately mistimed his spots during the opening exchanges and fell over at multiple points. Bobo and the match never recovered, and it all felt like it was being wrestled in slow motion at times. The Samoan trio are willing to sell and be thrown about a bit, but it's simply not enough to salvage things. After Bobo does his patented headbutts, which really shouldn't work on Samoans, but let's not question the science behind it right now, Jones gets double teamed behind the ref's back, providing a flat ending to a borderline embarrassing match. Number 5. Greg Valentine vs The Junkyard Dog at the first WrestleMania Quickly back to the long-suffering MSG crowd now. Alright, so they were witness to some of the most iconic moments and best matches in the history of the business, but still, they had to endure a lot of absolute crap too. The New York Massive were especially expectant for this new extravaganza dubbed WrestleMania, with its tagline of the greatest wrestling event of all time. Great wrestling was not the flavor of the evening, as sports entertainment theatrics were relied upon to make up for a lack of thrilling in-ring action. The Intercontinental Championship match between Greg Valentine and Junkyard Dog certainly didn't provide any thrills. Junkyard Dog's weak headbutts were hardly convincing, and the Hammer noticeably had to lower his level in order to get something barely watchable out of the dog. It was actually Valentine's manager, Jimmy Hart, who provided the most excitement here by taking a scary spill onto the concrete floor shortly before the weak countout ending. This came right after a match that ended in a double disqualification, no less. An early low point for the prestigious IC title on the grandest stage. Number 4. Randy Savage vs George Steele on Saturday night's main event Speaking of intercontinental champions, how about that Randy Savage, eh? The Macho Man was on fire in the mid to late 80s, but his golden touch did not extend to his series of matches with George the Animal Steele. The worst of the bunch was this outing from the ninth edition of Saturday Night's Main Event. To start, I should probably mention that this was very much a storyline-driven endeavor, as the simple Steele was besotted with the innocent Miss Elizabeth, sending the famously reasonable Randy positively crackers. Savage had further cause to be upset when his rival Ricky Steamboat came out to stare him down and allow the green-tongued oaf to kidnap his wife and take her backstage. After that early bit of excitement, the bout really begins to lag. Steel is out of shape and can hardly move, relying on simple slams and biting both the turnbuckles and his opponent's head. Randy tries to move around enough for two people, bless him, but it is a fruitless task and the match comes to a welcome end when he bonks his hairy foe with the ring bell. Number 3. The Ultimate Warrior vs Andre the Giant on Saturday Night's Main Event The Ultimate Warrior vs Andre the Giant is a match that you would politely call an attraction. That's code for we know this is going to be rubbish, but at least it has a spectacle factor about it, if nothing else. Vince McMahon boldly proclaimed that this was one of the greatest championship matches ever on Saturday night's main event as the eighth wonder of the world made his entrance. Vince, mate, I know you're the promoter and everything, but maybe you should wait, I don't know, 30 or so seconds before making that kind of bold statement. Andre was so beyond broken down at this point and relied almost exclusively on trying to choke the muscle-bound, neon-soaked intercontinental champ. His face a constant grimace of pain, the giant attempts to lead the match as best he can, but it just becomes really sad to watch. Warrior, a notoriously limited worker, obviously isn't the guy to take this one out of Sucksville, which mustn't be too far from parts unknown. After around 8 minutes, which felt like 18, Warrior retained via DQ. It's hard to even be mad at the finish, to be honest. You just end up being thankful it's all over. Number 2. Hulk Hogan vs Andre the Giant at WrestleMania 4 the 
main event of WrestleMania 3 is one of the most historic in WWE history. In front of a mammoth crowd in the Pontiac Silverdome, the irresistible force of Hulk Hogan met the immovable object of Andre the Giant, with the Hulkster slamming all, what did Hogan say it was again, 900 pounds off the big man to retain the WWE title. A year later, the two faced off once more at Mania, this time in a largely rotten WWE title tournament. Andre was knackered going into the show close of the year prior, but by this point it really looked like he shouldn't have been in the ring at all. This has none of the magic of the WrestleMania 3 main event, which wasn't a technical classic by any stretch of the imagination, but has become iconic as a moment in time. Nobody remembers this sequel, which was five minutes of tepid non-action, capped off with a screwy double disqualification finish, a pale replication of the famous slam, and Hogan acting like he just won the friggin' title despite being being eliminated from the tournament. Bad stuff all round, but it's comforting to know that Hogan probably made more money for this one pathetic match than everyone else on the card combined. Number 1. Mr. T vs Roddy Piper at WrestleMania 2 a big part of the success of the first WrestleMania was not just seeing Hulk Hogan and Roddy Piper square off, but the participation of A-Team and Rocky III star Mr. T. Clubber Lang and Thunderlips got the better of Mr. Wonderful and Hot Rod, but Piper's rivalry with the Hollywood actor would carry on until WrestleMania 2. These two genuinely didn't like each other, and a match between them could have had tremendous heat and been a real sight to see if they employed all the smoke and mirrors and bells and whistles at their disposal. Instead, WWE decided decided to put them together in a worked boxing match. In a genre that notoriously has a low bar when it comes to quality, this manages to be one of the absolute worst. It was boring, it was patently fake, and it ended in a disqualification finish when Rowdy Roddy slammed him in the fourth round. I repeat, the worked boxing match ended in a disqualification. On any other day, Piper's charisma and theatrics might have carried this one, but it was not to be on this day. Unfortunately for Piper and Mr. T, this day just happened to be WrestleMania. I pity the fools. I really do.